Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see title what if Naruto had the legendary power cards of King Gilgamesh, Naruto x Fate. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Boredom. The act of feeling weary because one is unoccupied or lacks interest in one's current activity. It is the great enemy of existence, inexorable, implacable, insatiable. It spares neither man nor king nor the gods themselves. It knows no mercy, no pity. Wars have been started for less. Entire countries have fallen to the whims of a bored monarch or a restless dictator. Lives have ended or begun, merely to slake its thirst. It overshadows all, consumes all such as its way, to resist is meaningless, one only becomes entangled in its web. Once you're caught within its grasp you have two options. Yield. Or overcome it. Gilgamesh was no exception to this. Having fought in countless wars, triumphed over the very gods themselves, the king of Uruk loathed boredom. Indeed to speak of such a thing in his presence was anathema. He'd conquered countless enemies, destroyed all who challenged him. But this, this was a foe he couldn't defeat. No amount of weapons could hope to bring it down. Not even Aya. Even now it mocked him with its silence. He could destroy this world of course. Indeed, it was well within the realm of his ability to do so. But then there would truly be nothing, and nothing was worse than boredom. Unacceptable. For a king who'd sampled all the pleasures that there were to offer, this brave new world should have been appealing. Entertaining. Amusing at the very least yet it was anything but. The inhabitants of this realm were so very fragile and those who weren't were mongrels unworthy of his attention. And so the conundrum, time and again this impassable wall arose to challenge him. While these villages might be boorish, they at least offered some paltry form of amusement despite his refusal to enter them. Perhaps if they threw a festival in his honor, but no, these mongrels did not understand his greatness. Indeed, they refused to accept it. For one who had seen the truth of the grail, such behavior was unacceptable. That alone demanded recompense, but if he destroyed them, in short, he found himself at an impasse, one of his own making at that. Ten years ago, by some strange twist of fate he'd found himself in this new world with no way to return. The land had the touch of someone else, which in turn suggested that others from his realm had once found their way here and made this place their home. Perhaps in its madness, the grail had unwittingly reopened that path for him. Nevertheless, the king had arrived here, deposited by the corrupted miracle that was the holy grail with a physical body no less. Into a realm of strife, a land of war, yet this world was unworthy of him. He was ageless and superior. He had no need of a companion. And yet, dot and yet, these mongrels. It wasn't that he underestimated them, indeed, he was cautious because of that very reason. Their abilities were varied, their numbers legion. Yet they were all, so, weak, unworthy of his rule. What was strength when none could compare to you? Of what worth were his treasures when he had no use for them? Why even deign to interact with these mongrels at all then, if wasn't amusing? Thus, when the opportunity to escape the endless cycle of boredom presented itself, who was he to refuse? The king of heroes viewed the commotion in the forest below as a more than mere chaos. He saw it as an opportunity. A chance to add another item to his vaunted collection. Snatches of conversation floated up to him on the wind, carried by harried voices. Some boy had stolen a scroll. Not just any scroll. The scroll of sealing. Interesting. Very interesting. Apparently this oh-so-precious item contained the secrets of this world and a fair number of others and this boy had somehow surmounted their elite defenses to steal it, finally a reprieve from this endless monotony. He'd, liberate, the boy from his burden of course, it was only just. No matter the world, nor the realm, it was all his garden. All treasures originally belonged to him, he was merely reclaiming them. Unbidden, an idea arose. Hmm. Yes, perhaps if he used, those, then he might finally escape this boring lackluster existence. Given proper motivation, he supposed even a faker could be entertaining. Somewhere within Konoha, 
Naruto wasn't very smart. In reality, he was quite dense, it took him more time to grasp certain concepts than others, but once he did, he took them to an exceptional level. Ludicrous, even. The boy considered it one of his finer points. Once he set his mind to something neither kings nor cage nor the shinigami could budge him from it. The sun itself could burn out, and he would die still clinging firmly to his ideals. He possessed a rare quality for determination that those triple his age lacked. To put it plainly, the boy didn't give up. If there was a will, then there was a way, as the saying goes. Set a goal for him, and he'd surpass your wildest expectations. On this fateful night, someone had pushed him to go that one step further. To steal that which had never been stolen, to take what had never been taken. To claim that which had lain unclaimed for decades. If he pulled off this task, he'd finally be a ninja. He'd show them all, prove himself to the world, finally get the recognition he so craved. It never once occurred to him that he might have been duped. Deceived, not to say he was a fool of course. Far from it, the boy was simply too trusting. Far too trusting for his own good. He'd never once considered that Mizuki might have alternative motives. And why should he? After all, he'd never once tasted the sting of betrayal in his 15 years of life. Despair perhaps, loneliness certainly, but betrayal? How could he possibly expect it? Betrayal implied someone would have to be close enough to Naruto to betray him in the first place. His bonds with his classmates were strained at best, frayed at worst. Few wanted anything to do with the class clown, the loser, the dead last. The one individual that actually did was so beyond his ken of understanding, that he didn't even know them. No, none realized his smile was a front, a facade to hide the pain he truly felt, they did not see how desperately he sought their attention with his pranks, nor did they realize that their laughter, their jeers, were a thousand knives beneath his skin. He'd have the last laugh after tonight. That aside, stealing the scroll had been, almost too easy, all things considered. The old man had been laid out with a single sexy jutsu. Escaping had been a moot point from there, in the end, Naruto had run as fast and far as legs could carry him which was considerable considering the sheer depth of his chakra and sprawled out in the forest. From there, it was merely a matter of reading. In all his wildest dreams, he'd never imagined he'd find so many secrets stashed inside something this large. There was the knowledge of the forbidden cage bunshin no jutsu, for example. When one created a clone and then dispersed it, all the clone's memories were brought back to him. In combat, the original could essentially learn from his own failures, without ever making them. Hasty notes were scrawled within. Having already developed a basic grasp of such a concept, Naruto had immediately opted to put it to practical use. In a rather unconventional way. Presently, every able-bodied shinobi in the village was chasing a horde of shadow clones, each armed with a disguised log, masquerading as the scroll of sealing thereby freeing the original to peruse the secret of the real scroll at his leisure. As he delved deeper into its myriad depths however, there were less and less jutsu to be found oddly enough. Oh, there were all kinds of S-class secrets sealed within to be sure, but the boy didn't pay attention to them, for they were far beyond his grasp. Best not to break the fourth wall on this one no? Eventually he came upon a portion of text so faded and worn he could scarcely decipher it. Ha! Huh. The genin to be peered at its contents idly brushing his fingers across the tattered text. It came to life at his touch, brightening beneath his fingers. Ha, huh, these weren't jutsu, he read on, frantically scanning both the images and the text, hastily filing everything away as fast as his young mind could process it. What the hell was a class card? There came the mention of things such as prana, noble phantoms, spells. And then there were other, more macabre meanings. It told of a holy grail war, a great battle in the past, and instructions as to how one might triumph in such a battle. Components, machine parts, needed to build. A time machine? What the devil? Naruto read carefully from there on out, sparing no detail, no matter how inconsequential it might seem. He found the matter of a wish-granting system to be hopelessly complex, and abandoned it outright. Other secrets, however, raced right up his alley. Reinforcement. Presence concealment without usage of chakra again the concept of servants arose methods of detecting sources of power, and so on. So much to read. There was even mention of something called servants and the like. Those, 
Naruto committed to memory. Anything that could increase this strength he carefully filed away in the annals of his mind. Some things were best left forgotten of course, but he struggled to cram them into his brain nonetheless. Anything that would help make him a better genin. Anything to reach his dream. To be acknowledged. Recognized. Now, he just had to do his best to elude pursuit. After all, Mizuki sensei was certainly going to be in for one hell of a surprise when he showed him all that he'd learned. Poof. Naruto jolted back to reality as his thumb accidentally brushed something it shouldn't have. Reacting to his touch, the miniature seal spat its contents into his lap. Launched, actually. Oomph. Grunting in surprise as much as pain, the blonde massaged his aching stomach and sought the source of his sudden discomfort. What in the world? Revealed was a small rectangular box of sorts, firmly bound by a golden cord. Black as the shadows themselves, its ebony surface seemed to gleam in the faint moonlight, begging to be opened. Questing for his attention. No, that wasn't quite right. It felt. Different. Warm to the touch. Almost alive. Yet. Dot not. As though it were a piece apart from reality itself. A strange pull emanated from the mysterious box, tugging at his heartstrings and his hand almost started towards it before he caught himself. Still, it called to him. Unbidden, his fingers twitched. Open it. Naruto wasn't sure if that voice belonged to him or another, but the desire remained. He wanted to see what was inside, he wanted to know what lurked within. Consumed by curiosity, Naruto found himself helpless to resist. Gingerly, he freed the knot and unwrapped the cord. Once. Twice. Thrice. His task completed, the boy's hands closed around the lid, only to jerk back with a yowl as a burning pulse seared through his hands. An eerie image flickered in his mind, unfocused. Indistinct. When he reached for it, the scene vanished, reeling through his fingers. Undaunted, he reached for the lid again. The box was no longer warm to the touch, if anything it felt cold. Not willing to wait any longer, he jerked it free. He'd half expected to find a weapon within, a seal of some sort, or perhaps even a smaller scroll revealing some almighty jutsu. Instead he found, cards, countless cards, more than he could even begin to number, each bearing a myriad design of sorts. Some held many stars, others, more. Again that image flickered in his mind, but in his anger Naruto foolishly dismissed it. He nearly despaired. What kind of joke was this? Incredulous he held the box aloft. All that work, all that running around. Dot for a friggin' deck of cards? Boss. Naruto jerked upright with a startled hiss, his hands binding the box with the cord and slamming it into one of his many pockets. Moments later. A body came crashing through trees and into the clearing. Baruka, no, not now. To his relief, it was only one of his clones. But his relief faded the moment he saw the doppelganger's condition. Poor thing looked like it had gone through a meat grinder and back again. Clothes lay tattered in rags around its shoulders, its body battered. The clone's left eye was already swollen shut, and right looked to be well on its way. W what happened? He asked as the clone flopped forward its goggled forehead striking the dirt with a resounding thud. Too many. Dot too strong. With a resounding, poof, the clone vanished in a plume of smoke. Oh. Uh oh. Then the memories of said clone hit Naruto like a jackhammer, sending the boy stumbling. They'd been defeated already. But how oh? He'd failed to account for his utter lack of skill, where the basics of hand-to-hand -hand combat were concerned. His genjutsu was abysmal. He couldn't control his chakra properly for ninjutsu, and even his taijutsu fell far, far below par. His only real techniques were the sexy jutsu and while it proved most effective in ending male pursuit he realized he'd inadvertently roused the entire female populace against him. And they were headed straight for him, crossing his fingers, the blonde groaned and hastily summoned another horde of clones. A command transformed the copies into a more, enticing, form that would undoubtedly attract the attention of his pursuers. Quietly bemoaning the increasing drain on his reserves, he sent them off towards the distant mob. There. This trick would buy him some time certainly, but not much. He had no intention of being anywhere near here when they eventually discovered his ruse. Crazy women. They'd fall on him like vultures to meet. Right, then. He grunted, forcing himself to stand on numbed legs. Wincing. He hastily gathered the scroll in his arms, 
time to go. Ah, there you are, Naruto. A deceptively gentle voice floated to him on the wind. I've been looking for you. Mizuki. Relief foolish. Foolish relief flooded the boy as he turned to face his teacher. Yes. He was so close now. All he had to do was demonstrate what he'd learn and then. Who gave you permission to speak, mongrel? A golden blur streaked past Naruto's head. Followed by another. Then another. Another still. Another. Crunch. Mizuki didn't so much see the weapons in the dark as he did sense them. Years of honed instinct gave him that much, regardless, it made little difference in the end. Despite his frantic attempts to evade the five-pronged assault, he was only partially successful. The first blade clipped his right shoulder and sent him spinning in place. The second slammed into his stomach, obliterating the organs within in grisly red relief. The third punched through his thigh and dropped to a knee even as the fourth sheared through his chest. The sheer force of the fifth, an axe, ripped the would-be defector him from his feet and drilled him into a tree. In the end, the traitor died without so much as a scream. Clap, clap, clap. The sharp and sudden sound of clapping shattered Naruto's disbelief. Well done, a rich, regal voice intruded upon his melancholy, its owner appearing as though on a golden breeze. You've given me quite the show tonight, mongrel. After all, it's not often I get to see so many fools chasing their own tails. Let alone silence one. Naruto froze. Regal. A king among kings. In a word, this man was royalty. Clad in golden armor beyond compare, he exuded arrogance from the very core of his being. No, this man was arrogance, superiority personified. A being that defied imagination. Eyes the color of fresh blood observed the world and declared it as his own. Everything belonged to him. The land. The sea. The very sky itself. Truly, there could be no contest. No challenge. No resistance. The world would continue or end at his whim. Naruto's mind continued to blurt out these incomprehensible thoughts as he beheld the Golden King who had just taken Mizuki's life. What was he? What was this immense pressure he felt emanating from him? Numbed, he spoke. You killed him. Why? Harsh laughter greeted him. Why? I need no reason to slaughter a dog. Rejoice, for he has served his purpose. Besides, those eerie scarlet orbs narrowed upon him. That mad dog intended to betray you and take the scroll for himself. Did you not know this? Be betray. Trembling eyes turned towards what remained of Mizuki's mangled corpse. The storm of swords had rendered it nearly unrecognizable, his twisted face frozen in his final moments of horror. In another world, he might have revealed the boy's secret and irrevocably altered his life forever, but now? He went to his grave with the knowledge, and thus, the boy's world changed. Perhaps for the better. Perhaps not, who can say? Try as he might, his tongue finally got the better of him. Who? Dot the hell are you? Red eyes found him in an instant. You there. Boy. Were the next word to escape his divine countenance. You have the deck? He didn't wait for an answer, for he must have found what he sought in his eyes. Good. You'll learn to use it in time. You have my thanks for that, at least. Now. Um, now. Bo. When the order reached Naruto's ears, his body automatically did as told. With a lurch his legs betrayed him, before he rightly knew what was happening he found himself on a single knee with his face toward the dirt. Wait, why am I kneeling to some guy in gold armor? Despite his thought, Naruto didn't get up, no, rather, he couldn't. There was something about this regal individual that just compelled him to obey. Even though he was against it, he had no choice, no say in the matter. Whoever he was, the man smirked as he tilted his head down at the boy. Like an indulgent king addressed his subjects, he spoke to him. It is proper for a peasant to show respect to his king, especially when their ruler is about to reward them. As he spoke, the unknown man lifted a gold-clad wrist, revealing two cards in his hand. One bore silver designs, the other seemed to be etched with gold itself. Again Naruto was struck by the image of a card in his mind. His hand almost stretched out but fear of having it lopped off held him back. He knew in his heart of hearts that he was no match for this man. To defy him was to die. To anger him was to die. To breathe without permission was to die. E.H. Reward? Despite his fear, 
he couldn't help but be confused. What had he done to deserve a reward? As if he sensed the boy's conundrum, the golden man gave a simple elaboration. All the mongrels chasing fakes has been quite amusing, he declared. It has been some time since I've been this entertained. Now, here is your gift. Once more, Naruto saw the two cards. Now, the golden king held them face down, revealing the backs decorated with their unique designs. I have no need for these things, perhaps you will find enjoyment in them. With those words, the cards were almost carelessly dropped, and Naruto's hand reflexively shot up to grab at them. Looking back, perhaps that was a mistake on his part. Perhaps it wasn't. Regardless, the second his skin made contact with the silver one, a spark of energy flew out. Within moments it was joined by countless others, each latching onto him one by one, each draining him of his chakra like a broken sieve. With a startled yelp, the blonde stumbled backwards, unable to relinquish the cards in his hand. What the hell? It appears that you will be worth observing boy. The golden man stated, turning his back on him. Heed well the words of your king and pray that I do not grow bored of you. With a snap of his fingers the scroll of sealing vanished from the face of the earth, sucked into a strange golden portal that hadn't existed prior. A pit of dread opened in Naruto's stomach as he watched his prize disappear into the vortex, even as the wild silver sparks continued to dance around him with great force and intensity. Oh, no no, 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 this wasn't happening. This couldn't possibly be happening. Without the scroll of sealing he had no way of passing the test. If he didn't return the scroll. Exile would be the least of his worries. Hey, wait, I need that, not my problem, mongrel, farewell. With a laugh, his body began to break down into a golden haze. Before Naruto could shout for him to come back a bright light burst from the silver card in his hand, forcing him to avert his eyes lest he loose them. The wind picked up, a great and mighty gale stealing the breath away from his lungs. A terrible keening arose, threatening to sunder the very trees themselves. To destroy a forest that had stood for generations. Distantly over the din, Naruto thought he heard the great king laughing at his plight. In fact, he barely heard himself shout over it all. Damn, it's like the sun decided to come down and say hi. After a few seconds, Naruto felt the wind die down and the light ceased. Groaning, he put his arm down as he pushed himself upright, reluctantly opening his eyes. His heart stopped, in disbelief he looked outward. In shock, he refused to avert his eyes, and saw. Saw. Holy shit. Before the blonde teenager stood a tall woman of peerless and unparalleled beauty. Her hair a curtain of amethyst silk that cascaded down her back. A sleeveless, black low-cut mini dress covered her torso while black and purple elbow gloves sheathed her arms, matching the thigh-high boots adorned her legs. And her body, beyond compare. No words could do it justice. Even the legendary Tsunade herself would be hard-pressed to match her in beauty alone. And her eyes. Naruto blinked as he realized he couldn't see her eyes, for they were concealed behind by a purple mask. Not so the crimson mark on her forehead. Her stance was neutral as her body faced his. Regarding him through her blindfold she spoke softly. Something about her low, melancholy voice nearly broke his heart. I ask, are you my master? Naruto wanted to cry. Scratch that, he wanted to die. Whichever of the two came first, really. Although given his abysmal luck thus far as well as the complete and utter lack of sanity of all parties involved, it was probably going to be the latter. In all honesty it was something of a miracle that he hadn't been found and dragged before the old man already. In a single stroke he'd gone from pariah to traitor in the eyes of the village. Everything that could have possibly gone wrong had. He'd stolen the scroll of sealing, bungled said scroll when faced with a mysterious man in gold, then said man had stolen the scroll out from under him. He'd also accidentally gotten Mizuki killed, which someone was almost certainly going to blame him for. Never mind that the man intended to sell him out in the end, which made him the least concern in the blonde's mind. As far as he was concerned the latter had received his comeuppance. And what did he have to show for all this beyond a splitting migraine? A deck of cards that he had no idea how to use. A beautiful woman who called him master. And a chorus of voices in his head, how was that a fair trade? Speaking of voices, geez, master. A rough male cry echoed in the back of his mind as he trudged up the beaten path leading to his apartment, 
You actually have worse luck than me. That's saying something. Didn't think you'd run into the king of heroes right off the bat. He's a pain the ass to fight. Gahaha. Girlish laughter greeted his words. It cannot be helped, strong opponents bring out the best in us. Indeed. A woman's cultured sigh echoed the first sentiment. Gilgamesh is not someone to be trifled with unless the odds are overwhelmingly in your favor. You're lucky to be alive, boy. I suggest you prepare before you encounter him again. Miss Demon Archer aside, I doubt that Dog will be able to help you when the time comes. Naruto blinked. Gilgamesh? King of Heroes? Goldie was that important? Ignorant of their master's sudden realization, the aforementioned Lancer took offense to that remark. Huh? I wasn't asking for her opinion, Poisoner. The kid doesn't need a hag like you. How uncouth, Lancer. One should be polite to a lady. UMU, I agree, disrespect isn't beautiful at all. Oh, that's rich coming from a pair of, oi. Naruto ruthlessly tuned out the impending argument before anyone else could jump in and split his head open at the seams. Something in him knew better than to stop them. Still, he gained a kernel of truth. Gilgamesh. At last he had a name for the man who'd become the bane of his existence. Now he knew who to curse. Get stronger, he said. Don't bore him, he said. What kind of bullshit was that? He might have spared him the trouble of Mizuki, but he'd more than made his own. Whatever ability Gilgamesh held, it would be difficult to face, let alone counter. Just what kind of technique summoned those swords? And why did he get the feeling they were only the tip of the iceberg? A beat of silence followed as the exhausted blonde scaled the last of the rusted staircase and reached the battered door that signified his humble abode. Ah, door. He really needed to set aside some time to repair the poor thing. It had seen better days. Fishing out a key from his tattered pocket, Naruto quickly inserted it into the lock and wrenched it open. He'd almost expected to find an armed Anbu detail waiting for him within. Even now he tensed, waiting for shadows to emerge from the dark and lay hands on him. To drag him before the Hokage. Nothing came of his fears. Well, seemed he still had some luck after all. That, actually befuddled him a bit. The geezer might try to pretend otherwise in his old age, but he wasn't a slouch. He knew how to command his men and he knew that he had nowhere else to go. Honestly, he was amazed he hadn't been apprehended yet. He might be good, but he wasn't that good, so what the hell was he missing? The shadows held no answers for him. I'm home, he muttered half-heartedly. No one answered of course. Damn, this is where you live. A boy's voice overshadowed the silence in his head. What a dump. Risking a step over the threshold. Naruto restrained a small shudder. Half-heartedly he plucked the deck from his pocket and shoved it in a drawer. It did little to relieve his burden. Furtive eyes darted anxiously about, tensed for an ambush at any moment. For the depth of his deeds were finally catching up to him and panic had begun to set in. Once the four walls of his home had been a source of comfort for him. Now, it felt suffocating, like the walls were closing in. For a moment Naruto wondered if he should cut and run. He could, couldn't he? Just drop everything and put the village behind him. After all, what did he owe them? His career as a shinobi might as well be over after this. Reluctantly, he dismissed the notion. Where would he go, anyway? Where could he go? No for better or worse, he was trapped. Apparently the two servants had continued their bickering while he was having his existential crisis for a deep growl resonated in agreement to someone's declaration. This one proved impossible to ignore, Grar. Well said, Heracles, you're not so bad after all. Even Naruto knew that name. Blue eyes bulged. Who? A sudden bout of dizziness seized him and he pitched forward. Oh, he realized belatedly, I didn't think I used up that much chakra. In truth, he hadn't, it was merely mental exhaustion, he'd pushed himself too far, too fast. Ah, shit, Lancer swore. Kids down, Naruto would have collapsed right then and there, were it not for Ryder's vigilance. Even as he fumbled and lost his footing a gentle hand was there to pick him up. Strong, supple fingers gripped his shoulder and tethered him in place before pivoting, swinging his battered body around onto the bed. Narrowly catching himself against the bed frame in time, the weary teen risked a glance back at her and fought the urge to sputter. Aha. Uh -huh. He'd nearly forgotten about her altogether. 
The servant in question had thus far followed him at arm's length until this very moment, never once speaking, never questioning him. They barely spoken so much as two sentences to one another since her summoning, yet here she was. Now, for the first time since they'd met he gave her his undivided attention. Why? You are my master. Again, her reply lacked any hint of emotion. Your well-being is my responsibility. Naruto shifted restlessly on the bed. You keep using that word. I don't think you know what it means. Her head tilted, though in confusion or anger, he knew not. You summoned me, did you not? Yes, well, that was a result of. Then you are my master. The sudden steel in her words made Naruto blink, but only for a moment. A bitter laugh escaped him despite his best efforts. That's it. I give up. This situation was entirely absurd. In the last hour, his mind had suffered in such a way that he now felt empty inside. Hollowed. His once youthful naivete had been stripped out of him and stomped on. His dreams, crushed. First by Mizuki, then Gilgamesh. With the former's death he desperately attempted to recover, only for the arrogant king of heroes to crush his hope altogether. Together they'd thrown his life onto a different path, one he couldn't seem to escape. And now he had to entertain a gorgeous woman who seemed convinced that he was her master. Plainly put, he just didn't have it in him to smile. Right. Some, master, I am. He glowered at the floor. I'm going to be dead or imprisoned by tomorrow. What the hell, master? A troublesome saber's voice drawled. Don't tell me you're given up just like that. What happened to all that spirit? Quiet. You fool girl. Someone snarled. What do you know of betrayal? Leave the boy be. Shut up, ya damn witch. Why? Now it was Ryder's turn to inquire. Simply put, the boy palmed his face to hide his shame, because I'm an idiot and I got outplayed. I learned my lesson too late. Ryder, right? I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, ya no. I don't like to give up, but I don't see a way out of this, and ya no. A spark of anger briefly blazed his eyes red. Sharpened teeth sank into his hand. Damn it, this sucks. The bed creaked in quiet protest as Ryder's weight settled beside him. A faint rustle of leather informed him of her movement, but in his despair he didn't register, until her hand settled on his knee and gave him a gentle squeeze. For such a stoic servant an action like this was utterly unheard of. Naruto didn't know how he knew such a thing, the knowledge was simply there as though he'd read her history at a glance and recalled some random tidbit. Nevertheless, some small part of him felt honored by this sudden and unexpected show of affection. Nevertheless, you are still my master, she stated, withdrawing her hand. I will carry out any orders you give me. Well, that makes me feel a bit better. Ryder's blindfolded gaze couldn't possibly have seen his expression yet she heard the despair in his voice, twisted her body aside, and offered him a faint smile all the same. Her position seemed a strange one, though her visage remained firmly fixed in his direction she still kept the door well within her, vision, from the moment he'd explained the situation, she'd gone tense, as though she were trying to divide her attention between him and the sole entrance into the apartment at the same time, even now, he felt she would fly at whomever came through that door and cut them to pieces, such was her vigil, watching it, shadowing him, no, more than that, Medusa was protecting him, without a single order on his part. What? He nearly recoiled at the unexpected knowledge. How in the hell did he know her true name was Medusa? This was too much. When he groped for answers, his mind nearly burned itself out. As if someone had shoved an encyclopedia of unknown knowledge in his head, so too did his brain feel full to bursting. Like his skull would split open at any moment. There too many voices in his head. Even then he was aware of other silent entities gauging him, monitoring his every reaction. He stood at a turning point, a precipice in his life. He could step back and lose his mind to madness. Or he could take the plunge and see what lay on the other side. What had he stumbled into? Oddly enough, a small part of him found his plight funny. It was almost enough to make the boy laugh, maybe he should laugh. To snicker and cackle, laugh his head off to laugh and laugh and laugh until everything broke and his sanity fell away. There was a release in madness, an escape. All he had to do was let go. Once he did, he'd never have to care again, yet something stopped Naruto. A thorn of pride pricked his heart and held him back. He experienced an epiphany then.
the sudden realization that were he to let go, to simply allow the horrible events of this night to break him, he'd forfeit a precious commodity. Something valuable. Something he could never recover. A thousand emotions raged back and forth like countless serpents, each one writhing into an ugly knot in his chest. Anger. Sorrow. Disgust. Pity. Confusion. Others he couldn't even begin to quantify. In the end, his pride held out. With each passing moment he felt his psyche harden against his fate, stubbornness rearing its head in spite for what he'd endured. He wouldn't let this despair beat him, rather, he refused to let it win. He absolutely refused. After all this, the idea of just laying down and accepting his fate left a bad taste in his mouth. What was there left to do but fight? As futile as it might seem, this was all he had. Is something wrong, master? Naruto's face flushed ever so slightly. No, he shook his head, I've just made my decision. Well said. A golden haze escaped from the deck in the drawer with a triumphant cry, manifesting itself in a shroud of flowing particles on the floor. Within seconds, the flowing radiance assumed a distinct humanoid likeness. Naruto stiffened at the sight, recalling Gilgamesh had departed in just such a manner. Had that golden king come to torment him once more? In the end, his fears proved themselves misled. Gilgamesh didn't wear black and he certainly wasn't a woman. Indeed, the newcomer's arrogance alone stood on a plateau of its own and her features could only be described as elven. If Medusa embodied mystery and subtle charm, this woman stood as a peerless queen. Rather fitting, given the nature of her identity. Golden eyes bored into him, framed by hair so dark it resembled ebony. It fell in a wave behind her back, a midnight curtain so long as to trail on the floor behind her. A ruffle of dark feathers sheltered her long, pale neck from view. Her bountiful body lay encased in a shoulder-bearing gold, black dress, the latter of which served as a corset to bear most of her s up for all to see. She cared not a whit for what others thought of her, and why should she? The strong cared not for the opinions of the weak. This was the sensation Naruto received from the newcomer. As he looked on, she flicked a manicured hand through her Stygian hair and fixed him with an expectant look, daring him to question the spikes jutting from her hands, or the ribbon trailing between them. Her name revealed itself to him a moment later. Servant, assassin, she spoke in a voice like poisoned honey its sweet dulcet tones low and crooning like a nightingale's song. You may address me as Samiramus, if it pleases you. I've been waiting to hear you stand up for yourself all night, master. The woman preened, taking quiet pleasure in his discomfort. If you hadn't shown some backbone I would have killed you and Ryder on the spot. Beside him, Medusa bristled. Is that a threat? No, not at all. There could be no denying the subtle satisfaction in her tone. Merely a promise. Now, then. Before Ryder could think to countermand such a statement, the poisoner turned her ardent gaze back to Naruto. The blonde marshaled his courage to meet her gaze, but found no animosity there. Quite the opposite. One might even call her gaze affectionate. Yet she didn't yield to him all the same. Naruto suspected there were some things this woman would never relent on. If she expected him to back down, she was going to be sorely disappointed. Ah. An epiphany dawned on him as he gazed up at the assassin. So that was what he had lost. He'd ceased fearing death. What are your intentions, master? Despite his best efforts, Naruto felt his right eye twitch. Well, not dying would be a start. I'm not a fan of prison, either. That's all well and good, but you haven't answered my question. The ancient beauty hummed. Perhaps I should rephrase that. How do you intend to use me? Naruto had no way of knowing, but his very life hung on the answer. In hindsight, the answer seemed obvious to him, at the time, he didn't think twice about it. He answered her with utmost honesty, maybe he should have lied. More fool he, I need your help, isn't that obvious? Samiramis stiffened at his sincere response, her taut back arching in genuine surprise as her golden eyes widened. Abruptly, they narrowed on him again, as though she were only truly seeing him for the very first time. A faint chuckle spilled from her mouth concealed behind a dainty looking hand naruto was under no such delusion there that hand could snap his neck with a flick of her wrist if she so desired even Ryder might not be able to stop her in time yet naruto felt no fear a few hours ago he would have been blubbering on the floor begging for mercy now nothing 
just a vague confusion, coupled with impatience. No, it wasn't that he didn't feel fear, but he couldn't. His mind had grown numb to it, rejecting the absurdity of the situation so violently that it ceased to recognize the concept of it anymore. He didn't want to die of course indeed, he'd flirted with death more tonight than he had in his fifteen years of life dying would mean the end of life and he was fond of life. But as far death itself was concerned, a switch had tripped in him. In a sense, Gilgamesh was as much to blame for this as him. He'd witnessed the majesty of the Golden King firsthand, but more than that, he'd encountered a being so far above him that any other threat paled in comparison to his aura. He no longer cared. Perhaps she realized it. Boy, you're not afraid of me? Why would I be afraid of you? Naruto frowned, ah. It was precisely the right thing to say, indeed, Naruto could not have conjured a better response if he'd tried. The poisoner visibly swayed on her feet as though he'd struck her. In a sense, he had. A spiked hand shot out, steadying herself against the nearest wall. This time, her laughter sounded almost genuine by comparison. Her brief bout of weakness lasted for but a moment. Then glazed eyes rounded on him. In that instant, that silent sliver of eternity, Naruto experienced. No, not fear. Dot but a flicker of discomfort nonetheless. He had no way of knowing he'd just captured the heart of a rather dangerous creature. A truly terrible, poisonous monster indeed, this monster saw more than most. She could see it now in this orphaned, the barest hint of a foundation, faint perhaps, but a foundation nonetheless. His encounter with the king of heroes had fundamentally broken him. Yet despite that, he was still whole, she could see it. The ungodly amount of energy lent to him by that beast. His unflinching gaze, that boundless determination threatening to drag down the very gods themselves. The shadow of what he would become, a being beyond compare. Given time, one might build upon these meager foundations. With the proper tools and enough patience he could become more than he was now. So much more, yes, she could work with this. He hadn't made her heart flutter at all back there. No, not at all, she was being entirely honest with herself. This boy her master, would do great things. Era, you're just like him. Samiramis mused, thumbing her chin. I don't know why I'm surprised. I need to watch out for that silver tongue of yours. And, she drilled him. What are you going to do about your situation, boy? Do you intend to fight? To her disbelief, a jaw-popping yawn answered. Wordlessly, Ryder rose from the bed and allowed him to pull back the tattered blanket. Right now? He sighed, stifling a sudden surge of sarcasm. I'm tired, so sleep sounds about right. We'll deal with this crap and talk to the old man in the morning. A pause, as he realized something. Wait. Do either of you need to? I do not require sleep. Ryder reassured him. I'll assume spiritual form while you rest. Nor do I, Samiramis demurred. In the meantime, I shall familiarize myself with your workshop. The would be Genin frowned. Right. I have no idea what a workshop is, but we'll deal with that later, I guess. Ho, an elegant brow arched, though he didn't see it. We, you say? You're acting like a ruler already. Are you assuming I won't turn on you? A spark of defiance snarled in his chest. If you were going to kill me, you would have done it by now. Still, perhaps a bit of caution might be warranted. Propping himself up, he cast Medusa a look. Ryder, if she tries to kill me, end her. Again, that faint hint of a smile, as you command. Again, Samiramis's reaction befuddled him. My, she purred, what a broken master I have. Very well. Wait a minute. Naruto blanched as her shadow fell over him. What are you? A. Hey, to be fair, the Uzumaki expected something the moment he saw the assassin smile. Alas, even then nothing could be done. His human body was infinitely lacking compared to that of a servant. Yes, he was slow. Far too slow. By the time he realized what Samiramis intended, it was already too late to do anything. Strong hands took hold of his head despite his muffled protest and pulled down hard. A heartbeat later he found his head laying atop a cushion of indescribable softness, as though he'd laid down on a feathery cloud. The tips of her fingers ran firmly yet gently through his hair, caressing his scalp even as the other held his head in an iron vice. When he attempted to move, that hand pressed down, locking him in place. E.H. He felt a taint touch of amusement from Ryder. 
Baffled blue eyes swiveled upwards, reeling in confusion. Instead of an answer, he found only the smug smile of Samiramis. As a reward for your bravery, I shall allow you to rest upon my lap tonight. Even as he tried to raise his voice in protest, her grip intensified and that same smile deepened. I suggest you remain still. I wouldn't want to skewer you by accident. Yes, she leaned forward. Her hair tumbled down around him in a dark curtain, tickling his nose. I promise not to poison you. All you have to do is close your eyes and sleep. I don't have any say in this, do I? That smile turned simply sly. You do not, master. You are K. Oh ho ho ho. Wah that's cheating. Is this the fabled lap pillow? A chorus of laughter and some dismayed shrieks from the deck greeted him. All of you, hush, unduly irritated by the chatter, he shouted them into silence. This was not to say he was uncomfortable of course. Far from it, he found himself almost pleased by this strange turn of events. You see, Uzumaki Naruto had never experienced the inimitable bliss that was a lap pillow before, not once in his young life. He'd never had someone stroke his head and hum softly to him. From the moment of his birth and his parents' passing he had been denied everything. Though he was indeed nearing adolescence, he was still very much a boy at heart. An event such as this was a rare treat indeed, something to be savored, not spurned. When faced with such blissful contentment, Naruto couldn't help but yawn. Look, just because you put my head on your lap, doesn't, mean. Much to his chagrin, slumber claimed him quickly. Unfortunately, dark thoughts haunted him to the last. For all his bold words, he couldn't see a way out of this one. He'd never become Hokage now, not with this kind of mark on him. Frankly, he wasn't sure he wanted to anymore. If the rest of the village was anywhere near self-serving as Mizuki as far as he knew did he really want to prove himself to that lot? To help them? To aid them? To lead him? This was assuming he somehow kept his freedom in the first place, much less his head. The best he could hope for now was imprisonment. Perhaps exile after they sealed his chakra at the least. What else could they possibly do to him now? Kill him. That'd be merciful. Perhaps that was morbid of him. Was it? In the span of a few hours he'd had naivete stripped out of him and stomped on with a spiked boot. Yet in his final moments before he slipped into the dark embrace of the poisoner who held him, a spark flickered. Yes, a tiny part of him wanted to believe it would all end well. That he'd find a light waiting at the end of the tunnel. All this struggle couldn't be for naught, right? Surely the old man would understand. None of this was his fault, really, it couldn't be helped. Meanwhile, Yes, it couldn't be helped. Through his crystal ball Serutobi Hiruzen solemnly observed the progress of Minato's son. He'd watched in sullen silence as the boy half staggered and shuffled back to his apartment under the ever-watchful gaze of his new companion. He suppressed a shiver at the sight. It wasn't the strange woman accompanying the boy that perturbed Serutobi so. No, there was a decidedly glazed look lurking in those once lively eyes, as though someone or something had reached inside and scooped out everything that exemplified the boy and hollowed him out from within. He looked. Empty. The professor deemed that more than enough and saw little reason to observe any further, he had little doubt Mizuki was at least in part to blame for some of this. He'd caught the tail end of their encounter, and it had proven telling. Whatever scheme the man held in his heart, it had died with him in a storm of swords. Perhaps Inoichi would be able to extract more from the traitor's brain. What little remained of it, in that at least, they might find some justice. Unfortunately, the same could not be said of Naruto. The last time a Yamanka had tried to delve into that boy's brain. Well, the poor sod was still gibbering obscenities in a padded room somewhere. Regardless of Mizuki's machinations, it didn't change the fact that the Jinchuriki had broken the law when stealing then subsequently losing a valuable artifact of Konoha. It would have been one thing if he returned it. That alone would have provided him enough leeway to try and wriggle his way out of severe punishment. Not so now. The aging cage felt his heart break a new time as he pondered the hell he was about to unleash on his young ward. To do so would be heinous. Horrible. Terrible. He didn't deserve this. Any of it. Indeed, the boy might very well constitute tonight's actions as a betrayal. And he'd be right to do so. If mishandled in any way, shape, or form. It would absolutely shatter Naruto's trust in him, at the very least. 
At worst it might lead to an explosion of rage that could bring forth the Kyubi in its entirety. But it had to be done all the same. To do nothing would incite the village to riot, the people wouldn't stand for this. As they saw it, Naruto had all but stolen the scroll, murdered a loyal bollocks. Shinobi and Handed said scroll over to an enemy shinobi. It didn't matter what he said or what proof he presented. Everyone would draw their own conclusions. The truth didn't matter to them. It didn't matter to the council and it certainly didn't concern someone like Danzo. The latter had been looking for an opportunity to craft the boy into a weapon for years now and he saw this as his chance. If he didn't act, that would be the boy's fate. There was no spin to put on this. It would have been one thing if the boy borrowed the scroll, thereby allowing one of Sarutobi's agents to retrieve it. But this. Dot who could predict it? If there was one silver lining to be gained from tonight's dark cloud of chaos it was this. Hiruzen had learned something. Tried and true tactics did not won the day. Luck had. Blind, bloody luck. Dozens of shinobi were sent out to apprehend a boy that, by rights, wasn't a trained ninja. Capable of occasionally running circles around Anbu perhaps, but untrained nonetheless. No one succeeded. If he hadn't returned of his own volition, Sarutobi might have suspected him of going rogue. In that light, perhaps a change was necessary. Maybe the upcoming team roster should be altered after all. No, he was already getting ahead of himself. There were more pressing matters. Matters he must attend to. Mizuki's treachery aside. As much as he loathed it, the boy would have to be punished, one way or another. But for now, he was inclined to let him rest. The lad deserved that much at least. In any case the Anbu would retrieve him on the morrow without too much of a fuss. Putting the newcomer aside, he remained confident in them. It wasn't as if Naruto-kun had more allies to call upon. No, that was absurd. How wrong he was. Within Naruto's ramshackle apartment. The deck stirred. Given life by the blonde's potent chakra, it had lain in wait. Observing them. Watching all. Until now. It could be said that the deck possessed intelligence of a sort. A strict loyalty one could even call it fealty to whomever commanded it. Once bound to them it would brook no other master until their death. The container in which the cards slumbered even contained a portable bounded field of sorts, capable of detecting threats within a mile radius. Decidedly unimpressive given the accomplishments of magi in other worlds and beyond, but its creator had never intended its shell to do the fighting. No, that task was entrusted to the cards, and the heroic spirits within. It was their task to protect the master from any undue threats. Threats that were rapidly approaching while their liege lay in slumber. Unacceptable. Ryder and the assassin were tasked with defending the interior. Yet the exterior was left woefully unguarded, vulnerable. This could not stand. The master must be protected. With a thought, it roused valiant warriors. Warriors to protect, attack, defend. His safety must be preserved. Even if it roused demons. Or ancient divinity. All for his sake, for him. For its liege. For the master. Just outside Naruto's apartment. Their orders were simple. Subdue the boy and his companion while they slept and bring them to Lord Danzo. Preferably unharmed, but if force was required then so be it. No one was to notice them. Any they encountered were to be eliminated or captured as well. It was pivotal that their cell move before the council or worse. Serutobi himself tried to bring the boy in for questioning. This was an unparalleled opportunity and it mustn't be wasted. On that, the men and women were in complete and utter agreement. Konoha's Jinchuriki had been given free reign for too long. Tonight he'd gone too far. Someone needed to tighten his leash. They numbered four. Their strategy, threefold. Approach in silence, using the shadows the avoid detection. Breach the door with explosive tags. Disorient those within using smoke bombs. Fu would take control of the boy's companion. If the boy resisted, Torun would incapacitate him. Terai and Kanoto were merely present as a formality to complete the squad. They were elite warriors each of them, trained to obey orders without question. Their target wasn't even a ninja. Indeed, he'd all but flunked out of the academy three times now. Resistance was expected to be minimal at best, minor at the worst. Minimal. The first man to reach Naruto's door vanished in a hail of what could only vaguely be described as a hail of impossibly fast lead projectiles. 
Terai didn't so much perish as he did disintegrate, flesh and armor alike reduced to a fine red red mist in the roar of gunfire that followed. Still, his death was not in vain. In the millisecond it took for his ruined body to fall Torun and the rest flung themselves to safety, the latter taking up positions in nearby rooftops. They'd scarcely recovered their bearings before their unseen assailant opened fire again, forcing them to the streets below. Kanoto was a hare to slow, the attack caught him in mid-leap. Or perhaps their opponent was just that agile. Even as he hurled himself to the ground below the sky opened and death descended upon him. In a last desperate act the rude swordsman tried to deflect the agile bullets with his blade. Laughter greeted his efforts and he perished for the attempt, his chakra-coated sword tumbling through bloodied fingers as the storm of lead ravaged his body. Torun inwardly swore at the sight, even then he couldn't find their opponent until they revealed themselves. Gahahaha! A rich, demanding voice carried down towards them from above, carrying your assault out at night, E.H. How bold of you lot! allow me to repay your kindness. Silhouetted against the full moon, her body clad in a dark military uniform with a golden crowned cap and thigh high boots, she embodied the very aspect of war itself. Confidence. Arrogance. Wrath. She was all these things and more. Red. Black. Gold. The colors couldn't even begin to do her justice. Crimson eyes like so many bloody endless battlefields leered down at them, rivaled only by the scarlet cloak draping itself around her shoulders and her flowing ebony hair. She stood tall and proud, katana planted into the roof, hands laid atop its inlaid hilt. In contrast to her rigid demeanor, her smile was one of pure, childish glee. Rejoice! Her accented cry rang out, loud and brimming with derision. You face the devil king of the sixth heaven, Oda Nobunaga. It was a statement of such pride that it couldn't be refuted. Yet she looked utterly out of place, more so her weaponry. Torun balked. To merely call them weapons wouldn't have done them justice. Flintlocks, pistols, every sidearm imaginable and then some. Each hung in the air behind their surly master, levitating as though held aloft by a series of invisible strings. As they looked on the girl banished those that had just discharged themselves, instantaneously replacing them with a flicker of blue light. Countless weapons. Innumerable armaments. A wall of near limitless firepower capable of tearing through men and women and armies alike. Arquebuses in the dozens, hundreds, thousands. To count them was to count droplets of water in the ocean. Impossible. Somehow, he knew the name of technique all the same no, it was as if the girl allowed him to know if it. Three thousand worlds, leveled downward, at them. Mind transfer, ha! Huh, as if such a paltry skill would affect me. Fu raised his hands and muttered something incomprehensible. A peal of demented laughter from the girl answered immediately, prompting Torun to realize what he'd just missed. His partner had just attempted to take control of her, he'd failed. Now, the Abarame found himself inclined to agree with the Yamanaka. They hadn't been prepped for this. Whatever she was. Two members of their team were gone already. Fu could not control her. He could not get close enough to touch her. Retreat. They had to retreat, they had to get away from this girl, this monster, this demon before. Perhaps waiting for that very moment, the blackhead spoke up. Yes, it cannot be helped. The indomitable archer hummed to herself, crossing both arms before her bosom. Ordinarily, I would be inclined to be merciful, to let you lot crawl back to your master and tell him of this night. However, a towering sneer warped her pale features, transforming that once benign visage into an expression of pure murder. You peons tried to take my master away from me. Before I could meet him. You dare inflict such indignity upon me after I'd finally awoken? Wide scarlet eyes blazed as though lit from within. Gleaming with unholy light, they narrowed. That is an unforgivable sin. As one, the rifles pivoted, their hammers cocking back with a resounding click. A strange, fleeting phrase flickered through Torun in his final moments. You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. Yes, this saying certainly applied to the servant above. His head vanished in a red spray moments later. Fu survived the barrage through sheer instinct alone. Though he didn't truly recognize the weapons hanging above their heads, he appreciated their power and understood the danger. Thus he wasn't caught unawares like the rest. A quick substitution spared him the fate of his comrade, 
replacing his body with a moldering trash can from a nearby alley. Even as the racket of a thousand bullets striking metal rang out he was already moving with all the speed he possessed, flinging himself down an alleyway to avoid her prodigious rate of fire. That fool girl couldn't hit what she couldn't see. Thankfully she remained focused on her present barrage, how had she not roused the entire village with that ruckus? Why are you running? A demented cackle rang overhead, surely you don't intend to flee. Escape. Foolish. In Fu's mind retreat was not an option. It never had been. That the boy commanded such powerful allies was of a secondary concern now, indeed, one might say it drove the necessity of his mission home for him. His objective remained intact despite the obstacles he'd encountered thus far. One way or another, he resolved to bring him in. He needn't battle that madwoman to snatch the Jinchuriki, she wasn't his objective here. Yes that was the way. He still possessed a few tricks to outmaneuver her. Just needed time. He would retrieve the boy or die trying, else Danzo Sama would, would. Dot why couldn't he feel his legs? In dismay he risked a glance down, only to find a crimson spear jutting from his chest. It hung there for a long moment, protruding from his heart with silent intent. What? His mind refused to comprehend what it saw, the very sight of the weapon so abnormal that it refused to register in his psyche. Trembling fingers reached for the crimson shaft, only to have it violently withdrawn. Denied its pillar OD support, Fu felt his body tumble to the ground in a heap of convulsing limbs. His body was already fading even as the spear left the wound, his mind sustained through sheer will. As such, the Yamanaka had time enough to see his killer. A cerulean boot entered his field of vision, with fading eyes, he looked up. Sorry, a rough voice trickled in his ear, I'm not a fan of backstabbing, but you didn't leave me much choice. By contrast this one seemed comparatively simple. Clad entirely in blue with wild azure hair to match, he looked like a wild dog. Red eyes not unlike those of the girl gazed down at him, though these were soft with pity. That crimson spear in his hand was another matter. Resting against an armored shoulder it radiated bloodlust on a primal level, hungering for battle even as it dripped with blood. A twist of the wrist brought its cursed tip to bear. Ah, his failing mind realized. There was no mercy to be seen in those eyes now, so this was how it would end. Surely the seals on his body would relay some useful information to Danzo Sama. They simply had to. They must. Hold still now, his killer warned as he readied his weapon, I'll make it nice and quick. Wouldn't want to wake up the kid, would we? He's got a big day tomorrow. Everything was swimming now, it took all he had to make the words out. Even so, the dying Anbu persisted to the very last breath. If he he could just learning something useful. You monster. Just. What are. Dot you. Lancer scoffed in quiet irritation. Huh? Isn't that obvious, now? A streak of scarlet arced. I'm just a loyal dog. His last sight was that of Guy Bolg slamming into his face. Blackness. Early the next morning, sunlight. Uh, my head. Perhaps that was what woke him. Maybe his dreams had something to do with it. Regardless, the faint light on Naruto's face would not be denied any longer. Though he scrunched his eyes shut and struggled in vain to cling to the sweet embrace of slumber, his body simply wouldn't have it. He'd had his sleep and now it was time to rise. Belatedly, Naruto realized he'd somehow managed a full night's sleep despite his nightmares. Samiramus must have deposited him in his bed after he dozed off, for he found himself tucked secure and snug beneath the covers. Strange specters had haunted him as he slept. He dreamed of spears and swords, rifles and chains alike. Fire and blood. Of poison and the cries of a woman. And there, at the end of it all, a hill of swords. So many jumbled images that he couldn't even begin to make sense of them all but that last one, at least, remained poignantly clear. Did they have something to do with his new allies? When he stretched his senses outward he sensed. Well, not so much something as the lack of nothing. Bleary blue eyes squinted hazily at the room before him, noting its immaculate state. Odd. He didn't remember trying to clean recently. He certainly hadn't had the time for that before he'd passed out last night. No, not clean he realized. Not entirely. As he looked on, he realized someone had carved a fair number of strangely luminescent runes and how did he know that word? Into a number of the walls, their faces overlaid with strange script he didn't understand. More importantly, 
When had he acquired that ability to sense things? He'd done so instinctively, but the realization startled him all the same. Ryder? He croaked out into the empty room. Silence. Samiramis. No response came. Rather, not from the room. Ah, Oni Chan, don't be so loud. Not a moment later, a pair of slim, tan arms slithered up from beneath the covers and fastened themselves around his waist and one of his arms in an inescapable grip. With a firm yank, they dragged him back down to the mattress with firm insistence and pinned him there. Something or someone shifted under the sheets and crawled onto his chest. Naruto's blood turned to ice in its veins. Not from fear, but rather, disbelief. Someone was in his bed. Someone was in his bed. Someone was in his bed. With a massive effort of will, he tamped down on his own rising panic. No, no, he wasn't going to scream. No, not a bit. Not at all. E.H. A few hours ago, he would have started shrieking and thrashing about in his bed like a madman, and in doing so, created quite the situation. Indeed, the only thing preventing him from kicking up a fuss now was sheer morbid curiosity and his own raw disbelief. Twitching, he turned toward the sound and spied a tuft of snow white hair peeking out beneath the blankets. The weight resting against his chest wasn't unbearable, but bothersome all the same. He wanted to look. Should he look? Did he dare look? What manner of creature awaited him beneath the blankets? Was it human? Would they kill him? No, no, no. Putting the matter of humanity aside, he was certain he shouldn't be in this damn situation in the first place. TCH, nothing ventured, nothing gained. The trembling fingers of his free hand twitched. With an expasserated sigh, he reached down and ripped the blankets free. An annoyed hiss greeted him, akin to the sound of a small kitten. Odd, it didn't sound like a beast at all, URK. She, for this was most certainly a she. Did indeed have white hair. A young girl who barely looked to be in her teens clad in revealing red and boisterous black, her outfit left much to be desired. Indeed, one could scarcely call it an outfit at all for all the tanned skin it revealed or, she was too young, too young, far too young to be wearing something like that. Yet a distant, detached part of his mind pondered upon other matters. Was that a mark on her stomach? What purpose did it serve? And oh she was waking up. Geez, you're making a racket. Bleary amber drifted open. Blinked up at him squinted smiled oh you're up oni chan good morning time for a recharge humming softly she leaned forward shu did she just naruto's mind leapt out the window in hindsight there was only one response he jumped out of bed as if he'd been burned when did i summon a lowly oi naruto squawked chloe von einsburn otherwise affectionately known as kuro took offense to that I'm not a lowly, then why do you look like one? Unfortunately he failed to take into account the younger girl's tenacity. Or her grip. In his haste to escape he sent them both tumbling to the floor in a tangled mess of shouts and crossed limbs. His soul saving grace was that he managed to wriggle his remaining arm free and trap her beneath him. Even then, the strange girl's petulant smile didn't diminish. Why are ya freaking out? It was just a, no, no. No, Naruto frantically shouted over a hand over her response. We are not speaking of this. Not. Who the hell are you? Her grin was telling. Call me Kuro. Nice ta Micha, master. Thus, the first day of his unexpected new life began. Hmm, you'll do. Ino opened her eyes, at least, she made the attempt. Her body obeyed her, yet sluggishly. A small part of her wondered if she was still dreaming. Surely she must be. For her world remained dark, as if someone had draped a pall over her vision, so too did she find her sight blackened. Rather than the gentle morning light filtering through her window curtains, she found herself unable to recognize anything beyond the strange entity looming over her bed. She'd never witnessed such a strange phenomena in the entirety of her young life, yet somehow it seemed almost familiar to her now. Shapeless and formless, it lingered over her like a cloud. As she looked on, it almost seemed to shift, as though she were looking at herself. A mirror's image, an odd reflection. Yet changed somehow. Both her, and not her. That was most assuredly her face staring back at her from the cloud but the eyes were all wrong, almost frighteningly so. They were red, and her hair was more akin to spun gold than the pale tresses she'd known all her life. And that somber expression. 
that most assuredly didn't belong to her. She'd never seen such a pitiful face. It almost made her. Who are? I am Hareshkagal. It hummed at her with a voice eerily similar to her own. I have need of your body to aid my master. Tell me, do you seek power, girl? My. What? Gah, so impatient, despite lacking a solid body, the little cloud of golden light almost seemed to pout. Ishtar was brought into this world with that Tasaka girl as a host. As I was not, I have need of a body or I will cease to exist. Yours proved most suitable given the limited choices available, and I find the idea of dying repulsive. Now, yes or no? Was it pity or compassion that compelled her to reach out her hand just then? Regardless, the young Yamanka caught herself stretching towards it. She thought she caught a smile on her face just then. Ah, very well then. Our contract is sealed. Wordlessly, it dove down into her body. Cold light burned the world white, scene break. The door crashed open with a resounding crunch. Hirazan, not at all rattled by the sudden display of brutality, the professor calmly took a long drag from his pipe and exhaled a thick cloud of smoke. It was his way to weather the storm and then respond, not before, as such he didn't so much as bat an eyelash at the destruction of his door or his office. Nor did he respond when said intruder rammed his hand onto his desk and glared hatefully down at him. He'd seen and done far too much in his storied career as a shinobi to be rattled by such cheap theatrix. Indeed, the third Hokage simply held his tongue and awaited an explanation for the outburst. In the end, he got his wish and then some. Hm? Is there a problem, Danzo? For his part, Danzo took the bait. That boy killed two of my operatives. His good arm pounded against the desk anew, rattling the stack of papers there. I'll have his head. Then perhaps you shouldn't have sent your men after him, he replied thinly, laying down his pipe. Naruto will have his pay docked and be placed on suspension, but he will graduate. If it makes you feel better, I intend to have him supervised. It does not. Need I remind you that you made an attempt to take the boy yourself? This is your comeuppance, and something of a relief for him at that. He'd only just learned of Donzo's heavy handed attempt early this morning, in no small part thanks to Yamato. Somehow, he'd been repulsed by an unknown party. And now that word was out, he wanted to play the victim and escape the blame. This would bear keeping an eye on. No one had come or gone from the boy's apartment since dawn, yet try as they might, none of his agents had been able to gain entry. That. That didn't bode well, considering last night's troubling evens. He'd have to confront Naruto on this, like it or not. Best to dismiss Danzo and be done with it, is there anything else, then? Beneath the bandages, the flushing of his rival's visage was like that of an old bruise, a sickly shade of puce darkening his already pale face. That boy isn't human, you fool, he raged. Neither are those allies of his. They must be controlled. And what allies might those be? In response, the old warhawk stormed out. Little did he know said boy was having problems of his own. Presently with Naruto and company, will, you, please, stop, shaking, me, master. That depends, an icy voice hissed softly, have you learned your lesson? A beat of awkward silence pervaded the humble abode known as Naruto's apartment. No, then the shaking continues. Wa, if Nobunaga had expected to be praised for her efforts last night, she was going to be disappointed. Sorely disappointed. Instead of the accolades and head pats she expected, the peerless conqueror found herself on the wrong end of a heavy handed shaking courtesy of one very exasperated master. Under any other circumstance, it would have been downright comical. A servant being thrashed about by a boy who was, by all accounts, weaker than her. Of course, she wasn't harmed by it indeed, she barely even felt the gesture. That wasn't the point, she'd been denied her reward. But I helped defend you. She wailed between shakes. I demand recompense. Naruto paused, considering. What kind of reward? A good one. A head pad at the very least, outwardly, he feigned a smile. Inwardly, his mind was still racing like a wild deer fleeing from a much larger predator. He'd seen the bodies outside his apartment. The blood. There could be no covering this up. Even now he had the broken shard on an enbu mask tucked into his jacket. Now, Naruto might be dense at times, but he wasn't an idiot. He didn't doubt his allies' accounting of the incident. The Anbu had tried to take him while he'd slept. Lancer and Archer had prevented it. 
Even if they hadn't, he doubted Samiramis or Medusa would have let him go without a fight. In his anger, he made the wrong assumption. So, the old man had tried to kidnap him. Obviously he took exception to this. They needn't know that. Fine. Red eyes widened. Truly, relenting, he hesitantly gave her ebony tresses a light pat with his good hand. The demon archer practically purred in happy contentment. Had she a tail, it would have been wagging, umu. Hey, that's my thing, a sharp, regal voice whined within his mind. Unfair, unfair. How could you be so cruel, Preter? Not now, Saber, it's cramped enough in here already. For someone who so rarely entertained company within or without, Naruto found himself at something of a loss. His tiny apartment was suddenly home to not one, not two, not three, but five guests to attend to, the latter of whom had reinforced the walls of his home with runes. Said runes, coupled with assassins bound at all but ensured no one short of the Hokage himself could break into the establishment. Even if he did, he would both immediately and loudly find himself evicted by the small army within he'd seen what they'd done to the Anbu who'd come for him. It was disconcerting to say the least. Honestly, it made him reconsider his life goals. Screw being Hokage, he'd much rather become a hero. No one would be able to take advantage of him then, no one could. Be that as it may, master. The dulcet tones of Samiramis plucked him out of his daydream with gentle insistence, you still have yet to address the elephant in the room. Your leader has clearly betrayed you. Thanks to my fortifications and Lancer's runes no one can breach these walls, but once you step outside. Chloe snickered, kicking at the bed. Poor Oni-chan, what are you going to do? I don't want to hear that from a kiss-stealing lowly, Naruto croaked. Oni-chan, she whined, I keep tell you, I'm not a lowly ack. A pillow ruthlessly sailed across the room to smack against the smaller servant's face. With a startled squawk she flopped back onto the mattress. You stay put. I'll deal with you later. Ah, so you do care about little, oh Elmi. A fresh volley of pillows answered that cheeky remark. See you Chilane or Lancer as he had come to call him, agreed with Assassin's assessment as much as it pained him to do so. They weren't safe. Far from it. If anything they were engaged in a siege. Dot and he'd seen enough of those to know how this would end. Turtling up here would be the death of them. Like Medusa he'd held his tongue until this moment propping himself up against a wall, casually observing the dialogue between their unlikely allies. Geez, they really had a strange master this time around, and with no grail war in sight. Oi, master. He spoke, commanding the boy's attention. The way I see it. You've got two choices now. Run or fight. Which'll it be? Naruto paused, frozen in the act of flinging a fresh pillow. Well, seeing as we've got nowhere to run, then we have no choice but to fight, do we not? Medusa posited, finally making herself known. If that is the case, then I will stay by your side. Lancer's smile turned positively feral, was hoping you'd say that. Sue, I just need to get change. No, Chloe slapped his hand away when he moved to reach for closet jumpsuit. No more orange, that's the color of death. What? What's wrong with orange? He wailed. For a ninja, everything find something else to wear. But orange is all I have right now. A beat of silence passed between the assembled servants. Er, master? Nobunaga coughed into a fist. You wouldn't happen to be suicidal, would you? What kind of question is that, oh? Well, it's just, wearing those kind of clothes, they aren't good for stealth. Perhaps sensing his realization, she barreled onward in the face of adversity. It's one thing if someone of my caliber wears bright colors, after all, I'm nearly indestructible, but you. You're weak, kid. Lance deadpanned, until you get some meat on those bones, you don't want to attract any more attention. Well, unless you want to walk around in my pajamas, I don't see a way around this. Eh? In response Nobunaga ripped the crimson jacket hanging from her shoulders and flung it at him like a missile. The blonde immediately sputtered in surprise but rather than fly at him her cloak settled neatly around him, as though it had a life of its own. Hmm. Not a bad color. Not a bad color at all. Ah, my mantle looks good on you, she hummed, inordinately pleased. This will do until we can procure you more, appropriate vestments. I don't have any say in this, do I? The boy muttered. None whatsoever. 
Such misfortune, he groaned, palming his face. Samiramis preened. Now, what do you intend? Naruto's right eye visibly twitched. First, I intend to pay the old man a visit. Not alone, I trust? Assassin's words took on an edge. What? No, even I'm not that dense. No, this is what we're going to do. Scene break. Here is unusually welcome Naruto's unannounced visits to his office. The blonde's presence always made for a good excuse to have a short reprieve from the never ending towers of dreaded paperwork that haunted him. It wasn't a secret that the aged Hokage had become very fond of the off jovial boy, going so far to see him as a surrogate grandchild. Unfortunately, given the current circumstances coupled with Naruto's eyes holding enough fury to stop a twister dead in its path, the third knew this wouldn't be a pleasant visit. At least he had an idea to why Naruto looked ready to duke it out with nature. Dot and then there was the matter of his strange attire. No doubt you have questions. With a brief wave of his hand, the Hokage activated privacy seals and invited Naruto to take a seat in front of his desk. For a moment, the blonde just stared at the village leader with those surprisingly intimidating, cold eyes before he sat before any words were uttered. Naruto reached into his coat and threw what was left of the Anbu mask face up on the vacant middle of the Hokage's desk. It landed with a harsh clatter the broken visage upturned towards the Hokage. If his actions didn't clarify his intentions, his response did. Why? He demanded more than asked. His voice cracked with multiple emotions. Anger, sadness, betrayal, those were just three of the plethora Hiruzen could identify. The old man sighed as he rubbed his. Once more, he had to clean up after one of Donzo's messes, and this one was going to be a bitch to attend to considering the obvious conclusion Naruto had reached. Naruto, I know how this looks, really, because it looks like you sent a couple of asshats to abduct me while I was sleeping? The younger one shouted at his elder, eyes smoldering with indignation. This outburst continued, his voice hotly lashing out in rage despite his better judgment, Hiruzen opted to let the boy exhaust the rest of his rage rather than interrupt. He'd soon come to regret that mistake. What the were you thinking? I am not a fugitive who needed to be dragged in like a damn dog. Now the Jinchuriki stood up and planted both hands on the surface of the desk, uncaring of the papers that were shifted out of place. His eyes somehow increased in fury. The Hokage saw the barest tinge of crimson bleed into those oft azure orbs. A minuscule, almost undetectable blip of a toxic, dreadful chakra was registered by the Hokage's war tested senses. This situation needed to be controlled. Now, Naruto, you need to calm down. Hiruzen's voice spoke at last, his voice low. Unfortunately, Naruto was every bit his mother's son despite not knowing her name. No, I'm not going to, calm down, roared the irate blonde, I want answers damn it. Eyes like bloody red daggers blazed into the man's across from him. Unknown to Naruto, the level of agitation radiating off him had roused a certain servant from their rest. Hiruzen sighed. He desperately needed to abate the boy's temper but it seemed that require some persuasion on his part. With steeled eyes and an edge in his voice, the Hokage verbally reminded the rightfully indignant child whom he addressed. Sit down. Now. For all his fury, Naruto froze as he felt an icy chill grip his spine when those words were uttered. What, what was this feeling? Whatever bravado previously held was erased by what he realized was fear. Fear for his life. The source sat across from him, radiating icy disappointment. I said to sit. Coldly ordered the Hokage. As Naruto did so, the aura of death left, and a portion of Naruto's anger returned in a hot glare. The aged man sighed as he briefly set his gaze to the side. Naruto, I'm sorry for doing that. Hiruzen began with an apology. His eyes returned to face Naruto. Danzo had forced the Hokage's hand this time and Naruto's trust was something that Hiruzen needed to keep. The power held within him warranted that he keep the boy close, if not happy. The Anbu sent after you were not under my orders, they belong to a different division altogether. Naruto's eyebrows quirked, yet he held his tongue. For the time being, Hiruzen knew the boy was bound to blow up again. He felt betrayed, and for good reason at that. If Danzo had his way, the boy might well be part of Rude by now. The thought almost made him shudder. Danzo would have corrupted the boy, twisted him into soulless weapon unable to think nor feel. His own plan might not be perfect, but at least the boy would still retain the freedom to choose his own fate. 
There is an off the books sector of Enbu known as Root, he began slowly, their leader. Then arrest him and let me explain what happened, Naruto loudly interrupted. They. Dot the village should know the truth, right? I'm afraid it's not that simple, Naruto. Here is inside with a shake of his head. There are forces at work that you don't understand. Unfortunately, Naruto refused to accept that and made his opinion known. Bullshit. You're the Hokage. He swore a denial, temper sparking back to life with a roar. Your word is law, and opposition to it is treason. How can't it be simple? His very shoulders seemed to remble, shaking with anger. Hiruza knew he couldn't talk to him like this, not here at least. However, there was a silver lining in all things. Naruto had come to him of his own accord, making the cage's next move so much easier. It would wound his spirit perhaps, but taking him into custody would ultimately be for the best. Here and now, before that mysterious third party intervened again. This is for your own safety Naruto, one day you'll forgive me. Wait, what do you a flare of minuscule flare of chakra was the only signal the hidden Enbu guards needed. Two men burst towards Naruto, one to restrain his body, the other to bring him in for interrogation. Hiruzen schooled his face into a mask when he saw the realization dawn in his eyes. It was obvious to everyone that another individual had been present at the time, given the nature of the wounds on Mizuki's corpse. However, the fact remained that Naruto had stole the forbidden scroll which in turn led to its currently unknown whereabouts, he didn't want it to come to this, indeed, he would have preferred to avoid it altogether. But the boy left him no choice. What's going on? Naruto fell into a coughing fit when he felt hands on his arms, let go of me. A kanai found itself at the boy's throat, silencing his protests. He went rigid, betrayal and disbelief chasing themselves across his face. Trapped in their grip he and his companion were more than enough to hold the blonde in place. The boy might be energetic, but he had absolutely no hope of breaking their hold. That didn't concern him. Naruto's expression did. As if someone had reached out and snuffed out a flickering candle, so too did the boy's expression close down, all warmth and hope even anger fleeing from his visage. That was far worse. Old man, this is a joke, right? He couldn't bring himself to answer him. Naruto Uzumaki, one of the Black Ops shinobi addressed him in a low monotone. You are hereby. Naruto's body suddenly and inexplicably went limp in the grasp of his captors. Blue eyes rolling back in his head as he collapsed. Both Anbu started at the sudden lack of resistance, pausing just long enough to adjust their grip on the now unconscious Jinchuriki. Hiruzen fought the urge to rush to the boy's side. Naruto had never been the healthiest child, but even so, he rarely took ill. For him to collapse like this was unheard of. Had the shock of it all finally caught up to him, or was something more sinister at work? Still, the Anbu's grasp seemed solid enough. Said grip found itself shattered as an immense thing hauled both men into the air. A low growl filled the room. Gur, Hiruzen had seen many things in his day. The horrors of war still haunted his dreams, overshadowed only by the roar of the dreaded nine tailed fox. He had witnessed life being given and taken more times than he cared to mention. The old man had also seen many, many individuals in his surprisingly long life as a shinobi. Never once had Hiruzen ever seen a being like the man he currently laid eyes on. Behind Naruto stood a muscular mountain of a man with grey, leathery skin to match. This newcomer's shoulders easily reached over five feet in broadness, and his long, unruly hair stood stained a dark black. He wore no top allowing the battle-scarred surface of his hide to be proudly displayed. His palms were wider than the Anbu's heads he currently grasped. The beast literally held their lives in the palms of his hands. Fingers tightly wrapped around to the back, even now Hiruzen could hear their masks crunch from the pressure. It was anger given form, madness manifested. It stood between him and Naruto. Jiga, at some unspoken command the men were released their unconscious but still breathing bodies landed on the floor. In that instant, he he glimpsed another, lurking in the shadows. Clad in a black, form-fitting outfit, her dusky skin lay on display for all to see. As though just begging to be touched. All save her face, concealed behind a grisly skull mask, she lingered touching a hand to each anbu in turn, her violet hair swaying in a faint breeze. That ghastly mask spared him little more than a passing glance as though he were of no consequences. Or perhaps he was. A flicker of shadow danced in his peripherals, 
Then she nudged past the beast, taking up a flanking position to cover the doors. That very same door through which his guards had burst. Silently, she eased it shut. Then the mountain began to turn and he lost all sense of thought. Hirazan had seen many faces. Some kind, others hostile, and still others neutral. Never once had he beheld an expression filled with so much hatred until the boulder faced him. The eyes were completely red. Not even an iris or pupil were present. Teeth were bared in vengeful snarl. Exposing canine teeth even an Inazuka would be jealous of. The mountain leered down at the sandame as if he were an ant to be stepped on then scrapped off only to be repeatedly pounded with a hammer. Worse, that hammer was now glaring at him. Wh where on earth did this monster come from? Ponderously, the mountain leaned forward. Its towering visage loomed before him. Everything creaked beneath it. Then, incredibly, it spoke. One, solitary word. A gravely growl. No, well said, Heracles, in a swell of saffron, she appeared. If the mountain was the beast, then this was beauty. Clad in a flowing ballroom gown that would make even Enko Mitarashi blush, the newcomer was the very height of regality. One might even call her imperial in her royal majesty. Gold, red, white, these were her colors, her brilliance almost blinding to behold. Flaxen hair the color of straw bound by a crimson bow framed that gentle yet stern visage. One arm had tucked the lifeless boy into her bosom, concealing his unconscious face from any and all harm, shielding him against the world. The other rested upon a crimson blade nearly as long as she was tall, its jagged edges promised pain for any who dared cross her. Seru Tobi strongly suspected the wrong words would bring that blade to his throat. Everything had gone wrong. Instinct compelled him to move. And it was instinct that spelled his undoing. Scarce had he risen in the face of the Heracles' towering fury than the giant's hand crushed down on his chest, entrapping him against the very desk he'd sought to abandon. Something cracked in his chest and the sandame felt himself wheeze. Once more those furious eyes loomed large before him, that furious visage scowling down at him in silent scorn. For all his chakra, he simply couldn't extricate himself from the beast's grasp. Worse, his strength meant nothing in the face of this overwhelming might. Even now he could actively feel his ribs being crushed in spite of his reserves desperately seeking to strengthen them. Even now, his sight was fading, spots dancing across his vision. URK. It was like trying to fight an avalanche with both arms tied behind your back. Try as he might, he was swept up in the landslide. Now, now, Heracles. The woman in red soothed. Don't crush him. That would greatly inconvenience our Praetor. With an incomprehensible reply born of angry growling, the beast relented its hold. Just a touch. Enough to allow Hirazan to breathe unimpeded, yet more than sufficient to restrain both his arms and legs at his sides lest he attempt an unwise escape. Part of him suspected that, should he make any untoward moves, the mountain would crush him on the spot. No, perhaps it would regardless. There wasn't so much as a glimmer of reason in the eyes of the mad demigod, only madness. There could be no reasoning with such a creature. It was the storm, and one couldn't hope to fight it. But where had it come from? Monsters didn't appear from thin air, yet this, Heracles, had done just that. He'd barely seen the golden swirl of light before it struck. And where, for that matter, had the woman come from? He'd seen all manner of jutsu in his long lifetime, but that was neither here nor there. He'd barely felt the faintest wisp of energy, then they were simply there. He suspected there were many more of them who'd yet to make an appearance. Just how many allies did the boy have? Perhaps sensing his hesitation and yes, fear, the swordswoman beamed at him and thrust out her substantial chest. You are the leader of this village are you not? She purred. Then by all means, from one ruler to another. Those poison green eyes narrowed upon him. A mad smile danced upon her full lips. Let us converse. Presence. In a word, Sarutobi Hirazan found himself stricken into silence by sheer, overwhelming presence of those standing before him. Not merely their proximity, but the sheer aura of the beings standing before him, such that it threatened to send his heart into fresh paroxysms of agony. Perhaps that was Heracles' hand entrapping his chest, crushing the life out of him. Hm. Likely the latter. Nor was it fear that stilled his tongue. Even in the face of such overwhelming strength the professor's mind remained perfectly rational, dissecting the situation before him. 
Well, this is unfortunate, all told, it didn't look promising. Just how many allies did the boy have? Though the intruders numbered but three, it somehow felt as though they were legion. A tide innumerable. He could feel dozens no, perhaps hundreds of eyes lingering upon him, some with reproach, others scorn. Each waiting in the wings, ready to pounce at the slightest provocation. Any deception on his part would be met with swift and lethal force. Assuming the giant looming over him didn't do the deed first. As he looked on, the masked woman met his gaze, that rictus skull-like facade considering him blankly. Yet rather than speak, she willingly deferred to the third party in the room. As though sensing his hesitation and yes, consternation, that crimson-clad swordswoman beamed at him and thrust out her substantial chest. You are the leader of this village, are you not? She purred, then by all means, from one ruler to another. Those poisonous green orbs narrowed upon him with sheer intent. A mad smile danced upon her full lips, let us converse. Mental A and aside, the aging Hokage found himself in something of a predicament. A pickle, if you would. With his body trapped and his anbu incapacitated or more likely, slaughtered judging by their eerily still forms and the strange touch the masked girl had laid upon them he found himself left with little choice but to do just that. Any attempt to summon reinforcements or otherwise extricate himself from the unassailable grasp of Heracles would only hasten his end. A messy one at that. Whatever strength he wielded was made paltry by this towering abomination. In the end, he was left with little choice but to concede to her outlandish demands. Given time he could find a way out, surely. Thus he steeled himself for the worst and willed his mouth to move. Very well. What is it you wish to discuss? Excellent. Still cradling Naruto's prone from, the blonde beamed at him. Our terms are simple. As though spurred by some silent command, Heracles released him. He couldn't help but ask, Are you sure that was wise? We can't very well negotiate when Berserker's about to crush you, the blonde chirruped happily. In any case, you may rise. I permit it. Just who was this madwoman? She spoke as though she were royalty, but he'd never seen her before. Nevertheless, a small smile creased Serutobi's wizened face. Many thanks. Though stunned by Heracles' unexpected kindness, the ancient shinobi wasted no time. In that brief, momentary lapse, he wrested himself free from the shattered desk and vaulted to safety. A sharp flick of the wrist flung his coat in the giant's face, providing a heartbeat of distraction. Annoyed, the giant batted at the garment only to find that its prey had escaped. An errant wave of that gravel gray hand rendered the cloak and its voluminous sleeves little more than tattered shards on the breeze. A low growl rattled the room, one born of irritation rather than any real concern. By then Hiruzen was long since past him. Flinging himself forward, he cast a brace of shuriken at the masked one nearest the door in the vain hope of stalling her own assault. That stony facade never wavered in the face of this distraction. Rather than react, she merely tilted her head aside, allowing the edged stars to skitter harmlessly past and slam into the nearest wall. There was simply no need for her to intervene. Even as he reached for Naruto, Saber's face filled his vision. As ever, the blonde favored him with a tolerant smile born of dark exultance. And just where, she began in a low hiss, do you think you're going with my preter, hm? A fist slid through Hiruzen's guard and hammered into his liver with the strength of ten thousand warriors. Pain erupted through every fiber of his being, nay, to call it pain would have been a colossal understatement. This was agony, sheer and primal. Every single cell of his body was united in agreement. Indeed, the sheer force behind the blow floored the Hokage outright. That is not to say he was weak of course, rather Saber's strength overpowered him so utterly that he was unable to do anything but yield. His knees buckled beneath him, legs folding like so much cardboard. Helpless to do anything but curl inward, he crumpled to the floor with a dry wheeze. All the while his mind reeled, railing against the impossibility of what he was experiencing. Such strength. Where does it come from? One punch. With that single, solitary blow the crimson-clad woman had laid him low in a way he hadn't experienced since his genin days. Worse he suffered the sneaking suspicion that she'd been holding back. Nothing ruptured, but if the fire radiating from his side was to be believed this pain would haunt him for many months to come. A golden boot entered his field of vision, gently nudging him onto his side. My, aren't you feisty? 
The green-eyed woman hummed, a hint of nostalgia coloring her gaze. Even knowing the futility of your efforts, still you persist. If only my soldiers possessed the same resilience. Dot Umu. That stray strand of hair bobbed in agreement as she nodded her head. I think I like you. Despite his pain, Hiruzen somehow managed to rise. What do I call you, miss? You may address me as Nero. The crimson-clad woman declared, leaning against her curved blade to curtsy at him. A pleasure to meet you. He didn't trust himself to speak further. In that moment combat was the furthest thought from his mind. He knew he couldn't overcome these monstrosities in a contest of strength. Much less when said abominations had the backing of two others who may or may not be their equal. No, to engage in battle here was good as spitting himself on his own staff. Now that he'd been freed, his only recourse was to escape. But not without Naruto. To leave the boy here to his fate was anathema to the aging warrior. Given what little he knew of the situation, his reaction could almost be expected, predicted even. Perhaps, had he given pause and considered the matter, he might have realized just why they were so keen on maintaining his safety. As it stood, his thoughts were fixated solely upon Naruto and escape. No, any thought of flight died a slow withering death as a frigid hand settled against the base of his spine. A soft, icy hiss pervaded the depths of his mind and in that moment, his body betrayed him. Wheeling to face the newcomer he instead found a plane of frigid ice in place of what had once been his window, denying him his escape. All that remained of his attacker were faint motes of icy dust, even now dissolving on the wind. What was that just now? For a fleeting moment he'd felt the bitter a cold that would put the land of snow to shame. No, not just the cold, but the chill of death itself. As if the reaper itself had laid hands upon his very soul and deemed him unworthy of life. Worse, with the door barred by that strange masked woman his last avenue of escape was now denied to him. Do forgive Anastasia. Nero's regal voice drew him back to reality with a brisk chuckle. She's a bit shy, but she's quite taken with our master. Pity he hasn't met her yet. Master? Hiruzen filed that thought away for review at a later date. If only he could make them understand the gravity of the situation, the severity of the crime with which Naruto stood accused. The village wouldn't stand for this. Perhaps once everything had settled down, and Danzo could be brought to account for this. For now, he genuinely believed Naruto was safer in his custody than with these. Strangers. Try as he might he couldn't believe they had the boy's safety at heart. And how could he? From a rational perspective, one could only view these foreigners as an enemy outlier or at the very least, foreigners meddling in matters they didn't understand. How little he knew. Now, then, what must we do to avoid further bloodshed? Her head tilted aside and for a fleeting moment, Sarutobi found himself reminded of a great lioness regarding its prey. The slightest sign of weakness and she'd move in for the kill. Make no mistake, some of us would rather kill you and put this place to the torch. She paused for effect then, a small, feral smile plucking at her full lips. While it would easily be within our power to do so, our preter has ties here and we would prefer not sever them unless absolutely necessary. That eerie gaze swung northward, regarding the still silent giant. Is that not so, Heracles? The hero of Greece offered a subdued grunt, could it truly be that simple? I'm afraid Naruto must be remanded into my custody until this storm has passed. The aging cage warned. There are powers at work that seek to make him into a weapon. In time he may yet be allowed to take his place as a genin, but for now he simply cannot become a ninja. And what would the terms of those custody be? Remarkably this inquiry came not from the Roman Empress herself, but the faceless warrior standing watch at the door. Sarutobi started, risking a glance at the thin girl. Monotone aside, she sounded remarkably young for one who'd killed with hesitation. As ever that skull mask offered no clues to the visage lurking within. Somehow that blank countenance proved even more chilling than those of her compatriots, if only because he found himself unable to read her intent. Well spoken, assassin, Nero declared, I second your opinion, what would, would you ask of us, leader of Konoha? You would require to submit to questioning, at the very least. Who you are, where you hail from, the identity of your allies. When neither challenged him, Hiruzen dared to plow onward in the hopes of cementing what he viewed as an increasingly tenuous alliance. Naruto would be separated from you while we inspect. Heracles growled. Assassin absolutely hissed. He'd expected anger, 
scorn at the very least. Not laughter. Ha! A sharp, sudden peal of joyous disbelief burst from Nero's lips with such clarity that it momentarily stunned him. Doubling over to clutch at her stomach, the busty blonde giggled like the mad empress she was. Her laughter ridiculing him, his statement, the world itself. Such was her mirth that she momentarily lost control of Naruto's body. If not for a dutiful Heracles, she would have dropped the boy outright. As it stood, the hulking servant swooped down with speed, bellying his size, and scooped the boy up in a giant hand before Hiruzen could seize the opportunity. Forgive my rudeness, she sighed, wiping an errant, mirthful tear from her cheek. It has been some time since someone spoke so bluntly to me. How refreshing. Be that as it may, my demand stands. Serutobi warned stonily. Demand? Nero's jade gaze tightened, no it does not. Regardless, I'm afraid I berserker moved. In an impossibly fluid motion the towering berserker brought a bare foot down upon the floor. Hard. The entire tower trembled, shaken to its very foundations. An ominous crack filled Hiruzen's ears, punctuated by the telltale sound of a pillar giving way somewhere below. For a fleeting instant the world fell silent. In that brief momentary millisecond of peace, Hiruzen almost dared to hope. Then harsh crunch of sundered mortar roared back to life and the world erupted. No, the tower wasn't collapsing as he'd feared but it was tilting, slowly skewing itself aside with each passing heartbeat. Behind Assassin the door rattled as someone slammed their shoulder against it. Hokage-sama. A woman's muffled voice resonated through the battered frame. Are you alright? What's going on? Throughout it all, the servants stood, unaffected. You misunderstand. Nero declared, eyes sparking like flint, her voice raised to make herself heard over the deluge of noise. We are not asking for your permission in this, O oh fire shadow. Nor do we require such a thing. A rare note of anger trickled into her voice, warping her words into a low growl. You honestly believe I would allow you to separate me from my preter? To be used as a bargaining chip against us? What manner of fool do you take me for? A crimson rose manifested between her fingers before he could speak, silencing him with a gesture. This will not stand. With a contemptuous snort, Saber flicked it toward the ceiling. Behold my glory, she intoned gravely, emerald eyes gleaming. Hear the thunderous applause. Her voice rose with sound aplomb, chastising him for his earlier temerity. Sit down and praise. Those words seemed to swell within the four corners of the room, consuming its every edifice with her declaration. My golden theater, kingdom of heaven and hell. The longer she spoke the more his vision swam, reduced to little more than a tattered blur as her speech resonated with his very soul. My heaven, reconstructed. This is where the limelight shines. In a sharp scything motion she brought her blade down. Aestus domus area, and the world changed, to say that it warped wouldn't have been far from the truth. Save that it did not. One moment Hiruzen stood in a crumbling tower facing the very real possibility of collapse. Dot the next reality shifted and he found himself in another realm. Rather the tumbling tower had ceased to exist entirely. In its place stood a realm out of time and history. A golden theater resplendent with crimson, ruby peels draping down from on high. Thousands of seats awaited his gaze, hemmed by empty shadows he didn't recognize. A world that shouldn't exist, yet did all the same. What manner of madness was this? This sorcery went far beyond mere jutsu or a summoning technique. It surpassed the arts of the first Hokage, even. This. This was. Let me leave a saying with you. Nero's resonant voice arose behind him. A miss is as good as a mile. Now, then. The searing heat of her blade pricked against the back of Hiruzen's neck even as he turned. This time, there was no mercy to be found within her emerald gaze. Let us discuss the terms of your surrender. Point zero o octal zero o. I can't believe we pulled that off. Pulled what off? Heracles leveled the place. T to be fair, Saber San did spare the old man's life. UMU, I did indeed. Now those peasants will think twice before tangling with us again. I'm surrounded by fools. Why did I think you could be entrusted with this task? You're unbelievable. You wound me, Artoria. I'll do more than wound you, you damn lookalike. You'll have to catch me first. You're too slow as an altar. Ha 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 ha. Too many voices in my head. Shadup will ya. 
an annoyed snarl shattered the darkness around Naruto all at once, stirring the battered blonde from his slumber. Wait. When had he fallen asleep? Bleary eyes blinked up at the ceiling of his apartment, only to narrow in pain a fresh spike of agony jabbed through his forehead, forcing the young man to squint his gaze shut against it. Why was he here? His last memory consisted of having it out with the old man, those Anbu barging in, the towering shadow that was Heracles. Dot aha. Memory crashed down upon him in a bitter wave of realization as he remembered. He sorely wished he hadn't. Damn. In that moment, he longed to tumble back into the black but sleep would not come to the jinchuriki. Instead it eluded him, slipping through his fingers even as he sought to grasp it. Oddly enough, so did his anger. Try as he might, he couldn't bring himself to feel anything other than hollow exhaustion. Only a day had passed since this madness had begun, but it felt like a lifetime. So, he'd been betrayed, again, and for what? Where had he gone wrong? I don't understand. Everything I've done up until now, was it for nothing? A rough palm rose, shading his face and a lone tear from the prying eyes that were no doubt observing him. Too late. Someone must have seen it, for argument above him abruptly ceased. Someone scuffed their boots on the floor and another pressed a cool glass of what he assumed to be water against his parched lips. Forcing himself not to bat the cup aside, he drank deeply. Cold. He nearly recoiled as the frigid liquid coursed down the back of his throat too, but his body betrayed him and his hands seized upon the cup with frightful force even as he swallowed. Upon draining the cup, a pale hand claimed it from him. Knock it off. Kids waking up, ah, that was Lancer's voice. Finally, someone growled, he's been out for three. Shish. A small voice hissed, don't say that, I can hear you, ya yeah, no. Someone was cradling his head, but when he turned his gaze he saw only snow. That couldn't be right, it was far too warm and winter wasn't upon them yet, then what was he seeing? Did I hit my head or something? Samiramus, he croaked. HMMPH. The poisoner's regal voice swelled in his ears from somewhere out of sight. I'm afraid not. Then who? With a start the would-be shinobi found himself gazing up into a pair of icy blue eyes not unlike his own. Said orbs belonged to a beautiful girl, her long white hair a pale curtain against his face, that delicate fringe now shading half her visage from him as he looked on. Belatedly he realized the white he'd seen was not snow, but an ornate gown wrapped in a fur cape bearing golden blue designs etched into the fabric. A cool hand settled against his forehead even as another clutched a strange doll to her chest. A small, lifeless smile plucked at her pale visage as she gazed down at him. Did you sleep well? Master? A blonde brow rose. Who? Anastasia. The girl's voice remained flat and cold, like a pane of ice, caster class. The name sparked a strange pang of memory, one he shouldn't possess. An image of pain and blood, a pale lifeless hand stretched out against the snow as boots trampled her broken body deeper into the drifts. There was something infinitely sad about it all, a silent longing so poignant that it threatened to bring fresh tears to his eyes. Ha, huh, not bad, master, then Kuchelain cackled. Just like that the memory yield out of his grasp. Naruto twitched. Medusa. Yes, smack, I am. Understood, master. Oi, 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 don't you dare ow. A dull thunk declared Lancer's deft descent to the floor. The sound brought a grim smile to the boy's face. There would be hell to pay for that command later, of that he remained certain but as far as he was concerned the price was worth it. With a supreme effort he willed his trembling arms to support his body and propped himself up on his elbows. Someone lent them their arm and he latched onto the armored limb, using it to rise. A sea of familiar faces were there to greet him as his vision swam into focus, some old, others new. More than a few. There was Medusa lingering near the back of the room, her booted heel planted upon the back of a dazed lancer. Judging by the CU's rolling eyes, he wouldn't be getting up any time soon. Samiramis had laid claim to her own corner near the window, though her pensive expression suggested it hadn't been by choice. Of Nobunaga or Chloe gods be praised. There was no sign, though their absence concerned him far more than the faint presence of a shadow another assassin perhaps? Lurking near his door. Anastasia was beside him of course, but the others. So you're awake at last, Praetor. A new face bowled forward, causing him to shrink back with a start. 
Control yourself, Nero, Samiramus snapped waspishly, you'll overwhelm him. Oh ho! The blonde preened. Surely you don't intend to claim him all to yourself, assassin? Amidst the poisoner's sputtering, Naruto struggled to wrap his mind around what had transpired. Nero? Emerald eyes rounded on him, brimming with euphoria. Yes. I was beginning to fear you wouldn't wake after what the old man did to you. Perhaps sensing his confusion she flashed him a cheerful smile and thrust out her chest with a prideful laugh. Worry not. Heracles and I concluded the negotiations in your stead. Ah. There it was. The anger had returned. Naruto nearly rounded upon Nero on the spot. It was only a lifetime of hiding his own emotions that he managed to mitigate the worst of the damage and suppress his own dismay. Even then a muscle jumped in his jaw and he had to physically fight the urge to slam his head against the wall. His hands clenched at his sides, struggling not to lash out. A disbelieving laugh burst out of him, one born of equal parts dismay and confusion. No, this wasn't happening, it couldn't possibly be happening. You spoke? He choked out. To the old man? The Hokage? After I passed out? UMU. Her head bobbed in agreement, sending that strange curling tendril of hair swaying with the motion. Indeed. I forced the him to concede to our demands. You may shower me with praise. Naruto sucked in a sharp breath. Concede? Demands? Samiramus groaned. Here we go. Naruto found himself inclined to agree with the ancient assassin. The room spun like a top around him and his stomach roiled, battling down the urge to vomit. Not out of disgust, but rather nausea. Sick with fear, it was all he could do just to remain upright. Oh, no no, no, no this couldn't be happening. If so his worst fears had been realized no, exceeded beyond all measure. Had they'd actually gone so far as to threaten the old geezer while he slept? No, judging by Saber's expression they'd done all that and more. Granted. The old man had tried to take him into custody, but that didn't excuse. This. What exactly, he began with a forced smile, did you do? Thus, Nero told him. With each passing moment his expression became increasingly ashen. By the time Saber concluded her tale Naruto found himself on the verge of passing out. Or suffering a stroke. Sheer disbelief warred with a strange exultance he couldn't quantify and neither gained the upper hand. In the end, he managed only an eloquent. Ha! Huh? Will you give in to fear, then? A new voice demanded. Or will you surpass it? Make your choice. Exasperated, the whiskered youth rounded on the newcomer. Oh, now what is it? He growled. Can't you see where? The sight of her struck him into silence. By contrast to Nero, the newcomer was armed and armored as one might expect a knightess to be. Clad in heavy plate over a sweeping dark dress, her pale skin nevertheless stood in stark contrast to her attire. Flaxen hair lay bound back in a simple bun behind her head, stray strands framing an ethereal visage bordering on ghostly. That haunting gaze, those golden orbs, held him nearly bewitched him outright for hers was a presence that did not command respect, but fear. This was a jet black hero, a being stained not in impurity but wrath, a tyrant incarnate. There was no charisma here. Only fear. Merely standing in her presence could set one to shuddering. Medusa, less so. You? Why are you here? Rather than retort, she simply gazed upon him. I ask of you again. What will you do now, master? She inquired. Ah, Saber San? Nero ventured. Artoria, I think you're scaring him, just a little. Ho, oh, if something like this could frighten him, he wouldn't be a master, isn't that right, boy? Naruto opened his mouth to answer, and closed it just as quickly. Something stilled the snark on his tongue and bade him be still. To speak wrongly would end in his death. Every fiber of his being told him so. If the newcomer was not pleased with his answer she would cut him down where he stood. Dot and all those with him. She certainly possessed the strength to do so. Her presence had compelled the other servants to silence, be it through fear or their own contemplation. Regardless, none spoke. Nor did they move to defend him. No, it wasn't as if they wouldn't, but rather, they couldn't. And yet he felt no fear. Frankly, death would be a mercy. Part of him almost welcomed such a release. There it was again, the realization that he'd was fundamentally broken in mind and body. Not by Gilgamesh, but by the sheer chaos the king of heroes brought in his wake and all that followed. 
Once, the sight of this dark night would have spelt his doom. Yes, she would have been more than enough to set him shrieking for the hills. Now? He'd simply experienced too much in too short a time to be rattled so easily. Just as he had with Samiramis, the Jinchuriki felt a strange, alien complacency settle over him. Not quite numbness, but something dangerously close to it. Hmm. Now there was a troubling thought. In that moment, a switch flipped in his brain. What did you say your name was again? Artoria. Right. Artoria. A jaw popping yawn escaped the weary blonde. I'll be blunt. I want to live. I want to struggle. I want to survive. But beyond all that, I want to gut the golden bastard who put me through all this in the first place. I didn't like my life before this, but at least I wasn't looking over my shoulder every hour. To that end, I'll use whatever means I can to get even, satisfied? Her silence spoke volumes. Good. Now, I am not nearly awake enough to deal with this shit. So, exasperated, he rolled over and tucked his head back into the lap of a baffled Anastasia. Whoever you are, come back later. If you're going to kill me though, be quick about it. The words escaped him before he could think to take them back. I don't have all day. Be sure and clean up afterward. Lancer whistled softly to himself. Hey, kids got brass ball. Language. That actually drew a slow blink from the dark maiden. Do you not fear me? I am a tyrant. I ruled my people with an iron fist. I've killed without mercy. Are you truly unafraid? Of you? His shoulders rolled in a helpless shrug. Ordinarily, I'd say yes, but I don't have time for fear right now. If we're being honest here, there are times when I'm not sure I can feel anything anymore. Now would be one of them. There it was, the bitter truth he didn't want to acknowledge, the realization he cursed to the very core of his being. And you, you're clearly all kinds of crazy. Those golden eyes of yours are still pretty, though. Regardless, I'm too busy trying to survive a king's whim to deal in maybes at the moment. So chop my head off or don't. A hand waved errantly over his shoulder. I won't stop you. Be a deer and make it snappy, will ya? Mercifully, sleep chose that moment to claim him. In the end, she never did take his head. Naruto jolted out of his dreams with a startled squawk and flailed to the floor. His head crashed into something painfully solid something that was most assuredly not the floor of his apartment which in turn caused him to jerk back and clutch his now aching skull. No sooner had he done so than he found himself face to face with death itself. Bleary eyes were afforded the most fleeting glimpse of a rictus skull mask, blazing blue eyes behind it, and someone very, very very large. Whomever they were, they vanished back into the ether the moment he tried to gaze at them over long. WWW who in the hell was that? Thanks, Gramps. A new voice chimed. We'll take it from here. Dazed and still half asleep, the Jinchuriki valiantly scrubbed at his face with the back of a hand in a vain attempt to restore some semblance of reason. Needless to say, he failed spectacularly. The vision that awaited him, indeed, the sight even now resolving before his vision wasn't his room, nor could it be called the village in the least sense of the word. This, he did not know this place. He'd never seen it before in his life. Then again, said life had consisted of little beyond his room in the village streets. The darkest pit opened in his stomach. Where am I? Towering trees loomed before him an endless expanse of darkness and shadow that was neither known nor familiar. Something roared in the distance, only to die a horrible squealing death. The sound sent a fresh tremor shooting through his body. After the whirlwind he'd already been through was no stranger to fear he'd almost thought himself numb to it but here, he found there were still aspects of life he intensely disliked. A spark of very real concern snarled across his whiskered visage as he plucked himself upright and stood on trembling knees. A hand clamped down on his shoulder and he nearly jumped outright. Sorry about King Hassan, there. The voice from before was it a girl? Chirped happily behind him, breaking him from his reverie. You're not Kiite -eye ready for him just yet, bit scary, isn't he? I'll say, without thinking, Naruto turned to face the one who had spoken. He didn't recognize the individual before him, but those amethyst eyes framed by pink hair set him at ease all the same. His sixth sense or rather, the feigned connection he felt to this individual informed him that this was no mere human, but a servant, and a strange one at that. Rider. Their class popped into his head almost without want or warning, 
placidly told by the deck still carefully bound in a leather tome in his pouch even as he paused to wonder at them. Clad in strange lightly plated armor with a wild white cloak, they looked the picture of refined elegance and quiet discretion. Then they opened their mouth. Hello, master, beaming down at him, the pinkhead snapped off a saucy salute. Astolfo, at your service, did you sleep well? You were out for a while. An alarm bell went off in the back of Naruto's head. Perhaps it was something in the way Ryder had phrased his words just now. Perhaps it was that nervous, twitching face. Perhaps it was simply his own innate suspicion stoked by the constant betrayal he'd endured for the last few days. Regardless, Uzumaki Naruto found something amiss in Ryder's smile just now. He frowned. What did you do? Astolfo's expression turned sheepish. Alreide, but you can't be mad at me. Ryder. That frown drew deeper still. What? Did. You. Do. Well, there might have been a mob. He confessed, wriggling beneath the blonde's glare. We might have killed said mob. Then we might have knocked you out and okay okay okay. At the blonde's flabbergasted growl, the pinkette babbled frantically and flailed his arms like a wild goose. You were waking up and people were looking for you and we really didn't want to destroy your home so, we just made you sure you stand under. A little longer. To get you here safely. Yes. His head bobbed. That, totally meant to say that. Naruto slapped a hand to his forehead. Why am I not surprised by anything you guys do anymore? How many, please tell me it wasn't a lot. Astolfo whistled innocently. I dunno, about two dozen drunken idiots? The poor boy nearly choked on his own spit. A harsh, bitter laugh burst out of him. Of course you did, because I have awful luck. Ha, huh, of course. Well, where are we then? Oh, right. Ahem. Welcome to the forest of death, the pinkhead declared, flinging her arms up to the heavens. We couldn't think of a better place for this. Despite his own misgivings, Naruto reluctantly cocked his head. This? Why, to train you, of course. Light armored knuckles affectionately wrapped the back of his skull. Do keep up. We couldn't well take you out of the village without risking a manhunt now, could we? Samiramis was quite adamant about that. So she was over the moon when Lancer found this place. Only an idiot would follow us in here. Well, one or two idiots actually did. Ah! Seeing the disbelieving gleam in his master's eyes, the young man wilted somewhat. Don't worry. Serenity took care of them. The lingering scent of blood certainly attested to that. Wait, he asked, who is Serenity? Here, master. The faintest whisper gutted his attention, causing him to turn. Was that another wisp of shadow in the darkness? He wasn't sure. Whomever they were, they vanished shyly into the Aben gloom when he looked straight at them. It? Her? He couldn't be sure. For a moment there he thought he glimpsed another bone what mask, this one smaller than the writhing terror he'd seen in his waking moments. Mastering himself in spite of the fear clamoring in his chest, the young man mustered his resolve and shook his head. So let me get this straight. You, incredulous, he pointed at him her, and struggled not to balk. Are going to train me? All right, I'll be blunt, the paladin admitted. Kid, you suck. Your form is abysmal to say the least. So, with a single stomp, the earth cratered mightily beneath them. We're going to break Yaw down and build back up. Naruto fought down a flinch at the jagged reminder of his own weakness. Astolfo's words cut deeper than he would have liked. Even that simple gesture just now served as an awful warning. If anyone betrayed him, he could not stop them. Never before had he been made more aware of his own lack of strength and his horrible luck at the moment. For that to change, he would need more than good fortune. He would have to reinvent his very sense of self. Who knew how long that would take? But digging in his heels now served no one. All right. Training sounds good. Where do we start? Astolfo grinned. It was, in a word, terrifying. That's more like it. You're gonna go far, kid. Well, I'm not a very good teacher, the paladin admitted, shrugging. Thankfully, I brought backup. Naruto froze as his sixth sense shrieked a warning. Something no, several things pulled on his reserves, pulled hard, leaving him reeling. Wait, who? Laughter answered him. Bah ha ha ha. Without warning, Naruto's world imploded. Earth burst behind his back as a hulking shadow crashed to the forest floor, bringing with him the joyous cackle that only a madman could know. Before he could even think to dodge, to escape, 
to get the hell away from this thing. It pounced upon him and seized him by the throat. Croaking in surprise, he clawed at the giant fist encasing him, to no avail. Act. Let me go. The newcomer was. Large, bright blue eyes blazed back at him. A towering titan of a soldier dwarfed only be Heracles, his great gray body sheathed in scars. Muscular didn't even begin to do this hardy giant justice, nor that eerie, toothy grin that dominated his face. Those odd leather strips clung to the strangest parts of him, coiling fiercely about not only his body, but his very visage. Here was a man for whom sanity held no reason, no sway, no truth. A being devoted to a single purpose, a singular goal, and if he wasn't careful, that goal would render him a red smear on the ground. Somehow, that made him all the more terrifying. Boy, the newcomer boomed, are you the oppressor I seek? Naruto vigorously shook his head. Nope, he babbled frantically, not an oppressor, quite the opposite, I'm very oppressed. Oh ho, that wide grin grew wider still, stretching across the madman's face. Incredibly, the berserker actually dropped him. Naruto scarcely felt himself fall, he was far too busy massaging his neck, wincing at the bruises already forming there. Too close. Way too close. He'd seen his life flash before his eyes, felt those giant fingers tighten about his windpipe. If he hadn't convinced the giant of his intentions just now, the man would have ended him in an instant, snapped his neck without so much as a second thought. Spartacus, a new voice, cold as steel, cut in. We've come here to train him remember? You can smash oppressors later. Amazingly, the gray giant conceded and stepped aside, making way for the third member of their party. Looking back, Naruto almost wished he hadn't. He would have much preferred the berserker to the hell that followed. At least he had some idea of how the berserker of red operated, this one, however. Astolfo snickered, drawing a hiss from the boy, I will get you for this. Looking forward to it. Indeed, the giant declared heartily, slapping the smaller servant on the back with enough force to send them stumbling forward. Fighting against oppression is a noble cause. Silence, both of you. The newcomer snapped. If you're not going to help, then hold thy tongues. By comparison, the companion of Spartacus was far more terrifying. Stark red eyes gazed back at him within a tan face, shrouded by pale hair under a flowing white veil. Much like her comrade she seemed to scorn excessive clothing, her tan body had been forged in war, scars and all. Yet there, beneath them, he glimpsed what might have been tattoos, pale white lines etched into her sun-tanned skin. Those eerie scarlet orbs regarded him blankly. Without thought, without emotion, without care. As though he were not but a broken doll in her eyes, one she was considering discarding even now. In the end, she did not. Her slim body shifted, regarding him coldly. Dot are you ready, master? An icy dagger of fear stabbed his heart. Try not to break him, Altera, Astolfo chirruped. The warrior frowned. I promise nothing, rider of black. One could only think so. Um, Dot can we reconsider this, please? A dark smile blossomed upon the maiden's tan face. No bad civilization is bad. Prepare yourself. Naruto tensed beneath that gleaming gaze. Every fiber of his being devoted itself to this moment, trying to dodge the attack that he knew must be coming. The maiden in white Altera didn't even deign to raise her blade against him, instead, she did the unthinkable. A lone arm rose, fingers clenching into fists as she swung the limb back. Wordlessly, she turned to face him, dropping her stance low to the ground. Once more, that haunting, beautiful gaze fixed upon him, measuring him determining his worth. Judging by her frigid expression, she did not approve of what she found there. Dodge. She commanded, the word resonating within the forest. Spartacus boomed a harsh laugh, I'd so as she says, boy. To his credit, Naruto tried to, he really, truly did. When the earth splintered he dropped flat to the ground. A raging hurricane blasted above the space he just occupied, shearing stray strands of saffron from his head. An approving grunt from Altera followed. In disbelief he momentarily goggled at her, only to realize his mistake a heartbeat later as her heel cannoned into his chin. His feet left the ground, his world spinning like a demented top as he hurtled into the trees, he simply wasn't prepared for any of what followed. Faint movement flickered in his vision, and quite suddenly, he found himself gazing up at clenched knuckles, 
a taut fist his face was even now rushing toward. A soft, almost disappointed sigh trickled into his ears. Dot you weren't ready. He managed one quick retort before she clobbered him. Oh you have got to be kidding me. Then her powerful first barreled into his jaw and he knew no more. The boy slammed into the forest floor with a boneless gurgle. Altera alighted soundlessly beside him, she too, had something to say. It would be a long day, again, no, a thousand times no. Anko Midarashi sputtered at the order she'd just been given. I said no, do you hear me? No, hell no, why'd I have to take care of the brat? Screw you, geezer. It wasn't the order that riled the Kunoichi so, nor was it was the intent behind it that stoked her fury to new heights. It was the one who'd given it in the first place that had her slamming her hands down on the Hokage's desk with all the fury of a madwoman. Most men would have cowered beneath such vitriol. To his credit, the geezer in question remained unbowed. Oh, you'll do it. Hiruzen's face didn't falter, nor did he shift in his seat. You will or I'll see to it you never taste Dango again. The poor woman's teary expression proved almost comical by comparison paired with her earlier outburst. That's Cruel, we haven't seen him in months. Anko struck the desk again with both palms. Worn wood shuddered ponderously beneath her palms and for a moment she wondered if she might have broken the damn thing again. They'd had to drag it out of the ruins of the tower after it fell, even these new quarters in the council chambers were a pale ghost compared to the once grand furnishings she'd known. Gods, who would have thought the kid was capable of that? She hadn't wanted to believe it at the time, but after witnessing the wreckage herself. Well, you couldn't rightly deny something like that. Now they wanted to put her in charge of that walking disaster. Whose idea was that? Oh, wait, she knew that already? His? Let me get this straight. The words emerged from her in a menacing purr as she leaned across that damn rickety desk. You, want me, to take care of a brat who pretty much has a literal army at his disposal. Can I just point out how spectacularly stupid that is? How many ways it could go wrong? No. And you think I'm the best person for the job because of what? A crappy childhood? No, she shook her head, the shit I went through as a kid pales to the hell you've put this boy through. So, sure, I'll do it, on one condition. She told him what said condition was, and to her relief, the aging warrior readily agreed to the terms of her assignment. Under any other circumstance, she might have fought for more, tried to argue her case, even, argued, at least. But something in the old man's eye dissuaded her. Dot and that last threat about the dango. Fine. She'd do it, and when this blew up in his face, she'd be laughing. Still, she paused just long enough to ask one final question. Is he still living in that damn forest? Of course he was. Half a world away. Open fire, with that statement, the world erupted into glorious golden light. It was a brilliant display really, very loud, very explosive. Rotter like fireworks all things considered. Had anyone been present to witness it they might have clapped. Nearly half a dozen servants fired in singular order. A line of archer and riders unloading as one cohesive unit. The world had not seen their like in an age. Cannons roared as matchlocks exploded in a deafening pop, gates opened and dropped hail of molten lead. Others simply unleashed fired in a vicious volley of bullets and swords alike. Naruto wasn't clapping, nor did he find it glorious at all. Not in the least. And why would he? He had to survive that. Nobunaga had only just begun to speak when he bolted. Drake. Blackbeard. Her voice boomed across the wastes. Let him have it. With a thousand rifles, cannons and matchlocks and swords one couldn't forget the swords trained on his position he turned tail and ran. This was part of the plan. He knew he had no hope of outrunning the volley on his own, but that was not his intent. He simply needed to gain some distance, a handful of seconds necessary to prize victory from the jaws of defeat. Clad in little more than a pair of dark trousers and a light mail vest thrown over an old emerald-colored shirt, he knew at once that his attire couldn't stand in the face of his barrage. Don't slow down now, Naruto, Archer's bemused voice rang in his ears as he ran you'll die if you do. I'm going to get you for this, he shouted at a distant speck of black on the horizon. Please do, master, came the immediate rejoinder, now, run, move it. Gears turned in the sky as he ran, the ground littered with endless swords. Swords he had to avoid, 
lest he run headlong into some of the sharper ones and cut himself. He'd made that mistake before. Berserker had been forced to patch him up on the spot and he had no desire to revisit her treatment again. Bah! Less thinking, more running. Now, he could still hear the demon archer's laughter as the first shots began to pepper his feet, as he leapt over a hill and snatched up a sword from its earthen grasp. Scarce had his feet found the ground than his ears began to pound again. He was just gathering his legs beneath him when something or someone poked his cheek. Nobu. A small, insistent voice tugged at him as tiny hands tugged at his shoulder. Nobu, Nobu. A blue eye twitched, then swung down to face his tiny tormentor. You know, I thought I told you not to hang on to me. Nobu. To his credit, the little thing managed to tent its stubby hands and look sheepish as he glowered at them. Geez, you buggers are everywhere, were you hiding in my pocket or something? A happy chirrup answered him, of course you were. Blank white eyes regarded him guilelessly. At a glance the creature rather resembled a chibi version of Nobunaga herself. A miniature caricature of sorts, outfit and all, only they were far more numerous and dare he say it downright adorable than their larger self and less destructive by half. Nobunaga seemingly had an unlimited amount of the little runts wandering about. He didn't even know where she got the damn things in the first place. They just showed up one day, much to the demon archer's delight. She still wouldn't say where she'd gotten them after all this time. Time he was wasting as distant thunder swelled in his ears. Why had he agreed to this again? Oh, right. He was insane. Completely, utterly, wholesomely, insane. Nobu. The little creature jolted suddenly, tugging at his sleeve with frightful intensity, panic evident in its visible eye. Dot why am I even arguing this with you anyway? He addressed the tiny creature with a hiss and pinched its cheeks. Yes, I know she's gonna have them fire again, you don't have to tell me twice. Second volley. Archers. On my mark. Nobunaga's gleeful cackle howled across the sword filled plains with all the madness of a berserker. Loose, make it rain, bring the pain. A distant thunder rolled through the great plains, drawing a groan from the blonde. Why did I agree to let her use that class? She's getting way into this. Nobu, came the answering wail as the tiny automaton hung on for dear life. I'm not the bad influence here, you are, bellowing with as much exasperation as amusement. The young man bolted upright, causing his guide to dive into a shirt pocket as he kicked himself forward with ruthless dispatch. He leapt away, tumbling to safety just as a fresh wave of cannon fire ripped through the hill he had just vacated. He didn't release his grip on the sword, pausing just long enough to swat one particularly dedicated sword out of the air. He bowled on ahead, tossing the shattered fragment over his shoulder before snatching up another. He'd be using it in a few moments. Dot, but not as himself. How many days had he spent training here, weeks, months, years, even? He wasn't sure. Eat, sleep, train, rinse and repeat. He chanted the words like a mantra to himself, willing his weary legs back into motion as a sword cut across his cheek. Unlimited Blade Works was a monster of a noble phantasm, yet like its wielder, well known for its versatility. No one could see them here. No one could find them here. The forest of death was a somewhat decent place to live once you learned to avoid the predators and all the other ilk living there but its size would have done nothing to mask the light and sound from so many weapons discharging at once. Emiya's noble phantasm ensured all but utter secrecy. No one outside of this space would have so much as inkling of what was going on. Unlike Iskander's, it was also more suitable for containing threats. Oi, runt! He jabbed a lone finger into his pocket. Better get away from me if you know what's good for you, chop chop. The miniature creature merely clambered off him quickly as he dipped a hand into his arm pouch. He closed his eyes as a golden cared flickered to his palm. Such as the one he was about to become, well, here goes nothing. Berserker. He chanted the word, hoisting the golden card aloft as a new storm descended on him, install. Wordlessly, he rammed it into his chest seized it with his will and asked the servant do his bidding. This time, the soul within fought him every step of the way. It was a new trick, one he'd only discovered a fortnight ago and ironically, Chloe had been the one to teach him. Knowledge from a previous life had proven rather handy in that regard. Include and install, she called these techniques. 
Include allowed one to wield a weapon from said card and wield the servant's power within. Install proved a far more risky and sometimes quite painful methodology that temporarily allowed one to become a pseudo-servant of sorts and take a more active role in said power. This was the first time he'd done so under live fire, that was, after all, the purpose of this exercise. A stress test, and then, as always, came the pain. Like sucking in one sharp, fiery breath, a gasp that scalded his lungs and scorched his skull. He had to struggle to hold onto his identity, lest the card override it and take control. The card and the servant contained within felt nothing for him and his thoughts, his feeling, his emotions. It was all rage and anger and hate tied together in an ugly knot, one that would happily overwhelm him given half a chance. It did not see him as his master, would not obey him. Thus, he had to bring it to heel or it would crush him and leave him a gibbering wreck. Black armor bloomed around his body, and a visor encased the upper half of his face, bringing with it the sweet release of madness. Then world burned red and Naruto felt, rather than saw himself drop to a lone knee. His once weak body was suddenly sheathed in power, a great wordless strength he'd seldom known. This was his third such attempt to use an install. The first two had been with very willing participants, a certain bemused lancer and later, Nobunaga herself. Neither had resisted him. Each had been warm, welcoming, though perhaps a bit too much so in the case of Archer. This was the opposite. Every breath was a struggle. Their mere act of standing threatened to break him. Kill. A voice hissed in the back of his head. Kill. Kill. Kill 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 kill. Still the onslaught came, arcing high into the air overhead. Any moment now, it would come crashing down. Steam escaped gritted teeth. I'm sorry. He apologized, a thread of guilt weaving through his mind as the insane servant thrashed within his mind. I'll find a way to free you from this madness, if I can, but for now. Then he reached deep inside himself and throttled Lancelot. I need your power. With a wordless roar he beat back the berserker's madness and clambered upright to his feet. He felt larger, taller, more sure of himself than he'd ever been in his life. Yet the insanity still lingered, lurked in the back of his mind watching he knew it would ruin him ravage his mind if he allowed it even a moment what berserkers lacked in sanity they made up for in every other aspect berserkers were strong volatile creature of instinct and madness gone to their baser instincts like mad dogs they were seldom skilled enough to do anything other than destroy though there were several exceptions to such an ironclad rule lancelot was one such exception his instincts were so honed so taught so hammered into his body that not even being bound to the berserker class could dispel them. He was a peerless force in combat, a creature that moved with equal parts instinct and skill, the two abilities united in a heady union that made him a menace in any form of combat, ranged or otherwise. Learning from him forced or otherwise was the key to improving his admittedly laughable hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. He was the key to survival. Through a vision only slightly tainted by the crimson stain of madness, Naruto reached down and grasped new weapons from the ground, one to each hand. The first was a curved silver sword that sang when he gripped it by its hilt, the second a long bardichi of foreign make, its memory preserved by Archer here in his reality marble. Both were a grim parody of the originals all things considered, mere projections unable to stand the test of time. Fake. Much like him in a sense. Here he was. A weak boy with ill health using fake strength to wield fake weapons forged by a faker in a fake world against fake enemies. But it was a very good fake and so was he, and he took the world by storm. When the next volley reached him Naruto's new body seized the reins and spurred him into action with a wordless image. There was no coherent thought, no thought, no emotion, only action. Swaying backward, he avoided the first round of superheated plasma with the grace of a born dancer choosing to evade rather than actively block. By then the rest were upon him, swelling the world with black smoke and the rich scent of gunpowder and missiles alike. Buckshot skittered harmlessly across the haze of his black armor, weak shots weakened further by range, but he didn't slow for a moment. Instinct sent him into a tumbling spin as he narrowly dodged a whirling pair of blades no doubt flung by a hidden archer to which he hefted the curved sword from the ground and flung it back at their point of origin. A startled grunt greeted his ears, muffled through the helm, and he dared a smile. With one hand thus freed, he committed himself fully to the spear, 
weaving through rounds of shots interposed by the occasional ranged attack from the odd servant. Still he fought on. He caught one sword and flung it back into a cannonball, shattering it like so much glass. Sending its fragments careening into other rounds to knock them off course. In the same moment his hand snagged an axe from the ground and used it to deflect a surprisingly sharp shot that might blast it off his half-helm in a single round before bringing the bardici around to cleave through a particularly thick blade, though his weapon shattered in the doing. Another weapon scraped off his armored thigh and so Naruto, Lancelot simply reached out and seized it before it could blaze past. In no time at all he found himself with a greatsword in either hand, laughing like a madman as he raged across the endless battlefield. More. The world was a cackle, leaping from his lips. I said more, damn it, I'm not done yet. Sure enough, they complied. What he was sure of was thus. He'd improved. Whereas he'd once run from danger now he had the bravery and the skill to face it headlong. Without a card to bolster him his own skills were still sorely lacking compared to those of the servants trying to train him, but he wanted to believe he was making progress. Even now, with each volley he blocked or dodged or otherwise intercepted, he attributed those skills more to the class card that was currently blazing in his chest. It spoke to him reluctantly at first, then awkwardly, using images rather than words. And like any good student, Naruto listened, he learned. At the very least, he was a far cry from that naive, mewling boy he'd been in the beginning. Now he willed himself to memorize every movement, each twitch of his new muscles, and committed to memory, the better to use without his body being burgeoned by the power of a servant. Cu had imparted the beginnings of spearcraft upon him. Nobunaga delivered the importance of a crucial accuracy lesson, as well as the importance of ranged attacks. All good lessons in their own right, but this one exceeded each of them. Lancelot was pure, undiluted skill and instinct in their purest form. Lancelot begrudgingly showed him how to move. Lancelot taught him how to dodge. Berserker did not think about which way to move, or the best way to attack. That would be counterintuitive. For he, who had wielded all manner of weapons in his life, fighting was akin to breathing and with each passing moment he imparted some small measure of that skill onto Naruto. Now he could almost dodge or deflect them all, but the whiskered warrior did not let this swell his ego, nor did he allow pride to swallow him whole. He knew whom he owed this might to. His servants awed how he'd come to accept that term weren't merely the wind beneath his wings. They were also his anchor. They grounded him. Steadied him. Their voices well, most of them dissuaded him from making rash decisions and their bodies physically restrained him when words weren't enough. They were fine friends, good companions. Another barrage followed, and he cut through them like smoke. Dot and he treasured them more than life itself, cease. Just as swiftly as that last assault had begun, so too did it end in a single breath. Naruto spun, clutching the last of his swords, panting softly as he came back to himself. Though Lancelot's madness struggled and strained against its leash like a wild dog, it did not affect his thoughts over much. He remained firmly in control, right up to the very moment that he dispelled the card from himself. Fatigue caught up with him in an instant, and he found himself struggling to stand, to turn, to face the one responsible for this grand little game. Well done, well done indeed, Archer's regal voice decreed, you barely got hit, you pass. She all but skipped down the dunes towards him, dark hair trailing behind her like an ebony curtain. With every step the word of unlimited blade works began to ripple and vanish as Emiya no doubt deemed this test a success falling away like a forgotten memory. In no time at all the whirring cogs and endless landscape of weapons fell away, replaced with the drab darkness of the forest of death. With no blades to avoid, the demon archer practically launched herself forward. Others were coming forward to congratulate him, but here in this moment he only had eyes for the wild girl. You did well, Nobunaga sang happily sashaying up to him, as expected from my partner in crime. Thought I was your master? Naruto grumbled half-heartedly, arching a blonde brow. You're both, her grin was decidedly impish, and now for your reward. Naruto felt his back go tense, wait, what reward? Why, me, of course, before he could think to further ask what the mischievous archer was up to or just what she was plotting the blackhead surged forward and captured his mouth with hers on a pleased hum. Strong arms locked around him rooting him where he stood as those bright red eyes bored into his own. In a single smooth movement she plucked the cap from her head and planted it on his own. 
When he tried to speak, to sputter, to offer any sort of response at all, she simply kissed him again, rendering her partner breathless once more. UMU, she purred, nuzzling her head against his chest, ignoring a certain saber's squawk, I am most pleased indeed. With this, Naruto finally managed to suck in some semblance of a breath, enough to finally speak. Now wait just a second, he sputtered. Nobu, Ya can't just walk up and claim someone. Too late. I refuse your refusal, master, you have no say in the matter. A sigh. Considering they're my lips, I think I damn well should. Well. Dot you have none, I'll just deny all your denials, then. Oddly enough, that very kiss would lead to a war. A very odd war indeed, unlike any other. And not the sort one might think, the bombs went off right in Enko's face. At least, she assumed they were stink bombs. The foul odor and noxious clouds of green gas erupting from the black balls above the tree line were a worrisome hint on their own. As far as timing went, their attack was well carried out, nigh on impeccable at that. Her legs had only just launched her from one tree bough to another when the assault came. As such she was already in the air and wholly unable to try and change direction when the prank gods decided to rain down hell upon her poor head. Her own forest. Trapped against her, those bastards. And Inazuka would have been laid flat in moments, but to her credit, the Kunoichi had half a second to suck in a breath of fresh air before she barreled through the cloud. She'd been all of three leaps into the forest of death before triggering this trap. The first of many. Special Jonin may not be the elite of elite ninja, but they were certainly skilled in their given field. Enko excelled in all things poisonous. She had been both hand-picked and personally trained by none other than Orochimaru himself before he fled the village. A mere trick such as this was paltry for one such as her. Of course, that was before she saw something that caused her to inhale quite sharply. Trespasser. Rather than maintain her silence Anko caught herself coughing and hacking, narrowly ducking as a hulking grey giant a veritable man-made mountain of muscle and laughter clad in dull blue leather leapt up at her from the dark forest floor and came barreling through the tree she just vacated, sending it crashing to the earth. His accompanying roar and sword were anything but dull. And he was fast. Viciously, horribly fast. Faster than she could blink the great grey giant seized her ankle, catching her as she leapt away. She sank a kanai into his shoulder, but he didn't even flinch. Nor did she have time to properly prepare a jutsu now that her attack had failed. Her hands had only just snapped up in a seal when the giant gave a delighted cry and whipped her forward at impossible speed. She barely even had a chance to scream. Where did you even come from, you big brute? Laughter was his only answer. And then. Tree. Breath burst from the Jonin's lungs as her spine slammed against the unyielding bark of an ancient oak. Pain paralyzed her, but only for a heartbeat. Because the giant was coming after her again and full tilt, eyes wide as can be, a mad grin tearing at his face. Anko had nearly no time to react, much less plot out a proper plan. So she did the only thing she could think to do. She tripped the bastard. It shouldn't have worked and it nearly snapped her right leg but somehow she pulled it off. Momentum uncowed, Spartacus went slamming face forward into the ground at absurd speed, velocity unmatched, dragging him further into the forest out of sight. It was a breather, one Anko used to get the hell out of Dodge. Ha! She crowed, thumbing her nose at the rapidly receding plume of dust, serves you right. And went white as an accompanying explosive went off underfoot. Her first instinct was to use a replacement and leap away to safety. Oh, for crying out loud, which was in turn further complicated as she crashed headlong into a sign. Run. It read, a happy caricature of Naruto's visage sticking its tongue out at her. There she is. Nobunaga's mad cackle burst through the branches. All guns, open fear. A muscle jumped in Anko's jaw as fresh gunfire peppered her feet. There would be a reckoning for this. It was a good trap and a better plan, hit her hard, keep her on her heels and cook them for good measure. She found herself pushed to her physical limit and beyond just to evade them all. If Naruto used his troops well thus far then he was at least capable of some semblance of strategy. Half a year had clearly been good to him in that regard. Huh. This was new. Pride in someone else. Unfortunately it was overshadowed by all this unyielding rage. She was going to kill him. Screw the rules, and screw the Hokage. She was going to kill him, 
he'd booby trapped her forest. Worse, she had a feeling they were toying with her. That giant could have used his sword to skewer her, rather than toss her about. Those bombs could have been explosives for one, not the small one she'd stepped on, which hadn't been enough to do anything more than burn her sandals. Even the bullets peppering her feet were shoddily aimed, designed to herd rather than herd. Were they simply playing with her, testing her? If so, then to what purpose? Or were they simply hurting her? To where? To him. That didn't make a lick of sense, but Naruto was known for the unorthodox. Whatever they intended, his army melted minutes into the chase away as quickly as it come, leaving her goal well within sight. Only then did she finally glimpse him at long last. At a distance, bickering harshly with someone, the kid was wearing armor. Quality heavy plate, the kind you wouldn't expect to see on a shinobi. High quality at that. Where had he found that? It looked positively menacing. All black and vicious, veins of red shot through the edges. Even his face had taken on an unnatural pallor, those once blue eyes gleaming a poisonous shade of sour honey. He'd even taken up a sword since she'd seen him past, planting it now in the ground and using its bloodied hilt to steady himself as he started resolutely ahead. Someone who, most assuredly, didn't intend to lose their argument. Lancer. The word was a snarl. What the hell were you thinking? Why did you possess her? We don't do that. Simple. His fellow blonde replied with a toss of her head. Unlike Ishtar, I lacked a host for my summoning. She was suitable. That's besides the point. A finger jabbed her shoulder. Let Eno go. She has nothing to do with this. Eno. Beamed back at him. Or was it Eno? That was most assuredly Inoichi's daughter down there, but her eyes were red, red, redder than they should be, and her pale complexion had taken on a slight tan. Even her hair had turned a light shade of gold. And then there was the matter of her attire. Spirits. And she thought her fashion sense was skirting the edge. Anko didn't know what to make of that strange getup, much less her preening. She had no way of knowing she was looking at a literal goddess. Does this form not please you, my master? Humming, the divine blonde gave a small twirl, flaunting her new body in a way the Yamanaka never would. I'm rather surprised myself. She proved far more compatible than I'd expected. Our union was nearly seamless. To think, I nearly went for that pink banshee. Besides that, we made a contract. She happily accepted the terms, I assure you. That doesn't given you an excuse to wear her body like a glove, damn it. Are you not wearing saber like a glove? Ureshkigal retorted with an imperious sniff. Her altar form must suit you quite well. That's not the same and you know it, exasperated. The whiskered warrior jammed a hand against his chest with a harsh clang. See? She's allowing it. And so is Eno. Came the imperious sniff. Ours is a willing partnership. I'm simply. In the driver's seat at the moment. She'll have her turn soon enough, you'll see. I want to talk to her. Now. Not you. Oh, very well. Have it your way. Her eyes flickered, wavered. Scarlet slipped into azure. Now was her chance. Anko slipped down into the brush as the pair continued to bicker. She heard the Yamanaka's voice and stubbornly tuned it out as she crept closer. Inoichi might well want to hear about this, but he wasn't her concern at present. No, her focus lay decidedly elsewhere. She just had to get close, close enough to be see, to not be wholly and utterly obliterated by an overprotective servant. One step. Three. Five. She used all her tricks and all her guile to conceal both her presence and scent as she'd been taught. Now if she could just. She made it all of two more toward him before they noticed. Darling, Baresha's gentle voice hummed, it seems we have company. Not a heartbeat later, a bare blade found Midorashi's throat and pricked her jugular. Freeze. Do not move. A soft, monotone voice hissed in her ear. One word and you die. Now, now. There's no need for that, Kato Danzo. A familiar pair of painfully bright blue eyes flashed out at her as Naruto stormed over. He'd banished that ghastly armor from before thank heavens and it was the face of a young man that gazed back at her, not that of a tyrant. We're all friends here, aren't we? He raised a hand and the assassin reluctantly withdrew her weapon. Naruto cast Anko a decidedly pointed look, did you want something, miss? The kunoichi rose with slow, measured movements, keenly aware of the eyes on her. Didn't quite stop her from snarking at him, though, isn't that a bit rude, 
Brat? S not like I came here to kill you. Is it? The young man tilted his head akin to a curious fox. You came into MY Forest, my home, and set off nearly a third of my traps getting here. Now, I put a lot of work into those traps. Quite a bit. Those gentle azure orbs narrowed. I believe that makes you the invader here. Brat. She shot back. This was my training ground until you lot took over. And I'll give it back when I'm done. Came the mild reassurance. Which returns us back to my previous question. Why? Are. You. Here. Such was her anger that Anko didn't think straight. Rather than hand the item to him as had been requested commanded, rather, by the Hokage himself she instead ripped it from her pouch and threw said parcel at near breakneck speed. Indeed, she flung it headlong in the startled youngster's face. It was a very good throw she thought, sharp and vicious and sure to smack him right in the gob. It didn't even make it halfway. I salute your efforts, but that was. Unwise. Something caught it the instant it flew from her grasp. No, the Kunoichi realized as she shadows shifted, someone. Born of deathly shadow with a white skull mask to match, the lanky servant favored her with a bemused sigh. They were the things that had kicked Leaf Shinobi out of the forest her forest, and this one looked ready to pounce. What the hell was he? And what was that arm? Just the sight of it sent a strange pang through her chest and he hadn't even unsealed the damn thing. For you, contractor, it said, without missing a beat, the creature turned and presented it to Naruto. Thank you, cursed arm. The blonde hummed, retrieving the headband, but I don't think she was trying to kill me. Shall we kill her to be certain, my lord? Damn it, she couldn't even tell if he was joking or not. Assassin sounded almost. Bemused. Eager, even. No, much to her shameful chagrin, it was Naruto shook his head and laid a hand on the servant's malformed shoulder. I think not. Let's hear what she has to say first. Little did she know that said blonde was forcibly restraining himself now. Doing his best not to double over and cackle outright at the absurdity of it all. There wasn't even anything menacing about his intentions. He just found the whole situation funny. For one who had next to nothing before, to now have allies willing to fight and protect him, train him and teach him, and kill for him. Well, it paid to reflect how far he'd come. And in only six months at that, Thank the stars he was a good person at heart. Despite the act, he had no intention of hurting Anko. Why, someone else might have gone mad with all this power at their fingertips. Still, he wasn't above making her squirm. Just a little, for shits and giggles of course. Forgive them, he hummed, adopting the manner of someone he knew all too well, they're very protective of me these days. Then he seemed to remember the gift she'd given him. And whatever would I do with this? He didn't even glance at the headband as he turned its black cloth over in his hands. By the old man's own account, I never graduated. Unless he issued a proclamation, this is useless to me. That tore it. She was taking control of this conversation now. He did. Gritting her teeth until she felt a molar crack, the Kunoichi willed herself to be still. He also put me in charge of you. Ha! Huh. The servant wearing Eno's face scoffed aloud, as if you could control him. And you have a mission. Anko bowled on, effective immediately. It was precisely the worst thing to say. His brittle mask of civility slipped. Do I? The words were sibilant hiss as Naruto reared back. I was under the impression that he wanted nothing to do with me. A glimmer of pain blazed through his face, gone before she could hope to do anything about it. Just how badly had the old man buggered this up? Who else had tried to kill the kid? She knew on some level that he'd made a mistake. But Naruto's vicious turn of face seemed to suggest more had occurred than the old geezer was willing to admit, much more. He's your Hokage, kid. It was all she could think to throw at him, this vain attempt to calm him down. He just wants what's best for you. If you don't listen, he'll what? Throw me in a cell? Something flashed in his eyes. Oh, I quiver with fear. His demeanor changed then, warmth turning to icy, killer intent threading through the air. Anko couldn't help but shudder at the sight. It was a far cry from true wrath or the legendary air of command someone like Jiraiya or Hiruzen could emanate, but it felt cold, like bitter dread sinking clawed fingers into her spine. It almost reminded her of him. Orochimaru. Now there was a chilling thought. Should they ever push him too far, or worse, should Naruto ever take it into his spiky head to simply leave, the village might not be able to stop him. 
When he waved for her to follow, she couldn't help but obey. But rather than walk far, the young man simply plopped himself down on an upturned log and patted the space beside him. Come on, sit. He chirruped. Let's talk. Reluctantly, she did as he bade. I am sorry about your forest, for whatever it's worth. The young summoner soothed her fears. I meant what I said. You can have it back when I'm done. I have no intention of spending the rest of my life in this place. I can assure you of that. Anko forcefully quelled her impulse to snarl, and when will that be? Soon. Came the immediate riposte. You have my word. Don't distract me. You're still leaving this forest. His eyes turned cold again. Ah, yes. Where does the old man want to send me? Those nine words ironic were colder than the blackest pit. Some suicide mission? Still, she had no reason to lie to him, to the land of waves. Abruptly something in his face softened, an ember of compassion breaking through this icy facade. Or was it a facade at all? Perhaps she'd glimpsed his true face in that moment, seen just how truly tired he was of trying to play the part, of pretending at all. Perhaps it was a trick. Regardless, he took the headband. After a moment's consideration, he bound it around the right bicep rather than his forehead. It felt like a slap in the face despite his earlier words, as though he'd deliberately. Aha. I see. I'm being sent to clean up someone's mess. Naruto scoffed. Is that all I am to you people? A weapon? A cleaner? Or do you not trust me with anything? Anko choked. Wait, how did you Naruto gave a stray shrug? What can I say? Clairvoyance is a heady thing. Jean told me you were coming hours ago. When she didn't respond, his shoulders rolled again in another easy sway. Nobunaga did her job perfectly. She herded you right toward us. Had you actually been trying to kill me, the Hassan would have taken you down, be it cursed arm or hundred faces. Jean, Anko sputtered. Nobunaga, who the hell? When the Kunoichi tried to turn her head, to glimpse someone among the shadows, she almost wished she hadn't. She could clearly see Hassan and Ereshkigal from her vantage point on the log, but little else. She thought glimpses of something lurking in the deeper shadows of the trees, but surely that was her imagination. He couldn't field that many warriors at once, it just wasn't possible. UMU, a new voice chirruped happily, causing the trench coat clad woman to startle as someone simply appeared between them with a delighted cackle. Well done? As expected of my general, you did well, very well, indeed. Naruto didn't so much as bat an eyelash as the newcomer the very same girl who had been trying to blast her into oblivion only minutes before planted herself in his lap with a happy hum. He only offered a resigned sigh as she planted her cap atop his spiky head and began patting hers with the air of one who'd simply grown used to such things. For her part, the stranger only snuggled closer still, laying her chin against his shoulder as a happy newel might unto their beloved spouse. Ah, she trilled. I missed this. You were only gone for an hour, Nobunaga. Too long. Came in the instant retort. It's not fun shooting at something if I'm not allowed to kill it. Now allowed to. That thought died a violent death as yet another servant manifested thankfully well out of arms reach nearly on top of Naruto. Anko half expected an outburst of violence. Instead this woman clad in deep, vibrant red and holy hell she could almost see through the front of that dress only folded both arms before her bosom and glared at the duo imperiously. Rather fitting, given her identity. No, be you, na, ga, those bright, poisonous green emerald eyes as she growled softly at her rival. Cease using that word at once. Tis mine. How many times do I have to tell you? It's not my fault you're useless outside of combat. The blackette stuck out her tongue in impish defiance. Besides, I called dibs on his lap first. Nigh. Saber's pale face turned an alarming shade of scarlet. Why you little? Now, now, Naruto prevaricated with a raised hand before they could come to blows atop him. I'm sure she didn't mean to use that word that again, Nero. No. A golden boot stamped in defiance, creating a small crater underfoot. I am most certain that she did. She's always doing this. Preter. Tis not fair. Oh, God. Was she actually whining? Stealing you away whenever one of us isn't looking, slipping into your cot at night, she was. I demand retribution, or headpats, at the very least. Anko visibly picked her jaw up off the floor. Then she'll apologize. When Archer protested, Naruto planted a hand on her ribs in mild warning, won't you? 
Ha! Huh? If anything, Nobunaga coiled around him even more, an angry dragon hoarding her prize. What? Why'd I have to apologize for claiming what's rightfully meany? Her words dissolved into hysteric giggles as those taut fingers began to dance along the length of her stomach with feathery grace. All right, all right, she cried out, thrashing against him, I give, cease. From her perch, Anko could have sworn Saber grinned. Nobunaga saw it. This means war, I'll get you for this, just wait until Okita. Kid, the Kunoichi began slowly, carefully interrupting their little power play with great care. Just how many of those things can you field at once? Thing? How rude. Nobunaga puffed out her cheeks in childish defiance of her words, as if I were some common grunt. Indeed. Nero sniffed in agreement. It's almost offensive. How uncouth of you, beautiful though you are. Neither of the duo had answered her question. Rather, their general merely adopted a shark like smile. You really have no idea, do you? Without so much as a passing glance, Naruto scooted Archer off his lap though the latter only relented with a petulant pout of a protest before rising and elbowed past Anko. Said Kunoichi watched with mild concern as he paced past his guardians, stood in the middle of the clearing, and spread his arms wide. There was a moment of ponderous silence as she wondered what he was trying to do, she soon had her answer. All right, folks, he called out, voice ringing against the trees. Let's go be big goddamn heroes, are you with me? Half the forest immediately answered him with a mighty roar. Anko felt herself blanch like never before. What have I unleashed? How little she knew. Dawn came with frightful speed. Scarce had the sun peeked its head over the foggy horizon, than a corrupted lance proceeded to prod Naruto in the ribs with ruthless dispatch. Felt even through the thick blankets of his bed, its honed edge threatened to tug him from his peaceful slumber even as he struggled to cling to the realm of his dreams. Most would have woken then and there. Indeed, anyone in their right mind would have reacted poorly to a tainted weapon actively trying to stab them in the side. Even a madman knew better than to ignore a servant. Naruto barely even grunted as he rolled over. Go away. M, sleeping here. Ryder stifled a smile. Lancer. Dot did not, ho. Strange, how a single sound could convey such menace. Pale golden orbs regarded their master's form with cold disdain and all the wrath of a storm. If she hadn't known better, Medusa might have thought Artoria was on the verge of unsealing her spear to strike him down on the spot. Instead the navy-clad lancer only clicked her tongue in mild distaste and jabbed him again, perhaps this time with a tad more force than strictly necessary of her. And if her right eye had begun to twitch, well, surely that wasn't worth imagining. Oh, of course it was. You've got some nerve sleeping in today of all days, brat. The altar's voice carried well within the small enclosure that they directed overnight. Wake up. Now, this is your last chance. A lone middle finger rose in a sleepy salute. Lancer absolutely hissed. Why you? Try as she might to ignore this, a small, silent part of Medusa still relished every second of Artoria's discomfort. And if her other selves were in agreement on the matter, she certainly didn't need to give voice to them now. Did she? Should her Avenger or Lancer counterparts have their way, the situation might be downright. Volatile. No, best just to watch for now. Naruto didn't even deign to grunt. On a certain level Ryder was almost proud of her master for not waking up to that. After so many months of suffering through a training regiment that would make most quiver with fear, pain held little incentive for Naruto Uzumaki these days. Nay. He barely even felt Lancer's blackened Rangamaniad in its sealed state of these days. Subconscious chakra reinforcement had become near second nature for him by now, she wouldn't expect any less of him. If something like this was able to harm him, she'd be disappointed. Therein lie the problem. For all intensive purposes, Naruto was currently dead to the world. She'd enlisted Artoria in a misguided attempt to rouse their contractor from his slumber. That was then, this was now. In his current state, nothing short of an explosion or a noble phantasm was going to rouse him at this rate. In all honesty, Medusa almost found his recalcitrance to rise entertaining. Still, judging by the vein pulsing in her forehead, his refusal to rise had stirred an ember of irritation in Lancer's heart. That one had a short fuse to begin, but the reason for her anger wasn't wholly her fault at that. Wake me at dawn. That had been their master's request before he'd tumbled into bed. 
I don't want to be late for whatever Anko has planned. What indeed? Despite their initial show of acceptance, back in the forest of death many of them remained leery about the idea of throwing themselves behind the village at all. Some of the more aggressive servants had threatened to mutiny outright over such decision, it was only their master's stringent reassurance that he felt no loyalty to the leaf whatsoever and the ever-present vigilance of some of his more powerful allies that prevented a spat from breaking out among them. Some assumed Naruto would take this chance to rabbit, as the term went, and run off. Medusa held her own opinions on that, who could say? Still, dawn had most assuredly come and still he refused to rise. After he'd told her to wake him, too. Naruto was wholly of a different mind, and thus, ignorant of his peril. He hadn't been blessed with the warmth of an actual bed in months. For weeks upon endless weeks his bed had consisted of the mossy forest floor and cold hard rocks digging into his back, brief naps broken by constant ambushes and attacks, constant sleep deprivation as his skills were pushed to their limits and beyond. Compared to that torture, this was a blessing he wasn't willing to relinquish under any circumstances. Unfortunately, he made one fatal mistake. Still, if there was one trait the young man held true to, even now. Perhaps I might try, yes? With a shower of pale blue dust, a familiar figure formed not a pace behind the unlikely pair. Despite her best efforts to retain her stoic demeanor, Medusa still felt an icy chill shot down her spine. For once, she was grateful she'd kept her eyes hidden this morning. Had they been visible, everyone would have witnessed them widen with a touch of anger just now. Deep within her fractured psyche her smaller self started swearing. Spitting curses that would make even the gods themselves turn green. Oh yes, her lancer incarnation remembered that smooth, sultry voice all too well. She'd been batted about one too many times to forget that horror. Against her better judgment, she turned to face the new arrival. In the same instant, Artoria lowered her lance and granted the newcomer a nod. I'll leave him in your capable hands, then. My measures would be a mercy compared to yours. Delighted laughter greeted her just as the youngest Gorgon sister completed her revolution. Leave it to me. Beaming back at her despite their bad blood, her fellow rider offered Medusa a cheery wave as she sauntered past the two of them. Now, then, the words emerged as a silken purr as she began to prod him with her heel, my adorable little master, time to wake up, rise and shine. Barely roused by her voice, Naruto merely harumped and rolled over, tucking the covers in with him. Still his tormentor persisted in their attempts to wake him, once, twice, thrice. Upon this third and final jab his warden finally expressed their displeasure with an irritated growl. This was the sole warning the Jinchuriki received before the grinning goddess abandoned her surprisingly gentle attempts to rouse him. That should have been telling enough. Even then Medusa didn't truly realize what she intended until it was much too late. Performing a quick backflip that nearly left her golden hair skimming a low-hanging branch, the new arrival landed three paces away, gathered her legs beneath her. Medusa paled as she beheld her fellow rider's smile. Quetzalcoatl's grin proved deceptively mild. No surely not, she wouldn't. Oh, Naruto grunted in surprise as much as shock as a sandal-clad foot came crashing down into his lower abdomen with all the might of a meteor. Breath burst from his lungs in an explosive spray. It wasn't the full force of her strength that struck him. Had the rider bothered to fully exert herself, he would have likely perished on the spot. As things stood the weakened attack still ripped him from the bed, jolted him awake with a snort, and sent him tumbling to the floor in a tangle of limbs. Time had taught him what would happen if he failed to heed that warning. The next attack wouldn't be leashed for anything. Nor was she finished with him, at that. The poor boy's eyes snapped open to find a pair of peerless green orbs gleaming down at him. Quetzalcoatl. He had all of an instant to squawk. What the hell was that for? No, 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 you're not nearly awake enough yet. Allow me to remedy that. A heartbeat later she collided with him in a full on body slam. The poor boy's yelp resounded through the forest. Naruto's favored Ayame with a small smirk. Plenty of room for seconds. Sure enough, she granted him a sly wink of her own. There we go. That's what I like to hear. Order up. Well, if you ask me, see you snickered raucously across the room. I'm thinking the kid here wants to eat something else. Naruto felt the tips of his ears burn red. Not a heartbeat later, he snatched up Abby's empty bowl and lobbed it at the blue lancer. 
only for the latter to sway out of the way without missing a beat. The shit-eating grin he received for his efforts reminded him of a bemused wolf. Protection from arrows, kid, he crowed. You'll have to do better than that. The daughter of Ichiraku stood as a credit to masterful waitresses everywhere. Truly, she did. Not only did she resist the urge to laugh at his plight, but in the midst of tossing him a fresh bowl of ramen she simultaneously whisked a trio of sake bottles down the counter to the right while launching another duo dish of pork udon down towards the left. Each were caught by an eager pair of hands and met with a raucous cheer. Naruto couldn't help but whistle at the display. She wasn't just serving him, she was serving three separate servants in swift succession as if they were old friends. She hadn't even met any of them until this very moment. You never would have known it by the way Fergus and C.U. were carrying on back there with Drake. Apparently, he wasn't the only one happy to be back in civilization again. Seconds. You just had thirds, for crying out loud. Don't break anything. Naruto laughed over the din, but didn't argue the point as a fresh quartet of sealed bottles sailed over his head to meet the three servants. Fergus merely uncorked his and said something that sent an already tipsy Drake into a fresh fit of cackling all over again. Naruto fought down a wince. Theoretically, it stood to reason that servants couldn't get drunk. The scene playing out before him said otherwise. A rational voice in the back head insisted that this was excessive. Common sense dictated he try to enforce some semblance of order before someone picked a fight with a villager or worse. Dot ba. Common sense could go shag a stump for all he cared. Let them have their fun. Clad in the signature scarlet mantle of Nobunaga's red mantle and black jacket, he looked on with a bemused eye at their antics. Reclining against his seat, the whiskered warrior took another bite and a moment to do just that. Savor the moment and all it entailed. Everyone deserved the chance to cut loose now and again especially if said someone happened to be a servant. He would have gladly let them all out if he could. Even now five was the most he could feel at any given time. And these five had more than earned their shore leave in his eyes. Now that he'd gotten a proper start to his day, he decided damn Enko could stand to squirm a bit more down at the gate. There wasn't anything wrong with a little shore leave once in a while. They'd all earned it. So had he. Suddenly, the startling clink of chopsticks against an empty bowl informed the young warrior that he'd mangled his meal during his mental musings. Well, shit. Those words burst out of him on a laugh. Guess I was hungrier than I thought. With a raise of his hand, Ayame sashayed to his side. Had enough? The girl inquired pleasantly, I'm afraid so. Much to Naruto's chagrin, his stomach still offered a faintest protest. A far cry when compared to the rampaging snarls it had given an hour before, but a protest nonetheless. After living off of bad rations and homegrown food for so long, his body desperately wanted to savor something new. For a moment he considered a third helping, but this time reason won the day and he deferred to his own better judgment. Flushing, he waved away her suggestion. A bit of indulgence was all well and good, but he didn't want to become a glutton. Ramen was a rare treat to be savored, not overindulge. Unfortunately, Ayame mistook his silence as a cue to keep talking. Where did you find this lot, anyway? Her gaze slid to the boisterous pair of Irishmen bickering only a few feet away as a bemused Drake raised her full mug in snarky salute. They're strange. Never mind the guys over there, that woman overpaid me in gold coins. Gold coins. She drawled the last word in a rare laugh. She even told me to keep the change. Who does that? Wait. Naruto risked a glance over his shoulder. Sure enough, Ryder flashed him a merry thumbs up. No way in hell was he going to rise to that bait. What can I say? They're from out of town. The brunette arched an eyebrow. Out of town, that's your answer? This time he couldn't quite keep the smile from his face. Yup. Whatever you say, flyboy. Taking advantage of the rare respite, the brunette laid her tray aside and slid into the vacant seat on his right flank. The faint scent of perfume teased him in her wake. Naruto didn't bat an eyelash. He wasn't aware of her true intentions until her palm slid over his gloved fingers and made no measure to move away from them. Funny how such a small gesture could turn his tongue to lead in his mouth. Huh. Was her always that small? He remembered it being larger, once upon a time. Had he really changed that much in such a short time? You've really changed these last few months, haven't you? 
her full lips pursed in a petulant pout as she squeezed his hand and gazed up at him intently, heedless of his dumbfounded expression. I used to be taller than you. It's not fair. When did you get so far ahead of me? E.H. The whiskered warrior managed eloquently. Medi be absolutely hooted inside his psyche. Hot damn, she's forward. Quiet, you. He hissed, ruthlessly shoving the queen's laughter into a dark corner. Now to be fair, Naruto wasn't all that knowledgeable when it came to the fairer sex. Why would he be? Most of the time they utterly confounded him. Much of this experience had come from the vicious training regimen Samiramus and the others forced him through. Nobunaga had been the first to express any sort of interest in him. In the beginning, he'd been dense as a brick, while time and endless training had stripped much of that naivete away. Even now he was still learning as he went along, stumbling his way down the path of life. He was well aware of the changes wrought upon his body of course, he already stood a head taller than most teenagers his age and that was long before he'd undergone training. Well, I've been busy. He tried to deflect her attention elsewhere, to no avail. A lot's happened, you know? Fergus and C.U. were openly snickering at his embarrassment now, much to his dismay. Which only made this all the more baffling that an old friend more an acquaintance really was openly talking to him in such a manner. He couldn't claim to really know Ayame on a personal level either. They'd only ever met a handful of times before today at that. What the devil was she up to? Ayame favored him a coy look. I've noticed. Nobunaga proved, curiously quiet. That less than subtle turn of phrase just now almost made him wonder why the demon king hadn't reared her head as of yet or bitten Ayame's off. And her silence troubled him. If he hadn't piped up, it meant she herself was likely up to no good again but something told him that if this train of conversation continued to roll down the tracks, it would soon be derailed by Archer herself. Violently. If he didn't know better, he might have thought this Ayame an imposter. No, much to his dismay, he realized this was no illusion. He'd learned to see through disguises long ago, and this, to his chagrin, was not one of them. Maybe we could talk about it when you get back from this mission of yours. Ayame hummed, recapturing his attention for herself. Over. Dinner? Naruto's brow shot straight to his hairline, words failing him once more. His mouth moved of its own accord. Wait, with me? Seriously? Bonk. With a gentle tap, the ridge of her knuckles brushed once against his forehead. Do you see anyone else here? His jaw clicked open nearly of its own volition before he stubbornly forced it closed. He was. Flattered surprised but flattered and so once again his tongue betrayed him i don't see why not great her lips brushed his cheek it's a date then nobunaga absolutely hissed little minx ah there she was apparently that brief moment of confusion was more than enough for yame before he could think to stop her the rosy-cheeked brunette slid off the stool snatched up her tray in a single deft movement and scampered into the kitchen out of sight was that a squeal he'd heard just now? No surely not. He must be imagining it. Ayame didn't do girly things. Right? Oh ho. Ryder still cooed in the back of his brain like a giddy schoolgirl. Look at her go. This one's bold. I like her. Maybe we could. Putting a pin in this. Now. This is why I don't let you out to play. Blah. Meanie. Came the sulking retort. You let Fergus out. Because he isn't trying to bone everybody he sees. What's wrong with a little skinship, hey? Medibi didn't even deign to deny it. Though she tried to raise her voice again, he ruthlessly tuned her out. Gods, it felt strange being back in civilization. After so many months spent in the forest of death, it felt almost quaint to socialize with civilians again. He'd grown so used to training with heroes and legends, pirates and warriors thieves and mages that common folk seemed almost ordinary by comparison. Naruto knew he had nothing to fear from an angry wife or some drunken husband. These days, civilians were about as dangerous to him these as a wet kitten, utterly incapable of physically hurting him. Shinobi were another matter of course. They were skilled, trained, dangerous and unpredictable creatures all, never to be underestimated perhaps even feared but not respected, no never respected. Not anymore. Unlikely as it might seem, the third's actions however well meaning they might have been had put him off the path of Hokage forever. It also brought up a troubling question. Why am I still here? 
why was he playing at being a ninja when he had no desire to be one? In the short term the answer was easy enough, but in the long term it proved problematic. He needed to wriggle out from under Gilgamesh's watchful eye but what then? What would happen if he somehow defeated the king of heroes? What did he want? To live? To prosper? How? When? Why? Living in the moment was all well and good, but where would that take him? Did he want to fight at all? Anko all but tossing him a headband had come as something of a surprise. He still hated wearing the damn thing, but what did he want? In the past few days, Naruto had begun to heavily consider his options. Assessing both the pros and cons of an eventual escape attempt while weighing the consequences of either. Given his current skill set knew he would succeed. That wasn't in question. Even without a servant's help, he could simply smash right through the gate if he so wished. No, leaving wasn't the problem. It was what came after that troubled him. As ever, the notion of defecting from the leaf proved a powerful lure, while the reasons to stay seemed to dwindle by the day. This mission might be the excuse he needed to escape. Or it could be a trap, he wasn't sure. Nah, Ru, too, thankfully, that line of thought soon imploded as a familiar spiked hand closed around his right shoulder. He needn't look back to know a familiar pair of golden eyes were glaring at him. I'm dead, aren't I? He croaked out, depends on your definition. And his world spun. To their credit, his attackers certainly knew what they were doing. Even with his defenses up, they proved more than a match for him in terms of sheer speed. Had they meant to harm him, he would have surely perished on the spot, instead, they threw him with just enough force to send his body tumbling out into the street and through a cabbage stall, before he finally collapsed in a wild plume of dust. He'd only just climbed back to his feet when another hand locked down around his shoulder and viciously hauled him back to his feet. Another pair righted his upturned jacket even as a third briskly bat at the dust in his hair. We've wasted enough time here, boy. The brisk voice of a familiar assassin was his sole warning as his vision cleared. Get up. But I haven't been outside in months, Naruto groaned. Let me savor my freedom a bit more, damn it. Come now, don't be like that, it's been long enough, yes. Quetzalcoatl's firm palm on Naruto's right shoulder was an iron vice that prevented the young man from bolting in that direction. When he tried to wriggle to the left, he found that Samiramis had inexplicably appeared and laid claim to that limb as well. Her smile would have made devils cry, and had the added effect of scaring off nearby passerby. Even the king of heroes himself would have hesitated for the merest moments before going up against that scornful smirk. We wouldn't want you to be late now, would we? Semi purred venomously. Haste makes waste, after all, Ketz chirruped in agreement. Master and servant alike exchanged a dull sigh. Wrong saying, girl. Really? The green eyed warrior considered her words for a moment before shrugging. Semantics. Samiramis arched an eyebrow. Rider, it appears our master is tired. Carry him, will you? Naruto felt the color drain from his face as his fellow blonde rounded on him. Rider? No. Wait. He swore. Wait, 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 waa arg? Up we go. Naruto realized too late what she intended. Even as he renewed, the goddess ripped him from Assassin's grasp and proceeded to sling him over her shoulder like a sack of wheat as she marched the rest of the way with a jaunty whistle. All of his skill and strength meant not to one such as her. He may as well have been a helpless child for all it mattered to her. Moreover, this was humiliating. He didn't want to be seen like this. Kicking out against her did next to nothing. Nay, it only made the goddess giggle. Kets. Put me down, he squawked, right now, don't make me use a command spell. Oh, dear, she sand back, I can't seem to hear you, be a good boy and stay put. Spartacus, help I'm being oppressed, he wailed as she carried him off. I do not consider this oppression. Unsurprisingly, the berserker did not heed his call. Apparently he had some sense of self-preservation after all, who knew? Well, at least no one he knew had seen him. No, surely not. He would have noticed, right? Point zero o octal zero. Kakashi blinked once, twice, three times. What the hell did I just witness? On a certain level, the Jonin knew wasn't under a genjutsu. After all, he'd surely notice if his chakra had been disrupted. Even so, he formed the seals solely out of reflex and murmured the word "release," regardless of the fact. 
when the receding image before him didn't waver in the least, he was left to question his own sanity in turn. Hence the blinking. He clearly seen Naruto just now changes or no, it was impossible to miss that hair thrown out of Ichiraku before being hauled off by a pair of decidedly deadly looking women who literally appeared from nowhere. Of course he'd seen it. Considering it took place only a few feet away from him. So the rumors were true after all. For a second he almost followed the three of them. A thorn of hesitation pricked his heart and held him back at the last. In the end, he decided against doing the deed for some incomprehensible reason. Perhaps it was laziness on his part. Maybe it was guilt. It might have been fear. That blackhead had clearly noticed him if the withering stare leveled in his direction was anything to go by. And so he watched. Waited, as the unlikely trio faded into the distance. Something told him any attempt to converse with them today would be received. Poorly. Of course, he could try to confront them. All for a boy who didn't even know him. He could try to demand answers from this third party, ask who they were, where they'd come from. Dot and risk alienating himself further still toward the young man. The thought caused him to clench his fists helplessly at his side. Damn it. Still, he wanted to try, someday, but someday would not be today. After a long, ponderous moment, the infamous ninja sighed. It is entirely too early, and I am not nearly sober enough to deal with this shit. Now that's what I like to hear. A woman's voice crowed behind him. Come on in, then, let's see how well you do. To Kakashi's credit, he tried to escape, he truly did. Alas, in this instance, he just wasn't quick enough. The bitter shackles of regret and confusion slowed him by a hair. That was all it took for Drake's arm to loop around his shoulders and haul him into Ichiraku. In short order the poor ninja found himself manhandled, wrestled to a table, and forced into a seat not that he particularly tried to resist which in turn brought with it a new host of problems. Unfortunately for him, failed to comprehend said problems until Hugh saw them. All three of them. So, you were staring at our master back there, weren't you? Much to his chagrin, the woman from before still had him by the shoulders, but that soon proved the least of his worries. She wasn't alone. A pair of decidedly rough-looking men awaited him at the other end of the table, one clad in azure and silver, the other bare-chested. Neither looked particularly pleased to see him. Only then did he realize he'd been had. The arm around his shoulders suddenly felt like a noose, drawing him to a most untimely demise. Now, then, a fresh glass slid into his hand. Siyu's smile proved positively predatory. Why don't the four of us have a little chat, E.H., ninja boy? Point zero o octal zero. What? When at last the giggling goddess reverted to spirit form and deigned to release Naruto his pride more than a little bruised the whiskered warrior found an even more daunting task awaiting him. What do you mean you're staying here? Regretfully, I will not be accompanying you on your journey. His temper was only mildly soothed by Assassin's reply as she picked a stray strand of debris from his hair. At this stage, the construction of the hanging gardens will require my undivided attention for the next week, if not more. Before the young man could think to ask if she'd found a workaround for her noble phantasm, the poisoner bowled onward. You still have the vials and bombs I gave you, yes? Yes, mom. Naruto sang back sarcastically, patting the pouch at his side. All five of them stowed and secured like you told me the tips of her ears turned pink good these were difficult to make you'd best not waste them frivolously eh why would i waste them naruto tilted his head anything you give me is precious you know that was it his imagination or did assassin stagger just now was she not feeling well why hold her face they dithered a moment more in uncomfortable silence before the ancient poisoner sputtered Bah, enough of this prattle, I've chosen your escorts. His eyes narrowed in quiet relief as she pushed past this initial bout of awkwardness. I trust you'll find them suitable. A simple mental message between the two of them proved all the information he needed, though it drew a frown all the same. He knew most of his servants by now, those who allied with him, those that loathed him, and a scarce few who would gladly stab him in the back, given half a chance. Yet there were a handful he hadn't yet met, and Samiramus had just named one of them. Well, come on out then, he drawled, I'd like to meet you. An unfamiliar face manifested a heartbeat later and immediately prostrated herself before them. If, if I'm not too much of a hindrance, 
The young rider thrust her head towards the floor in a doggy's opposition. Master, please allow this unworthy one to accompany you on your mission. Yushiwakamaru, is it? His mouth twitched into a small smile. Drop the formalities, would you? Her head bowed further still. I could never so improper. Fine. Naruto pursed his lips. Well, consider that an order, then. I don't need soldiers, I need friends. If that is the case, the black head twitched minutely, but otherwise held fast. What would you ask of me, then? Be yourself. It must have been hard, huh? He patted her head without thinking, smoothing down her dark hair with a rare smile that actually felt genuine, rather than forced. That was probably weighing you down. You're more than welcome to come with me, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Ushi felt her world shatter. With that lone stroke, a single solitary command, the dauntless rider found that the mirror of her life and her views alongside it had been irrevocably broken, dashed upon the floor like a frail teacup, leaving her to pick up the fractured pieces. Altered on a fundamental level, so too did she find herself forced to reevaluate her opinions and priorities. She simply didn't know how to cope, to have all her expectations met and more, in the span of a single instant. And so she expressed herself the only way she knew how. She absolutely tackled him. Thank you, my lord, oh, but you look pale, I shall await your command. Almost in the same breath she sprang back to her feet, red-faced and vanished, citing her concern for his health. Ushi's all well and good, but I don't need this many babysitters. The Jinchuriki laughed. What could possibly go wrong? His ill attempt at humor earned him a prompt swat him on the head. Fool, as if we would leave you unprotected, you need loyal guards like her. And of course, I'm one of them, as if waiting for that very moment, Nobunaga appeared beside in a shower of luminescent dust. Kept you waiting, huh? Naruto's taut hand descended mercilessly upon Nobu's hat to strike her head beneath with all the force of a typhoon. Hey, she cried out, clutching the rising welt against her skull. What was that for? Your bad joke, still, restraining a small smile, he dared to address the elephant in the room. Nobunaga. Yes, she beamed. Don't ask, Samiramis growled. Heedless of the poisoner's command, he pressed on. Is there any particular reason why you're wearing a swimsuit? Oh ho, her smile would rival Abby's for pure sunshine even as Assassin groaned. You finally noticed. Well, we're headed to Wave, aren't we? The blackhead tilted her head in an innocent gesture that couldn't possibly be genuine. Wave, means water. Much to his bemusement, she cackled and thrust a triumphant finger into the air, sending her jack fluttering wildly about her shoulders. So of course I'm going to wear my swimsuit. Black is the best color of course, second only to red, naturally, I chose both. Don't I look better than that ramen girl? Yes, yes, and what the devil is that contraption on your shoulder? Was it meant to be a club of some sort? Or an axe? He couldn't be sure. He he he. The brash berserker thumbed her nose at him. That'd be telling, looks cool, huh? Well, yeah, but what the hell does it do? Naruto asked. It almost looks like it's alive. It's isn't, right? Children, the both of you, Samiramis exhaled harshly as she returned to spirit form herself. Enough, I'm leaving, try not to die. As if I'd let him, Nobunaga preened like a proud peacock and thrust out her chest with a cackle. Rest assured, he's in capable hands. Speaking of hands. With those words, the demonic archer didn't miss a beat. Scarce had Samiramis finished fading than she surged forward with a grin to seize her master by the chin. For his part, Naruto didn't resist in the face of her blazing gaze. He merely raised his arms in mute defense, palms splayed outward in silent submission. For a moment, just a moment, she looked truly angry. Fury infernal. Wrath incarnate. Even her glossy dark hair appeared to flicker a vicious shade of crimson, her very body warming as though it were wreathed in flames. Then her mouth crushed itself against his, their teeth briefly colliding with a harsh click before she bit his lip. The faint acrid tang of blood flooded Naruto's mouth and he turned aside with a grunt. Hey, what the hell? Silence. Unfortunately, being Nobunaga, she almost immediately leapt to the wrong conclusion and rammed him against the nearest wall she could find. I am a tolerant and magnanimous woman, Naruto. Though the archer's words were soft, they burned hotter than lava itself, harsh and furious, her grip threatening to scald him with their heat. 
as though another, more powerful entity were speaking through her. I don't care if you bond with other servants. I don't even care about that ramen girl in the long run, nor how many mistresses you may take to your bed. Not their names, nor their faces. They are of no consequence to me. She bared her teeth, a stray scarlet spark snarling through them, but know this. I saw you first. I claimed you first. Whomever comes after will always be second, and if you ever forsake me, I will burn you alive. Are we clear? His head bobbed once, air scorching his lungs. Crystal, now let me go before we both do something we'll regret. E.H. Nobunaga looked down, beheld one of her own matchlocks jammed up against her lower torso. When those crimson orbs found his again, they held a startled measure of true respect, pride. Rather than scowl, her smile bloomed tenfold, taking on a decidedly crazed edge. That bloody crimson hue inexplicably flared in her hair, leaving him gasping for air. Her flames threatened to suck the very oxygen out of the air and scorch the street under their feet, such was their heat. In that instant, she released him. As the battered blonde's heart hammered back to life and slammed down to a knee as he found he could breathe again so too did he catch a glimpse of her. What he found there threw his already reeling vision for a loop. Well, well. Aren't you a bold one, master? A new voice purred into the smoke, smoldering like that darkest embers. I think I'll keep you. Framed in the waxing light of the rising sun she regarded him with a rapturous expression, hooded crimson lids observing him intently. This was, without a doubt, Oda Nobunaga, and yet, she wasn't. A striking young woman, the demon king incarnate. She was, in a word, beautiful. Glossy scarlet hair framed a pale face from which eyes of slitted scarlet shone. Proud and arrogant, much like the smile she wore. Tall and curvaceous, clad in a flowing black bodysuit over which she draped a flowing red mantle and cloak bearing a lotus clasp. Her provocative attire stood in stark parallel to her intention, she had not to hide and cared not what others thought of her, she didn't give a fig for it, for she stood as the epitome of madness. This was a devil. Pure strength and power. Coalesced in a single form. There could be no other word for her. As he looked on, she reached down and cupped his chin with a smile. Until we meet again, boy. A blink and, she, vanished, replaced by the Nobunaga he knew. Wahahaha. Good, so long as you understand, you really are just like me, master. Naruto's head jerked back and forth like broken puppet. I. Wait, what did you just? What was that? Who was she? Geez, I'm sorry about that. Really have to be careful about letting her out, don't I? As he straightened up with a rattling cough, the fiery archer laid a hesitant pad against his neck. Looks like that other. Me? Used up too much of your energy. Those pale fingers began to massage his back when another coughing fit started up. Aw oh man, you're looking kinda pale too. Do you need medicine or something? He shook his head, but she still continued to chatter at him anxiously. Do you want me to stay? Should I get Okita? Maybe she knows how to deal with this. No. No, I'm fine for now. I'll call you if I need you. She dithered a moment more. Well, you know where I'll be if you do, I'll be waiting, love ya. Only Nobunaga could flip from angry to lovable in an instant, crazy girl. I swear, she's going to be the death of me, he wheezed. By the end of all the chaos, a slightly singed Naruto wasn't at all surprised to find Anko waiting for him when he staggered up to the main gate. That much was expected. He'd kept her waiting long enough for these servant shenanigans as much as his own and although his senses were still on edge from his last close encounter. He nevertheless fixed a false smile to his face and raised a lazy hand in greeting as he shouted down at her. Sure enough, the Jonan snapped toward him like a broken rubber band. You're late, brat. It took nearly everything he had to erect the facade and not snap at her. Now, now, I just got lost on the road of life. He granted her a lazy yawn. I'm afraid I had to take quite the detour. Even from this distance he could hear the sound of Enko's hand slapping her forehead. Oh God. He's turning into another Kakashi. Kakashi? The hell is that? A quizzical frown plucked at his whiskered cheeks as he crossed the remaining yards between them. Never heard of him. Naruto was, however, slightly nonplussed to find that his new trench coat clad Kunoichi had picked up a scruffy old man and something of a stray since he'd seen her last. 
The latter was a young girl roughly a year or two his junior, her long brown hair and auburn eyes immediately caught her attention. Straight on one side, but bound by a braid on the other, he appearance lent her a strange, almost ethereal air, as though she weren't wholly aware of herself or her surroundings. At least her outfit was sensible enough. A pink kimono shirt held closed by a scarlet sash bearing two pockets on the front, alongside a pair of baggy violet pants. Even at this angle he could glimpse the gleam of red mesh armor beneath the former and latter when she moved. What baffled him, among other things, was her expression. She looked torn between sheer joy and absolute terror. An ugly epiphany slapped him upside the head. No no, no, no absolutely not. Spirits, the girl was raw, wasn't she? He could see it in her eyes, read it in her lax posture. Green. As clean and untested as that shiny new headband wrapped around her forehead. She probably hadn't even seen anything close to live combat. Worse, she looked ill, feeble, as if a strong breeze would knock her right over. There was a sickness in her erot, not just of the body, but the mind as well. Not that he had a leg to stand on there. He wasn't exactly healthy himself these days, but at least he knew his limits. Did she even know hers? Worse, there was something. Dot off about her. Outwardly, she seemed little more enough than an average Kunoichi, but his sixth sense, honed to a razor's edge by mages and mystics alike, warned him otherwise. There was something there. Inside her. He couldn't tell who or what it was, but its presence set him on edge. This is Yakumo. Anko began by way of introductions, mistaking his sour look for something else. She'll be your teammate. Hey, don't give me that face. She can handle herself well enough in a fight. As they looked on, the brunette flushed and sketched an awkward bow at the waist. Then you for this opportunity. I'll try not to be a hindrance to you, Naruto. Naruto grunted, suddenly feeling as though he needed to protect this tiny girl. Likewise. The words spilled out of him. I've got your back. Her hopeful expression hurt his heart. Didn't she know better than to take someone's words at face value? Just who was this girl? And this old coot, Anko continued with a wave of her hand, as our client, Tazuna. He's the bridge builder we'll be escorting. Naruto's already abysmal outlook of said client began to plummet the moment he laid eyes on the man behind them. It only took him an instant to assess him. Old, gray-haired, bespectacled man with a large beard and dark eyes. Clad in a sleeveless V-neck shirt with an obi, pants and a pair of sandals, complete with a white towel draped around his neck and a ridiculous pointed hat atop his head. He stank of sweat and fear, the latter almost overpowered by the ripe stench of alcohol. Seems this one was deathly afraid of something or someone and was using said booze to bolster his courage. A secret, then? Great, he loathed secrets. Pity. His already ill opinion of the man would have dropped further the moment the man opened his mouth. What, that's him? The bridge builder groused aloud. This is the, ace, you were bragging about? Where'd you find this one? Behind a thrift shop? Naruto quietly counted to three and braced himself. Sure enough, his skull exploded in a riot of protest. How dare he speak that way of our preter, filthy fiend? Can we carve out his heart, mama? Just a little? Lies and slander. Let me take his head. No, his blood will be mine. Start with his face. We want to kill him. Lie and slander. Nero, no, he swiftly rattled off their names as sought to soothe their frayed nerves. Jack, not today. Ushi, we can't kill a client. It took another handful of seconds to calm his moor. Vocal allies. Vlad, don't even think about it. As for you, Leonidas. Well, maybe a punch or two wouldn't hurt. Later, when no one's looking. Worse still was the lack of protest he felt from the others. Artoria and the others didn't have to say anything, their silence was telling. Um. Saber? You haven't said anything for a while now. Still, one alters stoic refusal so speak concerned him. Contractor, when she finally replied, her words held the faintest of smiles. I'm thinking of a word that starts with the letter E. Excali no. Do not do that, not not not, do you hear me? A bead of sweat ran down his brow as he imagined the angry woman unleashing the full might noble phantasm on the village. Just calm down. I'm not bothered by it. Really. I swear, Alter, I'll buy you a ton of hamburgers when we get back, so just calm down. 
Only then did he realize everyone was silent. Rather, they were staring at him. Tazuna, most pointedly. You, ah, all right there, kid. Hum. Naruto feigned a smile. Oh, I'm fine. I was just convincing the voices in my head not to kill you. They're not terribly fond of your attitude, you know. V voices? Much to his amusement the craftsman visibly shrank back at the implied threat. As expected of course, that in turn drew a laugh from Anko. He couldn't help but notice Yakumo clamp a hand against her mouth to stifle a giggle of her own as well. Naruto felt his ears twitch. Oh ho? She had a sense of humor. Perhaps there was hope for this girl after all. In another life, he would have happily demonstrated just how capable he and his friends were to this old man. Someone might have lost a limb or two. In this one, he chose the high ground. He had nothing to prove to anyone these days. Shall we, then? He asked, striding toward the gate. Dot, but he wasn't above a little payback every now and again. That's my line. Anko shouldered past him with a snort to receive an elbow in turn. With that said, the four of them set out through the gate in short order, leaving the landscape a dry whirl of color in their wake. Looking back, Naruto wondered if they should have simply taken off a dead sprint to their destination. It certainly would have prevented the chaos that followed. Loath though he was to leave his newfound freedom behind, the journey to Wave was a long one, and it made sense to expedite the process as much as they could. Alas, Tazuna was merely a civilian, and unable to keep pace, it would have been a small matter to have a servant carry the old fart, but Naruto refused to force an ugly task like that on his allies. Thus, the rest of them were forced to slacken their pace to accommodate the craftsmen. This in turn made for a dull, monotonous pace, the hours grinding by in silent stoicism until, finally, the poor teenager couldn't take it anymore. Medea? Naruto called out into the open air, got a second? For you, always, she answered readily enough, what do you need? It's about Yakumo. He replied mentally after a moment, there's something I want you to confirm for me. Rather than respond, Castor chose to materialize instead appearing on his flank without so much as missing a step. Yakumo's yelp and Tazuna's gobsmacked expression was well worth the scene she made. More so when she tossed back her hood and gave him a less than pleasant look. Anko, long since accustomed to such madness, merely shook her head. The bridge builder wasn't so easily adjusted to this new arrival. His reaction was nothing short of legendary. The cry he gave huh, who knew he could jump that high? And his subsequent spring proved rather remarkable by comparison. What in blazes? He all but darted behind Anko's coat, such was the depth of his nameless terror. Where did she come from? Is she an enemy ninja or something? Hardly. Medea favored the man with a dry look that Naruto sympathized with all too well. If I wished you dead, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Bah! Much to everyone's chagrin, the old man dug in his heels figuratively and literally and refused to move a step further. I still don't trust her. Her violet eyes narrowed. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Now be silent. I'm not here for you. Then who are you here for? With the merest wave of her fingers, she dismissed the man as though he were no more than a cockroach beneath her feet. Instead, her piercing gaze turned to a somewhat pallid Yakumo. The poor girl squeaked as those intense eyes fell upon her, but like a rabbit caught in a trap, she couldn't escape. Naruto almost pitied her. Medea had that fact on people. Now that he'd sicked her on his unprepared ally, he could only pray that his prior suspicions held water. If not, this might prove unpleasant. You there, girl. Castor beckoned, don't move. As this event transpired, Anko caught his attention. Her gaze held his for a moment longer, sliding to the east. Of course the lone puddle there had caught his attention, how could it not? Skathich had trained him to expect the unexpected. Leonidas imparted to him timeless pearl that the best offense was a good defense. As for Samiramus. Well. The poisoner taught him no end of tricks. After such rigorous training, his guard remained up at all times these days. One might say he never lowered it. Rather, he couldn't afford to. In the forest of death, any weakness meant death. You had to be aware of all possibilities, vigilant for any potential trick, any errant ambush. And that little pool of water there on the road? On a dry day? It stuck out like a sore thumb. To their credit, 
their assailants actually managed to surprise him in that hadn't made any moves yet. If anything, they'd tarried a hair too long. Now that they were aware of it, they had to strike soon. They must, or risk losing the element of surprise. Indeed, the four of them had already been well past the puddle long ago before they began arguing. So why, then? What were they waiting for oh? There it was. Movement. He counted the seconds, first, three, now two. Dot one. At last, the attack finally came. A pair of cloaked shadows swarmed out of the puddle in a rush, attacking without so much as a sound. All the world slowed to a crawl as he weighed his options. Only two? He'd expected more. Were he in their shoes, he would eliminate the obvious threat first in this case, Anko and then with the Jonin out of their way, dispense of her less dangerous students at his leisure. It was a sensible plan, and one he expected the enemy to take. He was not disappointed. Sure enough, the larger one launched his smaller companion headlong at the seemingly unprepared ninja with all due haste. Their teamwork proved extraordinary. No orders were given, none exchanged. Each knew what the other would do well before they did it. Such compatibility was nothing to sneeze at. He was about to intervene when he recognized the telltale gleam in Anko's eyes. Not a heartbeat later, her right arm snapped outward, gotcha. A writhing torrent of serpents burst from her rightmost sleeve and ensnared the raging buffoon before his claw could even hope to brush her body. Poor Saad never stood a chance. By the time he realized his peril, dozens upon dozens of vipers encircled and crushed the man in an instant, nigh but immobilizing him with potent venom even as his companion rushed forward. Poor bastard. That looked painful, if not outright lethal. Moreover, the sight of such a unique jutsu stirred something in him. For the first time in his life, he was faced with something he didn't recognize. Dot in. I want that. Anko actually laughed. Drool later, kid. Sputtering the young man ruthlessly bit his tongue. Hey, aren't those the demon brothers you were reading about? Cersei's voice inquired. Naruto actually blinked at the realization, reassessing his opinion of the now scrambling duo with a keen eye. When not tasked with training or other minutiae, he'd taken the time to borrow every book he could get his hands on. He'd thought they looked familiar, these were the brothers Gozu and Maizu. They'd been in one of bingo books he'd read, a pair of missing ninja of Chunin rank, twin brothers, and a nasty piece of work at that. Their signature mist headbands and garb gave them away as surely as the bulky rebreathers and massive clawed gauntlet each wore for themselves. Poisoned, if he recalled. Wasn't there a chain of some sort connected to the latter? Oh, there it was. The remaining brother Maizu, wasn't it? Had disconnected it and chosen to rush Anko in a desperate attempt to free his entrapped sibling. And so Naruto started forward to meet him. Yakumo, Medea, protect the old man. Naruto nearly summoned another servant out of reflex before the realization hit him. He'd intercepted them almost without thinking, so he hadn't noticed it now. They were so slow, weren't they? Regardless, in the millisecond it took the larger brother to lunge at Anko, Naruto had already neatly pawned a smoke bomb to his right hand and a kunai to his right. The latter was flung half heartedly as a distraction and immediately found itself batted harmlessly aside, while the former exploded into a small, noxious cloud of green mist. One that poor Maizu, still airborne and unable to correct his momentum, sailed right through. To the naked eye, he seemed almost unaffected, only turning to alter his course towards him, rather than the preoccupied Anko. Almost. Hem. Naruto mused, thumbing his chin. So your rebreathers kept the poisons from being inhaled. Fascinating. However, it should be a matter of time now. Maizu never reached him. Instead, his headlong charge turned into a tumble as he lost his legs and toppled to the ground like a tipsy toddler. He recovered just as quickly, but whatever momentum he'd managed to garner was all but gone. Even with his weight slowing him down, the missing ninja's speed proved downright laughable by comparison. Perhaps he'd simply gotten faster over time. Who could say? The outcome, already slanted in his favor to begin with, tipped further still as the intoxicated shinobi stumbled after him. Don't play with your food. A regal voice instructed him. Even the weakest of dogs can. A small smile curled at the corner of his mouth as he beckoned his opponent forward. Come on then, hothead. He catcalled. I could use a workout. Sure enough, Maizu's hot temper betrayed him. Why you little? Quick to anger, 
The Chunin blitzed him and Naruto stepped up to meet him gladly. His training took over and the world faded to a blur of black and gray of a familiar memory. It was almost as if Leonidas were right there, instructing him. He was a bulwark. A wall. He did not need to attack first, for his opponent would come to him as surely as the tide. With a wordless mutter, he summoned the Spartan's shield to his right hand and a lance to his left, evidenced by Maizu's pained yelp of surprise as his unarmored metal equally unyielding steel. He didn't see the rest, for it was then that he went on the offensive. A feint at the ribs, followed by a hard chop to the neck. Stand fast. Press the advantage. Stab. Parry. Repost. Sweep the legs. Kick out the knees. Shield bash. Good, good. Leonidas crowed in the back of his mind. Press him now. With each successive attack, he fought not as a shinobi would, but as a Spartan. And it showed. He allowed Maizu no openings. Even as the poisoned Chunin's offense began to falter, he never relented. I'm telling you, ya just don't have what it takes, give up. As if to defy that very statement the thug swiped at him blindly. To make his point, Naruto finally allowed this one to connect. Clawed fingers grazed the muscle of his right arm as he blocked an uppercut, metal fingers tearing a bloody line along the length of his sleeve. In the next instant a rousing roundhouse knocked the man flat. Poison. What poison? Compared to the toxins Serenity and Samiramis had forced upon him, this was tame by comparison. It didn't even itch. His attacker's so called trump card failed utterly and was shrugged off as though it were no more than a breeze. Maizu, however, did not rise again. Naruto palmed his face. Ah, damn it. Looks like time's up. All. Dot get you. As luck would have it, this last, LL faded rush had brought Maizu to his knees and shortly thereafter, right to death's doorstep. A single kick was all it took to put him down for good. It was almost sad, really. He tried fought to the best of his ability, and all his efforts had done was seal his doom. Hastened by adrenaline as much as fear, the Samiramis's toxins did their deadly work. Within moments the Chunin collapsed and began to convulse. You little brat. Those piggish, beady eyes sought him out immediately. What did you do to me? Poison. With a wave of his hand, he banished both lance and shield to crouch before the dying man. Isn't it obvious? Well, shit. Mordred whistled in the back of his head. You're a vicious little shit, ain't you? Remind me to stay on your good side. For a moment Naruto considered telling him the man in greater detail, revealing the horrid fate that awaited him. His ego swelled at the thought, bringing with it a bitter reminder. Gilgamesh would gloat. He would torture and torment anyone beneath him, all the while reveling in their agony. That was the man he had to defeat. He would not become him. He refused to become him. This man was dying because of him. A life, snuffed out, and he felt, nothing for it. Hmm. That might be concerning. Samiramis was legendary when it came to poisons. Her wit unmatched, her methods inspired. She could concoct toxins that would lull you into a brainless slumber or acid that ate at your very flesh. While she might not be as powerful as some servants without her hanging gardens currently under construction using means he didn't wholly understand but her knowledge of toxins and venoms was unparalleled. You didn't need to breathe them in. Skin contact was more than enough. Such a shame he hadn't thought to cover his eyes. Now, then, he continued, extricating a thin white vial from his pouch, I have the antidote right here. If you don't want to bleed to die in the next 30 seconds, you're going to tell me everything I want to know. Who hired you? Are there more of you? Why did you target us? Who knows, if I like what I hear, I just might be able to save you, might. A small, wordless whimper was the man's only response. What? Naruto tilted his head, didn't catch that. I said I'll talk you, you bastard, just help me, red eyes gleamed down at him. Good boy. Now. Talk. Gato knew his business. Shinobi? they were bad for business. He'd clawed his way to the top by any means necessary. Done terrible, horrible things in the name of wealth, fame and power. Murder meant nothing to him. Money was meant to be used, flung at the authorities to keep them silent. Or silence any fool who dared speak against him. Oh, hiring out missing ninja had its uses on occasion, but more often than not it was a hassle. An expensive hassle. Necessary, but annoying as all hell. They were powerful pawns, so long as you paid them, but the moment you didn't, 
just the thought made him shudder. He hadn't paid Zabuza in nearly a week now, he simply didn't have the money, and the demon was getting restless. Because someone or something else had laid claim to wave in the last week, and when Gato said claim, it meant someone had taken it upon themselves to disrupt his operation, burn his shipments, steal all of money, kill half his men and protect the people. Some said it was a man. Others claimed it was a woman. Still more insisted it was a group. No one ever got a look at them. Those that did never returned. Their heads did. Zabuza wouldn't find or fight the bastards, because Zabuza wasn't getting paid. Worse, somewhere along the way, Gato had made something of an error. He'd given the people of Wave hope, that damned Tazuna and his blasted bridge. It was all his fault, he should have been dead by now, instead he'd hired guards, good ones at that. Guards that were coming here, he wouldn't have known about them at all if one of the demon brothers had come limping back. He'd been half dead, gibbering something about poison and snakes and demons appearing from nowhere. Nonsense, the lot of it. He'd killed the fool for his failure, it also meant he didn't have to worry about paying him no skin off his nose. Still, he'd supplied them with one useful nugget of information before he perished. Those shinobi were headed here, to him. Good, made things easier. Zabuza and that brat of his would take came of them, right? Or perhaps those leaf ninja would kill them in turn. If they somehow manged to kill each other, well, less people for him to pay, then. He wasn't finished. Not yet. Not yet. 0.0.0.0. .0 Kid, you're a real piece of work, you know that? Not telling me anything I don't already know myself, Anko. Oh ho. The Jonan flung up her arms, he speaks, and here I thought you'd gone mute. Naruto didn't deign to look up at the thinly veiled barb. Rather, he let her words washed over him like so much water off a duck's back. In another life, he would have angrily risen to the bait and pushed her right out of the boat. Ah, oh, he could see it now her hazel eyes widening, arms pinwheeling in surprise as she toppled backward into the water with a yelp, of course, that was his imagination talking. Chances were she'd simply water walk her way back to the boat and thrash him upside the head. I mean, I cooled give her a shove, if you want. Mordred prodded in the back of his mind, just a little? As though reading his mind, his teacher scowled, you push me, you die. Oh shit, did she hear me? Wasn't thinking of it. Naruto chose to ignore his fellow blonde's yelp and favored the latter with a cherubic smile as she sat beside him. Not a bit. We'll get her later, Saber, he added as an aside. The Knight of Rebellion beamed. Best, master, ever. Please don't encourage her, master, she's bad enough as is. Bah, shut up, stupid father, he didn't need to see Mordred to her here blow a raspberry. No matter how cathartic humiliating Anko might have been nor the idea of seeing her sopping wet he chose to refrain from the argument bantering back and forth in his skull and focus on the journey ahead, if not his meditations. If the ferryman had anything to say about so many being crammed into such a small boat, a pouch of gold held his tongue. Just as well too, Naruto hadn't been happy about forfeiting that much money to buy the man's silence, he wasn't keen on this boat, either. Because Tazuna had lied. It hadn't come as a surprise to Naruto of course. He'd had the naivete beaten out of him long ago. Everyone lied about something in this day and age. Shinobi, civilians, everyone. Small lies, big lies, white lies, black lies, gray lies. Tazuna's unique brand of deception just so happened to have a good reason behind it. He'd fed them a sob story about not being able to feed his family, that none of them could afford the ludicrous expense of a higher rank mission. They were being oppressed by a cruel tyrant, that the bridge he was building would be the sole lifeline to peace and prosperity for his people, so on and so forth. In the end, they'd chosen to accept the task at hand. Though not without a bit of chewing out on Anko's part. We are going to kill the oppressor, yes? Naruto felt his lips quirk into the smallest of smiles as a gentle wave lapped against the dingy. You'll have first crack at him, Spartacus, I swear. Talking to your friends again, kid? Nerud calmly flipped Anko off as he returned to his meditations. Just the voices in my head. Medea hummed softly at his elbow. I could curse her, if you wish. His minder laughed. Ha, huh, I like you, just try it. Naruto almost considered letting her. Say what you would, Medea could be vicious when pushed. Once again, 
he chose to err on the side of caution. Entertaining as it might be, he didn't relish seeing anyone face the sheer horror what was rule breaker. There was a reason he'd worked so hard to win bring Medea to his side in the beginning. She could easily append his plans and steal his allies. There was a real threat of that when his training first began. Thankfully he had managed to win her favor, and he aimed to keep it. With that in mind, he decided to indulge her. Maybe later, focus on your patient for now. I'm sure this will be no problem for you. Castor preened. Of course not, master. Leave the girl to me. Yakumo hadn't spoken a word since the slaughter, not out of fear or any such emotion, but because she simply wasn't conscious to do so. Medea had taken the girl's little problem as something of a personal affront and dedicated her every waking moment to eradicating the damn demon in her mind. Naruto approved. Unlike some of the stronger servants, she didn't cost much of his energy to field and she was outright thrifty about her spells. Better for him to conserve his energy for when he needed it. In the beginning, he'd barely been able to field Heracles without his lungs locking up. Now, he barely even noticed it. If only he could fend off Anko's suspicions so easily. We have a problem. Hum. The Jinchuriki cracked an eye open as a familiar voice plucked at the strings of his heart. Ishtar. What's wrong? A beat of silence passed. The another. Another still. Finally, she spoke. Someone. Dot may have woken up. Who? Ivan. I thought Anastasia had an agreement with him. A pause. Dot not Ivan. Worse, he didn't like her tone. What did you do? You mean what didn't this useless goddess do? Enkidu chimed helpfully. Shut up shut up shut up. I was just poking around. How was to know that was in here? It shouldn't be possible. Naruto grit his teeth and tried to ignore the migraine that followed. He loved his servants. He really, truly did. They were his friends. His family. With the exception of a few absolute abominations and those who outright refused to speak to him, he got on with nearly everyone these days. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for the servants themselves. From petty rivalries to bitter grudges or long standing feuds, each had their own quirks and he had to be careful to manage them accordingly. Summon too many at once and he risked his already poor health taking a turn for the worse. For instance, he couldn't bring Mozart out in the presence of Salieri or a bloodbath would ensue. The same could be said of Ishtar and Enkidu, or a berserk Lancelot and Artoria. As their master, it fell to him to maintain the delicate balance between all parties, lest one of them see fit to break their contract and go their own way. Seven had already gone that route over his chosen direction when he'd first started out, and who knew where they'd ended up? After all, these cards were merely a medium by which to contain his allies. Their choices and motives were entirely their own, but they needed a tether to this world to exist. Just as he needed them to survive. Gilgamesh wasn't just going to sit around forever. Sooner or later he'd come for them. All of them. And didn't that just make Naruto shudder? So he asked again, Ishtar. What did you do? All right, but you can't be mad at me, I mean it, you can't. This is totally not my fault. He knew that note of panic in her voice all too well and accepted it with a long suffering sigh of his own. There's nothing to do down here in your inner world, so I thought I'd look around a bit. Meet the other servants, redecorate, or something. She flinched at the subsequent hiss. Not like that. I stayed away from the fox like you told me to. But how was I supposed to know that was in here? It was just a piece. I didn't think anything would happen, I'm sorry. Fine. I'll find more gems for you later, all right? Naruto bit out. Just stop crying and tell me what you did. He never got an answer, because a woman's song slipped through the back of his mind. No, no, no. The goddess wailed. She's awake. Who, Ishtar? Something deep inside of him pulled and his vision went white. There could be no other word for it. One moment he'd been squatting in the boat, knees tucked into his chest as he tried to ignore all the odd looks everyone was giving him. The next? Everything turned pure as driven snow. No not his vision. His world. He flung up an arm without thinking, but no attack came. Ishtar? Enkidu? He called out into the abyss. Hello? Guys? The arm lowered, but no response came. Anyone? Someone sniffled behind him, and without thinking, he rounded on the sound. Mistakes were made. A weeping woman clad in blue awaited him in the beyond, her slender shoulders shaking with every breath. 
Another anguished sound escaped her as he looked on. A high, keening whine that tore at him. Despite his best efforts, the blonde felt heat crawl up the back of his neck. His next instinct was embarrassment, as though he'd walked in on something he shouldn't have. As if he had a choice, something had pulled him here. Then came curiosity, and so he gazed upon her. Terrible horns curled away from pointed ears framed by pale aqua hair that flowed past her feet to pool against a swaying tail at her back. Clawed hands cradled her face, shielding it from view, as though to hide her gaze from the world. He knew the feeling. It was a childish way of thinking. If you couldn't see someone, then they surely they couldn't see you. He steeped back without thinking, and the sound echoed awfully in the void. Sure enough, it was able to reach the woman's ears. Upon hearing him, realizing she wasn't alone, the weeping woman raised her gaze. Vibrant violet orbs blinked back at him, framed by deep purple lashes. A blazing white X stood etched in place of her pupils, even now widening in confusion. He felt as if he should know this woman, after all, he knew nearly every other servant in the cards, from Angra Mainyu to Rasputin himself. Yet when he reached now for that knowledge, he felt only an empty void, dot and a vague sense of dread. This woman was an unknown. When she opened her mouth to speak, he glimpsed what might have been Fang's. Ah! A long, mournful note echoed between them. I'm sorry. His shoulders rose in a helpless shrug. I can't understand you. Her lips pursed in a thin line of displeasure. It might have been sorrow. It could have been anger. Ah! Like I said, that was lost in translation ouch. Pressure pushed against the back of his head, briefly causing him to clutch at his temples. It vanished in the next instant, leaving his ears ringing. He hazarded a glare at the blue net, not trusting himself to speak lest he snap at her. What the hell was that about? When next the mysterious femme fatale spoke however, he found he could understand her. Dot you should not be here, master of the cards. The words sounded awkward and stilted as though she were unused to speaking. Go. Go back. A small, sad smile plucked at her lips. Go back to your boat. I would if I could, Naruto sighed, scratching his wrist and glowering at the ever-present command spells flowing up his arm. Bloody things itched. You brought me here. That was. Dot not my intent. She grimaced aside. I was sleeping. Something woke me. I am awake. A pause, and she glowered at him. Why am I awake? You're asking me? The blonde nearly guffawed when she pouted at him. I'm just as lost here as you. I think Ishtar had something to do with it. She did? The mysterious beauty perked up, considering him anew. Tell me then, master of the cards, was my love mistaken? Naruto considered her words for a moment, and folded both arms behind his head. Dunno. Can't say if it was, or wasn't. I wasn't there. Who can say? Who did you love? My children. The entity hung her head in sullen shame, and, when he didn't press her, dared to speak anew. Many a life has loved me. However, my children have used me as a ladder, and they always head to places so far away. A small, longing note weaved its way into her words. I wanted to love them forever. I wanted to be at their side forever. But not like this. She shook her head, horns swaying against her hair as she clutched a clawed hand to her. It hurts. Much to his dismay. That fretful gaze found his once more. How do I make it stop hurting? For a moment, just a moment her shadow writhed behind her, becoming monstrous. Like a beast. No 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 that was absurd. Right? Wasn't it? She couldn't be here, no way. I think, Naruto began slowly, his throat suddenly gone dry from that ugly thought, that you need to calm down. I can't. A small, hysterical sob burst from her as those wild orbs snapped to him again. I was asleep, but now I'm awake. I want to go back to sleep. A pale limb rose to her forehead, clutchingly. I. It hurts. It hurts it hurts it hurts her thirts. I don't like it. I hate this. Make it stop. Without thinking, he took a step forward. No, stay away. She scared backward with a shriek when he tried to approach. Please leave me behind young master of the cards. Please, never love me, please forget about me. The way she'd phrased those words just now, coupled with that she'd said earlier, that wasn't possible. It shouldn't be possible. He should have felt dread when he approached her. Tried to escape at the very least as she told him to. He knew who she was now. Her words aligned with what he'd been told, and it terrified him. 
Tiamat. Mother of all. A breath hitched in his throat. Because this was a beast, or at least a sentient piece of one. Immortal. Eternal. Destruction incarnate. A force grand servants struggled against. He wasn't ready for a fight like this. Not at all. In this space he had no power beyond his own strength, and even his new skills paled in comparison to this eldritch abominations. He should have fled. Screamed for help. Begged for mercy. Thrown himself into despair. Any one of those responses would have been perfectly sane. Naruto had thrown away his sanity long ago. When faced with someone so pitiful, he couldn't help himself. So, in spite of her cries, in spite of her pain, he marched right up to her in. Nope. Tiamat blinked as his palms closed around hers, cries going quiet. I do not understand. Naruto didn't give her a chance to fight back, when she pulled away he stepped forward and grabbed her hands again. I said nope. He repeated the words firmly, fully prepared to chase her down if she tried to escape. Everyone deserves a chance, you know? I've befriended monsters and madmen, murderers and aliens alike. Why not you? If anything, you look like you need a hug. Why not indeed? So he did what came naturally. Tiamat flinched as if she'd been struck when his arms closed around her. No, you mustn't love me. Her head shook frantically, words taking on a desperate pitch. Do you not understand? She struggled in his grasp, to no avail. Everyone will hate you if you love me. When he didn't bat an eyelash, she began to tremble in his grasp like a leaf. Your friends will curse you if you love me. Tears swam in her eyes as she weakened, body betraying her. Your family will despise you if you love me. All the world will become your enemy if you love me. Her words trailed off into a tiny sob. Please, leave me behind. Please, never love me. What a miserable existence this must be. And who decided that? With that thought, anger reared its ugly head in Naruto's heart and he let go of her, if only to tell her just what he thought of that. My friends are my servants. His fingers shot out and flicked her in the forehead when she made to protest. My family. Also my servants. Another flick. Another pitiful whine as her protests withered. They'd never betray me now. Another flick. I have no one else to care about. Was this bullying? This felt an awful lot like bullying. I don't give a spit about my image or my village. Hell, I'm probably going to run the first chance I get. What about you? Tiamat whimpered weakly, rubbing her forehead. Me. Oh, for the love of. Sure enough, the goddess startled like a frightened kitten when he offered her his hand. I shouldn't. She looked away, though her arm twitched. I'll ruin everything. My life's already pretty shitty. Naruto laughed. Now take my hand. Slowly, tentatively, her fingers curled around his. Poor thing. She looked fit to bolt at the slightest provocation. Even from here he could feel her tension. Naruto felt his heart twitch traitorously again. He'd told something of a white lie. Not everyone would accept this. Ishtar and the others might well be furious with him. One or two might even try to breach their contracts over this mess. The thought. Didn't please him, but he accepted it as a necessary evil nonetheless. You couldn't please everyone. He'd given up on that fallacy long ago. Dot you won't leave? Her words were a whisper. You'll stay? Yup. He wholeheartedly meant that. When the tears came, Naruto thought himself prepared for them. He wasn't. Not at all. Not in the least. It started as a sniffle. A lone tear trailing down Tiama's cheek. Her lower lip trembled as a tiny hiccup fled from her lips, one that soon rose into a great heaving sob. She didn't surge forward, that would have implied movement. Instead her arms crushed around around him as she buried her head into his shoulder. Tiamat didn't cry. She wept, her very being flickered. And the world snapped back like a rubber band. Not another one? Those were Tazuna's words, not his, because Tazuna toppled backward into the sea accidentally dragging a startled Anko and the ferryman with him, as the form of a very tall woman manifested in a swirl of golden light and summarily landed on Naruto with a delighted squeal. Less so when said woman nearly upended the bloody boat and pitched the rest of them into the sea. Ah, Medea didn't even bother to save either from their plight. She was too busy gaping at the horned deity currently trying to suffocate her master beneath their bosom, cuddling him as though he were the most precious child in all the world. She didn't even deign to notice her or anyone else, such was her glee. A delighted, happy note fled from the newcomer's lips as she looked on, 
and it took the witch of betrayal a moment to place it. She was singing the witch realize, humming a happy lullaby to herself that Medea couldn't make heads or tails of. What in the world? Who was this? Throughout it all, Naruto heard but a single word, sung over and over. It utterly sealed his fate and the world with him. Mine. Tiamat cooed. Mine, mine, mine. Tiamat sang right back, almost joyously, so as she crushed the goddess's head deeper into her bosom. Alas, that caused Ishtar's cries to redouble as she turned into a raging hellcat in Tiamat's arms. Apparently, she was a hugger. Who knew? It almost made Naruto smile. All right, it did. It really did. Because Ishtar didn't like being hugged. At all. Any discomfort on the noisy goddess's part was enough to make him smirk. Still, the shouting need to stop, and Anko was beginning to look at him like he was a madman, Sue. Would have been a touching scene. All right, all right. Break it up. Naruto forced himself between the two of them before the rest of the party could go deaf. That's enough. Ah. Sorry. Have you lost your mind? Ishtar all but tore at her hair as she escaped Tiamat's grasp. How did you even manage to summon her, let alone tame her? She's a monster? Tiamat drew back with an almost wounded look. She whined like a kicked puppy. A seven-foot-tall puppy with horns capable of slaying servants and wiping out entire continents. Without thinking, Naruto snagged her wrist and laced his fingers with hers. The change from miserable to joyful was nigh instantaneous as she granted him a beatific smile. I didn't tame anyone, he muttered at Ishtar. I just talked to her. Ah, oh, yup. Not helping, Tia. Not helping at all. Of course you did. The goddess groaned. You know what? Screw it. I'm going to sleep. Wake me up when the world makes sense. She returned to her astral form before he could get a word in. Naruto was almost grateful for it. Their strange little screaming contest had been going on for the better part of a five minutes now, much to his displeasure. Tiamat genuinely meant no harm, but he didn't much blame Ishtar for her fear. Terror was very much a natural response when faced with someone like her. Even a fragment of the primordial goddess was akin to outright divinity. Naturally her, return, had riled up a great many of his allies, never mind her physical presence. Huh, so that's Tiamat? Nobunaga mused in the back of his head. She doesn't look so tough. Betcha I could take her. Don't you dare, Yushiwakamaru snarled. She'd lop your head off before you could blink. Naruto bit back a grimace. Merely sustaining Tiamat's physical form taxed his resolves more than he cared to admit. But the smile on her face made it all the more worthwhile. No matter how terrifying she might have seemed to everyone else, there could be no denying her joy, nor the rapturous look on her face as she continued to take in her surroundings. Ah, so happy. Naruto patted her arm, I can tell. Every cry she made was gibberish to the ears of others, but not him. As her contractor her understood every word. Thanks to the unusual nature of their pact he found himself saddled with more than a few benefits as well. He felt stronger in her presence, faster, his senses sharper than they'd ever been. That's it. Anko flung up her hands, startling him out of his reverie. You've got to do something about this, kid. I can't take it anymore. Do something about what? He tried to feign innocence, but she wasn't having it. About her. Anko stabbed a finger at Tiamat, she's way too big. Ah, uh, the innocent monster tilted her head to one side, me? Don't you, ah, uh, me, missy, Anko snapped. Fix this. Rather than argue, the primordial goddess nodded her head and took a step backward. Before everyone's eyes her towering form dwindled to the size of a young child. Before anyone had the chance to remark on it, the goddess climbed onto Naruto's back and nestled her head against his shoulder comfortable. The blonde's brow rose. Ah, she chirruped happily and kissed his cheek, the noise muffled against his jacket. Yes. He, he chuckled. Love you too. As but a shard of her former self, Tiamat could change her size at will. Which was all well and good because Naruto knew he wouldn't be able to sustain her true towering form for more than a few seconds. Not as he was now. Not anytime soon. Perhaps not even as an adult. His chakra pool was vast and growing larger with each passing day, but at the end of said day, he was still mortal. Anko palmed her face, I find myself, conflicted. Monsters, Tazuna muttered, they're all monsters, 
never should have hired them. Naruto favored the bridge builder with a pitying smile as they walked. Heroic spirits weren't for the faint of heart, and a shape shifting goddess was right up there with the best. Even poor Yakumo looked just as shocked by it all, he could feel her wide eyes tracking his every movement. The poor girl had yet to so much as speak a word since she'd recovered at Medea's hands, he suspected an outburst sometime in the near future. Ah! Tiamat leaned over and tugged his ear, drawing him up short. Someone's here. Tazuna crashed into his back with a grunt. What's wrong? Yakumo glanced about fretfully. Why are we stopping? You sensed it, too, huh? Enko stepped past him. Whoever's there, come on out. There's no use hiding. Brat's got a nose like a bloodhound. Hey. A rustle in the brush up ahead drew their attention. Hmm. This almost felt familiar. Naruto stretched out his enhanced senses and was immediately rewarded for his curiosity. It wasn't an ambush as he'd first suspected, nor was it a decoy meant to lure them into a trap. He'd sensed a servant. Not just any servant but a rogue one, a being that had separated itself from him and his companions. Stay back. He raised an arm when Enko made to follow him. Let me handle this, alone. Before his minder could protest he stalked forward. Depending on the identity of said servant, this might end, poorly for everyone involved. Early on in his training some servants had chosen to go their separate ways in peace, but others hadn't parted on amicable terms with him and he'd been forced to let them go lest he risk a fight. He could think of a choice few. Regardless, he needn't have waited long. He only made it ten steps before an oppressive aura slammed into him like a ton of bricks and held him in place. I thought I heard someone. A new voice call out just ahead of them. Another of Gatos, are you? Sorry, but I'm a little tired today. I'm afraid I'll have to kill you quickly. Naruto turned to face them as they broke through the brush. She was a short little thing. Her head barely came up to his chest. Even someone like Tazuna proved taller than her, for good reason. He recognized her nearly on sight, even if it took a moment. A wide, dopey grin spread across his face. Here was a berserker among berserkers possessed of a singular fury and determination that few could ever hope to match. They recognized him, judging by their quizzical expression. Ah? Uh, Tiamat queried from her perch on his shoulders, enemy? Nah. Naruto reached back to pat her head, nothing like that, not at all. Oh. It's only you. The rogue servant frowned. Finally left the nest, have you? His grin grew to shit-eating proportions. This woman was responsible for training him helping to mold him into the warrior he was now. Oh, her methods had been harsh, but he'd come out all the better for it. More than that, he was just so damned happy to see her, moreover. Berserker. Long time no see, or should I say. She stiffened slightly but held her ground. That was a mistake. Don't do it, brat. Naruto edged forward. One step. Then another. Two. Three now. Four. The tiny berserker hefted her flail. Don't you freaking dare. Naruto shot forward like an arrow from a taut bow and struck her head on. At the moment of impact he bent down, wrapped his arms around the little Amazon, and ripped her from her feet. Then he spun her about like a top. Berserker squeaked for a moment before she managed to master herself. Cease. She slammed a knee into his torso with a squawk, release me at once. Nope. He nuzzled his cheek against hers for all for all he was worth. It's so good to see you again, sis, I had no idea where you went. Yes. Well. I didn't give you permission to touch me. The proud warrior squirmed fitfully in his arms, to no avail. Release me already, would you? Reluctantly, Naruto did as he was bade and lowered his captive to the ground before she truly began to struggle. Penthesilia swatted him on the nose and he laughed all the more. On a whim he stooped down and hugged her again. Berserker bore it with irritated impatience but didn't try and strike him again for it. You've gotten taller, boy, and you haven't changed a bit, I see. He beamed right back. Why are you here? She arched a quizzical brow. I thought you had no faith in your village. I don't, he admitted freely, heedless of the black look Enko shot at his back. This is. Guess you could call it a trial run. When she beckoned for him to continue he did so happily. We're here to guard an old man and help him build a bridge. To what end? Freedom from oppression. Ouch. Spartacus howled with glee in the back of Naruto's head, drawing a wince from the bond. That sort of thing. Oh, 
His former mentor graced him with a grin. Then our goals align. My master has a vested interest in seeing this country freed from its shackles. As do I, she didn't hesitate at all in the face of his surprised silence. Unfortunately, I lack the energy for a full assault at this time. She's quite weak. Tiamat squeaked in concern from her perch at that and Penthesilia flicked a lazy gaze at her, but said no more. Rest assured, I've kept her out of harm's way. Naruto felt his jaw click open. You formed a contract with someone? Who? I have. Her brow darkened, and that is my concern, not yours. A beat of awkward silence pushed itself between them. Penthesilia scuffed a boot on the ground, could you perhaps? Naruto caught her meaning immediately. Now that he dwelt on it, he supposed it wasn't impossible for a servant to forge a contract with a weak master. But without an energy source to sustain her, Penthesilia was likely subsisting off the very life force of said master to manifest, mystery though they were. She was asking him for mana. Chakra. One of the two, if not both. Sure. He offered her his hand. I've got chakra to spare. Let me give you a recharge. Rather than respond, she clasped his hand and drew him in sharply. Hey. Naruto balked. What are you soft lips melded against his and clamped down? Hard. When he sought to pull away, she reached up and wrapped both arms around his neck, drawing him in to plunder his mouth like the savage she was. All the while, he felt her take from him, viciously draining his reserves. Her tongue tangled against his when he fought back, and she swiftly asserted her dominance, stepping in to physically ram him against the nearest tree. Somewhere in the distance Naruto heard Yakumo wheeze and pass out at the sight. Treachery. Nobunaga loosed an outraged shriek in his mind. Tiamat cooed softly and tilted her head nearly horizontal to watch them. Tazuna muttered something about breaking international law. The hell did that mean? Anko clamped a hand over her mouth, what she wouldn't give for a camera right about now. I thank you for the meal. Berserker drew backward and licked her lips. You've gotten stronger, that's good. I dot you. That's cheating. He rasped. That said, I'm afraid I have no interest in forging a contract with you again. That's fine. He waved her words away like an errant breeze. I don't mind that, not one bit. Seriously wait, what? I said it's fine. Naruto kicked a sandal-clad foot against the dirt. You lot are people to me. People disagree. If you want to protect this country, I won't stop you. Her ears twitched. Truly, am. Am I interrupting something here? A new voice called from the trees. Should I come back later? Naruto turned. Blinked. Frowned at what who? He found perched on a nearby branch. In all honesty. He'd tuned Zabuza out. He'd wrestled with demigods and hunted with legends. Supped with demons and divines. Been blasted about by sabers, archers, and lancers alike. What was some mook with a bloody cleaver compared to that? Not very intimidating, that's what. What are you supposed to be, a mummy or something? Anko snorted. Nothing personal, pal. Kid's got a mouth on him. I can see that. Dark eyes glowered above the bandages. I'll enjoy ripping out his tongue. 3. Naruto interjected, cutting him off. What? The demon of the mist balked at him. What are you on about? As far as threats go, I give it a 3. The whiskered warrior elucidated slowly. It wasn't very clever, sorry. Cheeky little shit. Nope, just being honest. Naruto felt the beginnings of a smile pluck at his mouth as he watched the madman seethe above them. I've suffered through more colorful invectives from BB, Kiera, and the rest than you could possibly imagine. It was true, too. Servants knew how to cuss with the best of them, and some of the threats they'd made while training him were downright inventive. But apparently Zabuza had decided he'd had enough, for he was drawing his sword. Any last words? Shouldn't we be asking you that? Naruto cocked his head to one side. Really he didn't mean any ill will by that. It was just common courtesy. Zabuza didn't take too kindly that. I'm going to kill you now. It's going to be slow. It's going to hurt. Blue eyes narrowed as the robed ninja waved a seal and vanished into the mist. Just as well too, because little Tiamat wasn't having it. No sooner had the fog settled over them than she looked up and inhaled sharply. Her lungs swelled, eerie eyes pulsing a baleful blood red as she craned her neck just so. Naruto and Berserker plugged their ears. Tiamat absolutely shrieked. 
As far as screams went Naruto considered this a vicious one. Even with his fingers jammed firmly in his ears his world went white for a moment. The others weren't so fortunate. A veritable wave of concussive force ripped through the clearing to banish the fog in a single breath. Zabuza was caught out less than a yard away, poised to slice. Poor bastard barely had time to raise his sword before the sonic scream slammed into him. Putting a metal blade between him and that high-pitched cry proved a mistake. Zabuza didn't tumble. Zabuza flew. Ripped from his feet he crashed through the ground, digging a mighty furrow in the earth where he dissolved into a puddle. Naruto slapped a hand against his forehead as Tiamat's shout cut off. A water clone? Really? Why do you have to be so damn difficult about this? A shadow fell over him and struck Penthesilia, sending her careening into the lack with a mighty splash. Naruto felt that rare vein by his right eye begin to twitch as he scrambled back from the follow-up attack. Of course he went for Berserker. No, 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 ignore the defenseless man with a goddess perched on his head. Let's attack the living personification of rage instead. What could possibly go wrong? Hey. Even from here he could see the demon smirk beneath the bandages. One less weakling to deal with. I win. Naruto shook his head. No you screwed up. Nice knowing ya. Ah. Tiamat agreed eloquently. Bye bye, sword guy. E.H. Zabuza blinked. What do you mean the lake began to boil furiously? Outrage. Amazon. Naruto didn't see the precise moment that the water erupted. She was too quick to follow. But he certainly heard Penthesilla burst from the lake and barreled into Zabuza all the same. An ugly crunch heralded the loss of a something important. By the time he saw her again, it was Zabuza who found himself on the defensive, gripping a deep wound in his stomach. Berserker's bloody hands and the scarlet stains spattered across her face told him all he needed to know of her noble phantasm. It also told him what was coming next. He raised one hand to block Tiamat's view, ignoring her annoyed whine. Damn monster. Zabuza rasped, stumbling away as he clutched at his gut. What the hell are you? He coughed blood behind the bandages. Just what the hell are you? My, my, my. Penthesilia sauntered after him with a cruel smile. What did you say earlier? The words were a growl. Something about me being weak? The head cleaver descended on her in a merciless overhand strike only to be batted away like a harmless stick. You call that a weapon? She tutted softly, shaking her head. That's not a weapon. She caught the sword on the backswing with her one hand hands, fingers digging deep furrows in the metal. Almost lazily, she made a tight fist. Shards of bitter steel danced through the air as the blade imploded. Zabuza staggered back, clutching the ruined haft of his once mighty blade. The tiny berserker marched after him with nary a care in the world as she hefted her flail with menacing intent. She began to spin it slowly, grasping the chain to send the spiked ball of death looping almost lazily overhead. This is a weapon. Zabuza. Dot had a bad time after that. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.